Okay, good morning or good afternoon. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Um, I think it's hard to tell up here. Um, thank you all for coming to uh, American Canyon. Um, the upper center, if you will, of the uh, event we had a couple months ago. Um, so this is a uh, our um, impacts lessons learned from the South Napa earthquake hearing. Um, the commission will uh, uh, convene after an event to discuss what happened, uh, begin to start working on ways to fix things, and also start looking forward to uh, to the future as it's inevitable in California. Um, my name is Tim Strack. I'm the chairman of the Seismic Safety Commission here. Um, I am the representative of the fire department, the fire services here on the commission, and uh, it's an honor to serve with uh, this great group, and it's great. We've got almost everybody here um, to hear some great information and, and uh, start analyzing the data, the, the policy issues, and the public stuff. Um, you know, it's a position that we like to consider a lot is that the best public policy comes from the public and that's why it's really exciting to be out here in the public and listening and learning and start moving forward with local issues at the local level. Um, so a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we have uh, a couple of our contractors here uh, sitting at the end of the table that work very closely with us. Uh, our I'm going to have them introduce themselves real quick. Um, we have our um, representatives from the pier here and also from the JPL. So, Susan, you want to just start right over here? Yes, I'm Susan Owen, and I am from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory down in Pasadena, California. I'm the principal investigator of uh, ARIA project, and we'll be talking today about JPL's response to the Napa earthquake. And Frank. I'm, I'm Frank Webb. I'm from JPL as well. I'm the deputy uh, manager for the Earth Science and Research uh, Program o Formulation Office at JPL. Hi, I'm Ronald Long. I'm the program manager for all of science and natural hazards, also JPL. Hi, I'm Steve Mayen. I'm the director of the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center at the uh, uh, headquarters at the University of California at Berkeley. And I'm representing sort of a perspective of a number of engineering organizations, including PEER, EERI, GEAR, and uh, maybe TICLI. TICLI. And uh, we'll try to provide an overall view of some of the engineering implications. Great, thank you. Um, we're going to be doing a number of projects um, with these two groups, um, and they all are involved in some um, groundbreaking pardon the metaphor, uh, scientific methods of analyzing earthquakes. So they're here to um, to really just look and watch and listen and, and take notes about things that we can move forward to help California be safer and more resilient. Um, the commission will be taking the testimony, taking notes, and we'll be coming out with uh, recommendations uh, in probably six to seven months, as it, uh, we normally would do um, after uh, an event. Um, of this size especially. So um, we're going to move right into the agenda here uh, this afternoon. We have a, a number of speakers, many from local government, the scientific community, and the, the area around um, American Canyon and Napa. Um, we do want to try to wrap up by five. However, um, you know, we want to be sure we get a very comprehensive and, if necessary, a discussion on on the items that could be presented on the agenda. Um, so we'll try to, if everybody could try to move through their presentations and uh, not to rush, but cover it in a reasonable amount of time. And then there may be commission tr questions from the commissioners, uh, even possibly from our scientific partners here at the table. And, uh, and then we will... Uh, um, move on to that. I need to uh, pass it over to Karen here to do the roll call of the commissioners for the hearing. Chairman Strack? Here. Vice Chairman Johnson? Here. Commissioner Cooley? Here. Commissioner Corbett? Commissioner Gardner? Here. Commissioner Goodwin? Commissioner Barroza? Commissioner Gallarducci. Mark Johnson for Mark Gallarducci. Commissioner Helwig. Here. Commissioner Knudsen. Here. Commissioner McCarry. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Miyamoto. 
Here. Commissioner Whittem? Here. Commissioner Swice? Here. Commissioner Rabbit? Here. Commissioner Carbajal? Here. Commissioner Parkinson? Here. Commissioner Wheatley? Here. We have quorum. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Um, our first uh, uh, speaker is uh, our host city's mayor, Leon Garcia, um, of here at American Canyon. And again, uh, I'd like to thank Mayor Garcia for hosting us here today. It's an honor to come visit your city, your beautiful city, and, uh, and hear what happened here at your local level. And um, so we're letting you lead off. Thank you very much. And please have a seat. Is this mic on? Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you. Well, welcome to American Canyon. We're very happy to have uh, you here, host you this afternoon uh, for this event. Uh, I'd like to point out uh, this is the uh, formerly was the Gaia, now the Doubletree Hotel. And it was the first gold LEED certified hotel in Northern California. So we're very proud of that in American Canyon. Uh, we're a smaller community. If you've done our research on us, we're about 20,000 people. And we are the epicenter of the quake. It was identified by the seismologists. Uh, for the sake of not making too light of it, we were, things were shaking up in American Canyon on August 24th. Uh, we did have some experience uh, that uh, affected uh, our community as well. Uh, we had nearly, uh, uh, every, nearly every house received some sort of earthquake damage. We were fortunate in that we're, uh, a lot of the buildings are newer. And it was built to those uh, earthquake standards, which sometimes people find uh, difficult to uh, deal with in terms of their cost. But then an event like this just points to the value of doing that. Uh, we had 55 homes receive a yellow tag. Mostly were uh, severely uh, damaged to the chimneys, an older section of town built in the 1950s, non-reinforced masonry chimneys. Uh, there was some uh, water heater damage as well. Uh, in the months following the quake, we staff conducted 475 home inspections, which is nearly 10% of all our single family homes in the city. Uh, the inspections gave a peace of mind to the residents concerning the condition of their homes. As you can imagine, a lot of folks, they see a crack, they don't know if that's just cosmetic or the house is in uh, danger of uh, a greater issue. Um, also discovered numerous damage and replaced water heaters that needed attention. So it was an opportunity likewise to go around and educate community on uh, that issue as well. Several businesses were damaged with uh, broken water sprinkler pipes, uh, displaced walls, and damaged storage tank footings. Um, on the 24th, I ran around and contacted all the businesses in town that are uh, on the highway. Uh, other areas were uh, on the industrial area were covered by other members. Um, found the biggest issue was the water sprinkler damage, uh, our local Walgreens uh, pharmacy, and uh, in shape, which is a gymnasium in town. Um, one of the matters that came up is we reviewed this issue last night at city council meeting in our wrap up. Uh, there needs to be some look at uh, code requirements on how fire sprinklers are anchored to uh, maybe address this issue of their, them breaking. That was a, a finding that was uh, sent forward by our concerned group of uh, folks in the city. Uh, some businesses were closed for a few weeks while water damage was being repaired. City offered free building permits and inspections for residents making earthquake repairs to their homes. Uh, we also, as a city council, uh, amended our uh, community development block grant funds to provide lower income residents a maximum of $5,000 grant to repair earthquake damage chimneys and retrofit mobile homes <coughs> with earthquake foundation strapping. Uh, additional community uh, block grant funds provided low-income residents a deferred low-interest loan to repair earthquake damage. That's, I think uh, probably what our greatest uh, effort applied to it beyond our city was to help our neighbors. Given that we were not uh, severely affected by it, then we sent uh, uh, teams, firefighter and public works to Napa to help with their situation. As you're aware, five mobile homes were burnt in Napa and a great deal of work in terms of their uh, Public Works uh, repairing their water mains downtown. We sent our Public Works staff up there to assist them with that. So although it was not uh, uh, greatly felt in American Canyon compared to other communities, I wouldn't make, like the fact that some folks, including our own household, we lost many items within the house, but we uh, came off relatively well. Uh, no one was transported to a hospital by ambulance. Nobody was red tagged out of their house. Um, in our review of it uh, last evening, and, 
might add, in a previous career, I uh, implemented the quality assurance program in Napa State many years ago. So I always see this as an opportunity to review, while it's fresh in our mind, what, what, what worked well in our operations, what didn't work so well, and what's on our next time list in terms of things to, to accomplish. Overall, we were uh, very satisfied with our response reviewed by our uh, public works and uh, fire chief. Um, we did not implement, open, implement our operations center, emergency operations center, because we wanted to be able to free up staff to go to other communities to assist them. And one of the uh, next time list on that is to remember that we need to look on alternate communication systems within, so they have a check-in time. But uh, operations went quite well in American County in terms of our uh, response to the, the event. If there's any questions, more than happy to take your question. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners? I, I have one, Mayor Garcia. Um, just uh, w when you made the decision not to open the EOC or to activate mm -hmm. the Emergency Operations Center because of Napa, um, when did that decision get made? Did the public safety agencies decide because they'd been around that there really wasn't much going on and Correct. due to joint communications they knew the mess was up north of here? Correct. Our fire chief was on top of that. They were out doing their inspections early on after the uh, after everything quit shaking and assessed the damage initially and uh, they made that decision. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We got two. Hold on. <laughs> Mayor Garcia, I think we got two more for you. Oh, no <laughs> I think I broke the ice. So, uh, All right. Good. Assembly Member Cool. Happy to answer. I'm just, what percentage of your housing stock is the mobile home? Uh, it's not large, and I don't know that exact number. Okay, uh, but it's a, a smaller portion. It's a smaller portion of our housing stock, yes. And, and f f within the city, or particularly within mobile home parks, do you have uh, aging residents? Were there any special issues, anxieties in the city with, you know, people who are aging or had mobility issues? Certainly is Just the, distraught by, you know, what the heck just happened? Yeah, significant portion of our uh, population are, are seniors in uh, mobile home parks. That's uh, where a great many of them reside. Uh, we have a family resource center that certainly was uh, very active in terms of assisting those who needed uh, assistance with it. Uh, one of the uh, um, boards I serve on personally is a community action Napa Valley, which is the uh, Meals on Wheels to Seniors and Senior Nutrition Program for that population, as well as the uh, food bank and the shelter program. So we were very active there. I likewise serve as a member on a uh, director on the Napa County uh, Red Cross as well and very active there as well. So I think all the responses as I visited the, the uh, shelter in Napa seems to be everything in order and operating well. I know uh, you'll get more fill in information from representatives from that city. Okay. Other question? Commissioner Carball. Yeah. Sorry about the, we have to move the mics around. Thank you, uh, Mayor Garcia. Yes. Um, oftentimes when we have these disasters, one of the issues that always comes up is communication. Mm -hmm. um, how was your communication initially and then ongoing between your city and the county and other municipalities in terms of the mutual issues of interest? And uh, details that I don't know that I have them for you. I think the other areas can respond to that. I just know that the feedback was it seemed to work effectively. Um, we were, uh, uh, we have a good mutual aid response with neighboring cities, and I know our fire chief and public works was very much involved with that as, uh, as our city management administration. Uh, in the review of it, there was nothing identified that uh, addressed this, at least to, to my awareness, that was a, a major issue or concern. So it seemed to be working well. Thank you. You're welcome. Other question? Commissioner Swice. Sure. Mayor Garcia, you mentioned the low interest loans available for uh, property owners. Yes. Can you elaborate a little more on this? Can you elaborate what, what kind of program was it made? Oh, well, the city has a, uh, a, a program for housing, and uh, our CDBG funds uh, did not identify these issues specifically as uh, chimney damage or earthquake repair. So we conducted a special meeting of the city council to amend our ordinance to be able to accept that. There is a income qualifying requirement for that for individuals who want to apply. And likewise, in the, as the other question related to seniors, uh, some mobile homes uh, 
experienced some racking of the foundation, but nothing that, that uh, red tagged it. So there's funds available for them to uh, realign the mobile home so it's on a solid foundation. Uh, Mayor Garcia, does the uh, did the city have or do they have a written uh, earthquake response plan in the EOC? Uh, I can't say they do. I'm sure they must have because they responded accordingly. Okay. Right. Hmm. My fire chief, uh, city manager, could probably better answer that question. Okay. Thank you. But we do at times uh, review our EOC plan. It's as you're probably aware, rather extensive and complex. But yeah, the the response would indicate that it worked well. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you, uh, Mayor Garcia, and thank you again for having us. It's an honor to be here in your city and uh, to get this great information and feedback to be able to share with the rest of California. Well, very good, Mayor uh, uh, Welcome, and it's good to have you here in American Canyon. Okay, our next speakers um, are going to come together, is what I was told, and this will be the Mayor, uh, Jill Tech. Cool. Tekel, thank you, sorry about that. From the city of Napa, um, just up the street. And uh, also, uh, Mark Luce. Luce. Luce, sorry about that. No I'm problem. trying to stumble through the names here. Luce, um, if you like. <laughs> oh, Luce, well, that's what I almost said. Uh, Honorable Luce is the chairman of the Napa Board of Supervisors, and they uh, asked to come up together, which is great. Um, yeah, and we, we thank you for coming. Um, and. Uh, you know, everything we saw everything went really well for all circumstances, but uh, thank you very much for coming Great. in. Great. It's our pleasure. For sure. Yeah. We had the same disaster, so we decided we'd talk about it together rather than as two separate reports. Um, and I have to acknowledge, um, stand, si sitting in the audience is the city manager, Mark Parnes, and the fire chief, Mike Randolph. So when you have those tricky, detailed questions, I've got backup here to, uh, yeah. to help us through that. Uh, so we're pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to start off, and then we're probably going to tag team a little bit. Uh, but this was uh, from Berkeley, the magnitude of the earthquake that hit Napa. Um, we're going to. I'm excited to hear more about the experts that are here, about what we can expect and what we can learn from this. But obviously, it was a big jolt um, at 3:20 in the morning. Um, I will do full disclosure. I was not home at that moment. I was in Monterey. The uh, sister city visitor who was staying in my house from uh, Ta Tasmania in uh, Australia um, had the experience of his lifetime, I believe, in experiencing what happens when you're in an unfamiliar home and there's an earthquake that goes off. So um, that's how it started. Um, this gives you a little overview of, and it's kind of hard to see, but the magnitude 6.0. It was five miles south, south southwest of the city of Napa on the West Napa Fault. Um, and we've seen a lot of new information. There are some um, underlying fractures um, that we have noted more since the earthquake um, has occurred. And Browns Valley, where I live, was one of those areas. It's got like all those red dots are all around um, my neighborhood. So immediately um, there was evident damage to the roadways, water lines, lots of issues with the water lines, buildings, um, the Goodman Library, historic building in downtown Napa um, obviously had a lot of damage. Um, we have a few downtown hotels, and the hotel guests were displaced due to the hotels being evacuated due to damages and water issues. Three structure fires were caused by the broken glass lines. The worst is at Napa Valley Mobile Home Park. Um, broken water lines led to six destroyed homes. So um, the fire chief is here, but they, when they went out, um, there wasn't immediately pressure to the water lines in order to put out the fires. Immediately, um, we opened up uh, two EOCs, the city EOC and the county's EOC. Um, and again, um, the fire chief was in, in charge of those initial uh, encounters, and so he can give you more details if you have questions about EOC operations. And sun came up. The extent of the damage was more apparent. Uh, you can see the crack in the road. We 
don't think he was terribly intelligent to stick his head in there. Uh, yeah, there were still aftershocks happening. Um, and certainly, this is, you know, some of the more dramatic um, building failures um, in the city of Nampa. Hardest hit, west side of town in Bronze Valley. Again, um, probably four blocks from my house was where uh, the, the fissure went right through uh, the, the Whitlock's home. Um, and certainly the older buildings in downtown and old town got hit very badly. 177 water system breaks countywide. They were discovered. Um, we did keep the main transmission line and both treatment plants were undamaged. Um, up to 600 customers without water service for an extended period of time. PG&E um, put in an amazing amount of resources to get people uh, the electricity back and to come out and inspect the home so the gas could be turned back on. Um, our water system was sort of like whack-a-mole. They, they'd fix one break and then two more would go off further down the, the line of the water system. So it took us probably five, six days to, before they could get out and get, get the water system breaks. Um, and a lot of that um, was due to, the help was due to mutual aid from other cities that came in that had the expertise um, to help us. Uh, we did have uh, damage to our B tank in Browns Valley. Um, that tank is supposed to not be rumpled like that. It's supposed to cover the top. Um, we've had to reduce the pressure in there, which means Browns Valley has reduced water pressure. Um, at this point, I'm allowed to water my yard from 10 p.m. till 1 a.m. in order to have enough pressure in the system uh, during the daylight hours for people to do showers um, and cooking. There were 283 injuries reported countywide. 234 patients were treated at the Queen of the Valley Hospital. 18 were admitted, four in critical. We had one fatality. Um, we had sort of two waves of, of injuries. There was right after the earthquake, and then um, during the cleanup, there were more injuries as people were dealing with glass and other um, items. 153 buildings were red tagged at some time, and more than 1,100 were yellow tagged. And these were two structures in downtown Napa. They still are two structures in downtown Napa. Uh, the downtown historic post office was damaged. Um, the Napa Valley, or the um, uh, Silver Buildings were damaged. Um, uh, affordable housing complex, the uh, carport uh, landed on all the cars that were there. So there was extensive, da extensive damage to all those uh, cars. And this is Mark, Mark Begins. I get to take the, take the baton here. Um, so I'd like, before we start this, well, I guess we're gonna start this video. Uh, so this gives you a little bit of the experience at 3.20 in the morning. This is our jail um, control center. Well, I guess this is one of the few places that we had some people awake at that time. Um, and then the next one is also our jail uh, intake area. I think what's interesting, if you look at the, the chairs on rollers as this thing progresses, it's interesting to see, um, it kind of tells you what's actually going on with the, uh, the quake itself. Yeah, who did the right thing? Yeah. <laughs> that was fast, I gotta give her credit. And this is a little more of that, that story here. Um, if you look, you can start to see those chairs still wobbling as the, the waves continue to move through the and system. And she's not coming out either. <laughs> so that was uh, 3.20 in the morning, and I think everybody in Napa was counting themselves as blessed as a result, because if it had happened any other time of the day, it would have been a far worse disaster. And it was actually a very nice evening, so uh, as we went out and met our neighbors uh, on the street, uh, it was actually very heartwarming as we had people knocking on our door asking how we were doing. Uh, I, I, by the time I got to my mother-in-law's house, about a half hour later, several people had already knocked on her door, and as I drove up and down the streets, I could see that uh, this was happening throughout the community. So uh, initial response from a citizen's uh, 
responsibility, I guess you'd say, is, was in my mind excellent. People were out looking out for each other. They weren't panicking. They were just uh, trying to find out what was going on and who was okay and informing one, one another where they were at because some people were out of town. Uh, I received a call um, a little while later telling me that the EOC was opening, but it wasn't opening downtown because the downtown was flat or whatever. I forget what Supervisor Wagonknecht said, but it was, it was down. So I had to go downtown to see what that meant, and that's where I realized that that was really, uh, I think, the, from a damage perspective, the, the epicenter of the quake. As, uh, and what was really nice to see is as I walked through the downtown was just a long row of fire engines coming from all over the area showing up. Um, and that was kind of the story of the day is we just continue to receive uh, mutual aid from throughout the region, uh, uh, just armies of uh, PG&E trucks and water trucks from uh, services from different areas uh, responding to that quake. So. Uh, we opened up the EEOC and uh, our Emergency Operations Center. We opened it uh, further south, actually much closer to the quake at the uh, Sheriff's facility, but it was in, in far better shape. In fact, it looked like it really hadn't been damaged much at all. And so fortunately we had that uh, second location uh, where we could uh, open up operations and, and uh, got that going. Um, and we had a great response from both the state and federal uh, uh, folks. The uh, uh, Office of Emergency Services was down right away sending uh, inspectors to help us out in terms of assessing the damage. Um, and uh, even FEMA was uh, there giving us advice and direction in terms of, of how we should proceed. Um, so as we began, we actually, you know, the, the recovery began immediately and one of the things uh, that I've observed that was uh, actually critical was uh, the city of Napa has a great uh, emergency response plan. One of those things is setting up uh, disposal sites throughout the city and that enabled people to immediately begin cleaning up the mess and beginning their recovery by, you know, placing their waste, uh, having a place to put it because otherwise what are you going to do? So uh, so I think that was really important. It was the first step in the beginning of recovery. Uh, and, and in a county role, our, our job is to make sure that uh, the city and uh, the cities and others have the, the resources they need. And uh, um, so that, you know, coordinating the opening of the shelter, working with uh, Red Cross and, and others to uh, make sure services uh, were being responded to as needed was the primary primary role. Um, but then uh, the health and safety getting out and visiting these uh, buildings to understand what had happened and the extent of the damage and begin the process really of uh, assessing that damage so that uh, FEMA and OES can determine whether we had a disaster or not and whether they're <laughs> going to provide assistance. Um, and so uh, here's our damage assessment, $362 million in damage uh, as far as we can tell. Uh, not everybody is reported, uh, not everybody wants to report. They're not sure what that means to them, so uh, this is what we've been able to get our arms around. Uh, this shows you our historic courthouse, which probably uh, it's insured. That's the good news. The bad news is you only get to claim the uninsured portion on your FEMA account, so uh, it didn't really count much towards our, our FEMA request. Um, as, uh, but uh, So we've got about 15 to $30 million of damage uh, to this uh, historic courthouse, depending on what we decide to do. Again, the problem is the problem. I guess the benefit is that it is historic. Uh, it's probably, I mean, one of the issues. It may be cheaper to just bulldoze it and build a new facility at half the price, or try and retain the historic nature of it at twice the price. So those are the kinds of decisions we'll have to make in the near future. Uh, so one, so one of our key jobs immediately uh, was to assess what was safe, what could people go into, what uh, what had to be read, assist in the process of evaluating what had to be red tagged and yellow tagged. And so we saw that as job one, but we also understood we we needed to eventually get to the point of doing those cost estimates for. Uh, the process of recovery. So next. Uh, the wine industry, uh, we let them know that we needed to do this. We needed them to report to us uh, as best they could what their damages were. And so they were, were on top of it. And uh, we got estimates of about $80 million of damage. Again, you know, a week into it, there are people who hadn't even been to their warehouse to know what did or didn't happen. Um, uh, 
Uh, but so that's what we see. And the Trefethen Winery is one of the more visible and more significantly damaged wineries. Um, I guess this, we really haven't, I don't know if we've ever had this strong an earthquake in this area. Uh, we've had uh, like about 100 years ago, one down in, in, uh, in Vallejo. Um, but uh, to the degree that it, uh, I just think this is probably the hardest we've ever been hit in terms of uh, strength of damage. Um, the county seemed to be the target of this earthquake. Uh, the, just essentially all of our key buildings were hit. Our administration building, our jail, our uh, the county courthouse, which you saw, uh, our um, health and human services campus. Uh, many of the buildings were knocked off their foundations or, or damaged. We had 400 employees uh, dislocated. That's about a third of our total employee population. Um, and we had to continue to provide services. So uh, we were really fortunate in the, that we were in the process of buying uh, what's called the Day Lab facilities. It's a large campus that uh, Day Lab um, uh, sold us as they were moving out of town, which was unfortunate, but it was our, our, our good luck. And we were in the process of moving there, which allowed us to relocate uh, a lot more employees than we would have otherwise been able to do. Uh, so that uh, gave us some office space. And then we had the district attorney and uh, public defender set up in the library on card tables. Was, you know, it's good for them um, to, to have that. And But, you know, everybody had to get their work done. And the courts couldn't delay. You know, there's there's uh, cases that had to be had decisions made by time certain or there were consequences. Uh, so things just had to continue to move. We set up tents in front of the courthouse for probation probationers to show up and check in. Um, so, you know, the, the process of government has to continue. And so uh, through technology and, uh, you know, getting things uh, set up, we, we were able to do that. I think it was a fairly remarkable effort. What you're looking at is some of the damage in our county administration building. And uh, one of the big lessons learned for me, and I think perhaps for you, is the, just the amount of water damage that occurred in these buildings uh, from chiller lines, not just fire sprinklers. In fact, I think it's mostly chiller lines going to, to the uh, rooftop chillers. Um, but that not only did significant damage to to the you know equipment and paperwork that it fell uh, that it soaked, but it, it then created the situation where we had to remove everything due to mold. And so, uh, one of our buildings, the Crithers Building, is out of commission for at least six months, and we're still working on the administration building uh, to get that cleaned up. So, uh, it's probably not a life safety issue, but it is it is definitely a recovery issue, and it may be an, a continuity of government issue if we hadn't been able to. Um, been in a good position to relocate as many employees as we were able to do. Uh, so yeah, so it seems like we could have done a better job on, on water. Not, and so here's another, this is where the board used to meet. <laughs> and uh, again, fortunately, we found some other locations to do that. Um, this is our library. Uh, it, this is actually before we've reordered things and, uh, and some damage to one of our uh, Health and Human Services buildings. Uh, road damage, so our public works director really had a job because he's out uh, doing 10,000 things at once of assessing roads, of trying to find locations for our, our employees to be relocated, assessing damage to our county buildings, uh, and trying to figure out solutions to all of this. So um, uh, he really did a yeoman's job. Um, so this is some of the work. Uh, Napa High here shows you uh, some of these uh, uh, ruptures on these slab type of floors, which present, I guess, unique set of problems in terms of repairing. Um, okay. I hadn't heard much. I just saw this photograph here, but I guess it shows you what could have happened. I haven't heard there was a problem with the Millican water line, but you can see that it did have uh, some landslide on top of that, uh, which I suppose could have been a problem. Um, our joint city county local assistance center uh, we set that up to provide a one-stop shop for everybody uh, whatever their needs may be whether they be permit needs whether 
is food assistance, whether it's counseling, uh, whatever was needed, this was the place to come. And uh, both state, city, and county had their uh, people uh, located at this building. So it took us uh, maybe, a, was it a week or so, or a few days, I forget now, it all seems to the time yeah. it was a warp, but uh, uh, to get that set up, you know, insurance and things, you have to, uh, you, you don't have too many just spare buildings laying around, so fortunately this one was available and we are able to, to make things happen there. Um, well, I guess this is yours. Yeah, I guess it's mine. Um, so um, Mark already mentioned, um, but what went, went well for the city was uh, immediately neighbors helping neighbors, businesses helping businesses. Um, people were out in the street um, turning off water and gas to be sure that um, there wasn't any more damages to homes. I think one of the things um, that we felt kept a, almost a calm was people had iPhones, so they almost had immediate um, ability to find out about the earthquake where it was centered. When you're in Napa and you get a jolt, you kind of wonder if it was the big one in San Francisco. So um, they had um, information very quickly uh, that it was local. Um, also having those iPhones told you, you know, you had a flashlight with you. So um, there was, uh, I, I really think that kind of technology has helped um, people uh, recover quicker because they have information. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, immediately we started clean up. If people have the broken uh, beds or the uh, coffee tables or all the glass and they have to look at it for very many days um, they can't get on with their lives so we immediately set up um, sites where people could could get rid of their debris uh, I think we're close to a million dollars in costs of getting rid of the debris um, I have to say private property owners um, led the way especially in the downtown um, they were out right away with engineers um, shoring up their buildings do what, doing whatever they could to get their buildings up and running again so that their tenants could get back up and running. I mean, this happened instantaneously, um, and they were there with the engineers. Um, uh, we were, we had a great team, uh, again, with some mutual aid of inspectors who could go out and inspect, and then once somebody came in with, here's our plan for shoring up our building and making it safe, they were able to pretty quickly turn it around. And I think this was um, because we had a constant focus on resiliency. I think the third day into the earthquake, Mayor Lee came to town with, with a group of people people and um, he had a resiliency officer and I said I want one of those and um, he said well I can't I'll, I'll let you borrow them a little bit but um, the whole idea is how quickly can you get back on your feet um, and so the whole idea was how quickly could we get people back in their businesses the day of the earthquake um, there were two restaurants open in downtown Napa um, at this point I think there's still two that are closed but within a week or so almost all of them were able to get back up and running, um, which was a goal. Being a resort area, um, you don't want the picture people have as what was on the 6 o'clock news of, of your community. So that was always on our mind. Um, we also uh, finding opportunity to encourage better preparedness. There's nothing like a uh, disaster to have people focused on the things they need to have that they didn't have. So uh, immediately um, we uh, put an article out, this is in a magazine that comes out to every home, um, talks about the South Napa quake. Um, it's kind of cute, it says, once upon a time, people who lived in Napa thought earthquakes were someone else's problems, um, which was kind of true. We thought maybe we'd get a, a piece of somebody else's earthquake, but we wouldn't necessarily have our own. Um, so we're doing everything we can to prepare people. Um, also on resiliency, part of this magazine was um, focused on um, the everyday heroes that came out during the earthquake, the building supply place that that brought in um, plywood so people's <coughs> windows could have plywood. Uh, the lady who owned the coffee shop who gave coffee <coughs> to all the firefighters. Um, it was the little things that happen in a community that can lead you, I think, forward forward quicker to um, recovery or, or, you know, we just kept moving forward with people wanting to do what they could to help people. So I, I guess we'll reemphasize uh, mobilization and disaster training certainly paid off. Uh, Napa with floods, have, we've had our experience in doing these uh, EOC operations, but um, uh, nonetheless, uh, there's staff turnover over time, and so the players in this EOC were different than, than our flood, and so uh, that continuous training and exercising needs to happen um, and I think it really paid off because I think uh, I saw guys who used to be planners suddenly are directors of the EOC and you know doing their jobs the way they're supposed to be doing so uh, it, it, the 
they obviously were well trained. Uh, communication with the city, it was interesting to see the city county role. The, the disaster really was in the city of Napa and they were doing a great job of responding to reporters' questions uh, and getting information out to the public. Our role was to provide assistance as they needed it and uh, we, we had occasional opportunities to talk to the to the public as well about what was going on in the rest of the county. Uh, but our role was to really interface and make sure that they had uh, the, the assistance that they needed. Um, and again, the coordination with the other agencies was just awesome. pg and &E gets a lot of uh, bad press a lot of times, but they really did a great job. I mean, they had an army of trucks out there and uh, were responding immediately to, uh, I think they had like 300 different trucks, I forget, but I mean, the guy from Alameda County, you know, uh, turn, turned on my gas eventually, and and, uh, and so they really uh, responded uh, rapidly to, to this disaster, and uh, Red Cross and, and others, and including the nonprofits stepping forward, the Annapolis Valley um, Community, Community Foundation, uh, actually it was the Vintners through the Napa Valley Community Foundation coming up with $10 million uh, in assistance, which we're still trying to figure out exactly how it's going to be allocated, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but anyway, so working with other agencies has been uh, a joy, actually, to see how people have come together. Um, So uh, what makes us ask why? Because we haven't totally debriefed um, this disaster yet. But why did newer buildings and structures have failures? Um, we had water pipe breaks, and you've heard that in some older buildings, but we had water pipe breaks in our new hotels that are downtown. We had a wall separation in 2006 mixed-use structure. So we're interested in getting more information about why. Um, there was a bolt failure on the Coombe Street pedestrian bridge, which is about a year old, um, and the flood wall that's just being constructed, um, they saw some movement. So uh, these are things that we still need to get more information on. Uh, we also uh, want to find, um, did retrofitted older buildings perform as expected? Uh, I think some of us expected there'd be absolutely no damage to something that was retrofitted. Um, and most of our retrofitted buildings um, are still standing. Um, the the damage was, uh, for the most part, uh, older bricks and blocks uh, falling off the building. Um, so those those are more information that we want to get because uh, I think some people just thought it was retrofitted and nothing should happen at all to that building if it was properly retrofitted. So what could we improve? Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to add to this before I go down this list. Uh, one of the, again, the continuity of government was, um, we were by the skin of our teeth, really, in terms of being able to do what we did. And one of the issues is our jail. Uh, it was yellow tag, but it was on the edge, and the concern was that it was going to be red tagged, and suddenly we had to find new homes for 250 inmates and what that meant. And even as we move through the process of dealing with the jail and its yellow tag condition, which means only employees and, and no visitors, um, it, it presents significant challenges in terms of who the inmates are, their rights to representation, uh, their rights to due process, um, and uh, the reality of, of where you're at. And so, uh, I don't know, uh, there may need to be, I mean, again, we're, we're dealing with it. We're just sort of skating through some pretty thin ice in terms of how we're getting there. If it had been any worse, I think we would have run into very significant issues with, with regard to what state law allows, constitutional rights, and what you're actually doing with these inmates. So I think that's a whole area that might take a little bit of review as to what happens in earthquake. If it had been more substantial, uh, you know, we just would have had some broken rules, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, um, and then I just think continuity government in general, I just, uh, you know, okay, what happens when your facilities are all down? How are you providing those services that you need? So I, we were able to do that, but again, we were just very fortunate uh, where we were at in terms of uh, additional space that we had available. Um, with regard to working th with the agencies, um, you know, one of the, one of the things, uh, like it or not, uh, the reality is that as soon as this earthquake is sort of assessed, your, your next question is, well, are we going to get any help? And so there's a process for getting that help, and it's to go out and do the economic assessment of what has happened. And uh, 
For our public facilities, that was relatively easy to do because they were our facilities and we could go out and inspect them and, and come up with estimates. Um, but the private sector was, was a bit of a challenge and continues to be a challenge. Uh, we went out and did the, the safety question of whether they should be in the building or not, and so many of them are red tagged. Uh, then getting cost estimates on those same facilities is very difficult. Um, many times you're not, there's no one home. You, you red tagged it so you can't get in the building to look at actually what, what happened there. And so the thought is it might have been a good idea to do some of these cost estimates as we were going from day one. It's a nice idea. I'm not sure that's right, but that's the idea is that that, that would have uh, eliminated some redundancy of having to go back and, and try and get these estimates. Now, the reality with FEMA, and you guys may be more aware of this than anybody, but is that they're, they're not providing the assistance they used to. I think uh, Hurricane Sandy put a big damper on their enthusiasm for responding to individual assistance in these uh, type of events. Uh, the event we had about 10 years ago um, was uh, about a quarter of the strength and about a quarter of the damage if you compare uh, public infrastructure damage and just basically all the measures of assessment is about the quarter of the damage and we immediately got individual assistance but we, I still haven't heard, I don't believe we've yet received an individual assistance declaration from the president yet and of course that's really critical to recovery. Um, earthquakes are different than floods and hurricanes and a flood and a hurricane you can walk down the street and you can see which buildings are standing and which ones aren't. Uh, with an earthquake, you look at a building, it can look perfectly fine from the outside, but then you go in and find out that the, the foundation is crumbled and you've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. So it's a little bit trickier uh, in a situation like that we just had in terms of assessing what the damage is. I don't know if we, I don't know if it would have changed the president's decision at this point. I don't know what his decision is going to be, but um, we've certainly worked very hard on the behalf of our citizens to. Uh, uh, show that this, is, this was a disaster and, and, and is worthy of support uh, for recovery. And I mentioned the, um, the contribution of our nonprofits. Uh, they, everybody sort of depends on FEMA being here because FEMA does the screening in terms of who's eligible and who isn't. And then you can follow with the gap assistance as you need it. Uh, without FEMA being here to do that eligibility determination, uh, we at this point are trying to figure out how we invent a, our own process of evaluation. So, um, so the delay in FEMA's decision to provide individual assistance is really delaying many people from at the state level and the local level from getting in and helping people out. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, um, disaster training, uh, training not only for the event but the recovery process as well. So um, uh, I, I think we're thinking that all along. I think one of the things we wanted to message, which I think we did a pretty good job as we interviewed with uh, CNN, Fox, and everybody else, uh, was that, hey, Napa's still open for business. Uh, you know, the last thing you want is everybody to run and hide, and then our businesses not only have the damage they have to repair, but they have no business or no revenue to support that. So uh, uh, there was damage, but many of our uh, businesses were still open. They had to clean up, and but they were still open. Many of them were down, but only for days. And uh, so uh, we wanted to make it clear for visitors and others that, uh, you're still welcome to show up, and I think that went pretty well. Um, media communication, uh, I guess, can always be improved, but I thought we did, as particularly the city, did a pretty good job of having regular uh, issuings of um, you know releases that were available on Facebook and other places where you could see what was going on. Uh, use of Nixel to get out information and other things. Um, now this is, I guess, is always an issue. Uh, I thought we had a lot of great volunteer response initially, but you know, you've got this huge labor force that wants to go to work. Is there a better way to use them? So maybe we should be thinking about something like that. And I think that means we're open for questions. I think we should not do that. Yeah, we have a very cute video, but oh. um, but I think we should do questions because of time. Okay. <clears throat> Helen, Commissioner Knudsen, and Commissioner Miyamoto. Okay. My question was, uh, early on, you said something about you moved your EOC to a second location, and my question was, was that planned? I know you had to do it, but was it planned as a backup? Y yes. Yes. So it was in your plan? Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. We. I think we've operated there before. Um, 
and, and I, I know we talked about it ultimately as perhaps a better location for an EEOC, um, uh, but generally we operated out of the administration building and that didn't, and, and it was a problem because a lot of the, the boxes that have everything in it, that was in the administration building, so we, we didn't have it when we went to the second location. Okay, thank you. That was a really nice presentation. I thought you guys did a really fantastic job to response and recovering, you know, which is probably one of the best case studies out there, especially the way you communicate with the public and uh, uh, citizens. Thank I think it's great. Now, a few comments I have. The, uh, you mentioned about the um, uh, new buildings, why the new structure is being damaged. And you mentioned about that the, why the existing building is being strengthening, being damaged. Well, because if you follow the building code, the current building code, the intention is the saving lives. Right. So it doesn't really address the so-called resiliency components of it. But there are ways of doing it, and usually at the cost of, uh, it, this increase of cost is really nominal to make the actual buildings and structural system much more resilient. So that's something that uh, I think, as an engineer, so I'm an engineer, I think something we need to really talk about it, because if we do something, people think, well, Engineer to do something must be earthquake proof, yeah. right? But such a thing really doesn't yeah, exist. We, we had that with the, the very visible building where that whole corner section fell down. Mm -hmm. well, you could see the steel structures still up there from the retrofit, and it, it fell outward, not inward. So I had people telling, "Well, that was how it was supposed to." But <laughs> there's a lot of people who thought that was yeah. terrible, but it, it didn't collapse. That was the point. Yeah, yeah corner always fails. By the way, the uh, about comments about comment about Heritage Courthouse. Now, how much damage uh, you had on this? Quite we're, bad? We're still assessing, so when I, what I gave you was just early numbers, but um, there's actually three buildings under that building, and they've been built at different phases in time, and so the one that was on the damage section uh, is the oldest 1800s vintage type of uh, building that has got a facade on it. So. Um, yeah, maybe it's just speculation because we I, we haven't gotten a contractor's report yet. Mm -hmm. But the speculation is on the order of tens of millions to to repair it, and if we're going to maintain the historic nature of it. And then the question becomes: Yes, but will insurance cover that, or are they only going to cover the cost of replacement, which is something less? And so. You know, those are the issues we got to deal with. I see. Because the uh, uh, obviously extent of a damage that's going to be determined what you know cost of the repair and right. strength and maybe look like. But uh, usually, mm -hmm. average speaking, for typical say yellow tag, the uh, uh, heritage buildings, I see the average of somewhere between the 10 to 40 percent plus minus of the replacement cost is the uh, repairing cost. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> but again, <laughs> it depends on, I know being right. a court, in this particular course, I don't know. It just right. depends on how, how bad inside damage is, really. Right. But I think you want to really, especially the heritage buildings, because that's a heritage, that's the, our culture and our history. I think we should do the best we can to, to preserve it, you know? Well, exactly. Yeah, but I, hopefully there's some cost-effective means doing that. Same time, we have to do both, obviously. Now, you made a interesting comments about damage assessment. You mentioned about, okay, this damage assessment's down to do red, yellow, green tag, but you... you, you that's actually a safety assessment. Yeah. And, 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 well, safety and I guess that's yeah. part of the, the definitions are different between FEMA and OES in terms of what damage is and what it isn't, what's red and yellow, what's major, what's minor. And so there's, there's not, there's really different sets of standards that you're, you're trying to deal with at the same time. But you made an interesting comments about uh, that particular assessment, you know, if there's more information are collected, like say extent of you know cost or so on. You know, I, I think um, uh, I mean this meant to be that this you, you probably at the you are using the ATC twenty type of a rapid assessment to see the safety assessment quickly. Right, right. But that's it, the whole purpose of it, is this quick, rapid exactly. assessment. Exactly. Who should be in those buildings and who should fast, so, right? right? You know, so so public can see it if it's not it's good or bad. But at the same time, rapid assessment can co collect more information. That is so true about that. Especially the amount of debris may come out from it, extent, like a volume of damage may look like. I think that kind of thing can really facilitate the recovery process much rapidly. So that may be something you may want to consider that change the a ATC 20, which you're using it, a little bit more robust form to address the recovery process. Right, well that's, so. yeah, that's what we're thinking. That was one of our lessons learned is that 
yeah, the, if you're going to do damage assessment, you better do it while you're in the building because it's going to be difficult to get back yeah. in. So. And also, I saw that uh, a lot of a wine being lost out there. <laughs> yes. That's what a shame. Yeah, our, I can talk. I, both Jill and I can talk about Napa Sanitation District as they had a large delivery of uh, wine. Um, uh, knocked their bu our bugs out for about a day, but fortunately we were able to stay within compliance standards and get back yeah. in operation. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's a picture I see for 2030, so, you know, I mean, that's just the same pictures over and over and over yeah. again. It doesn't matter if it's Italian earthquake or the California earthquake or Haitian earthquake, same thing, you know. It'll make you cry. But it, that can be prevented by that uh, little wiring. It doesn't really take that much, really, you know. So I think a public communication would be key, and especially now. Like you said, you got a great point. If disaster happened, this is the best time to inform the public what they should do about mm -hmm. it. Two years from now, it'd be too late. Mm -hmm. No, that was, uh, you know, just in our education from talking to folks from Santa Cruz and different events that have heard, have gone in the past, you know, at least their message was your window to get yeah. people to respond yeah. either in terms of helping or, or, or otherwise is, yeah. is very short. Right. And, and that, that was true. We, yeah. we had lots of attention for a couple days. I mean, you could get an interview with pretty much any <laughs> TV station you want and just walk downtown. Um, but uh, it lasted about a week and then they were gone. So, yeah. Thank you. I, uh, just a quick comment on how well things were. <clears throat> I had a call from Speak of Media. I believe it was the Xinhua News Service in China. And their first question was, how come you have an earthquake in the middle of the night and 10,000 people didn't die? Yeah. So to keep it in perspective on what you know we were doing here and what how successful your communities essentially came through it versus why they're scratching their heads in other parts of the world. So um, we've got Commissioner Wheatley, and then Commissioner McCarry, and then Mark Johnson from Oh, yes. Afternoon. Good afternoon. A um, couple of questions. Uh, as ma mayor of Arcata, we sent one of our building inspectors down to help Thank out. You. So presumably, you're welcome. Uh, presumably, that networks used were the League of California Cities and CSAC, et cetera, and how effective those channels were. And then one of his comments, his feedback to me was, uh, you mentioned the, the neighborhood disposal areas and how were those coordinated through any kind of community or neighborhood, you know, emergency response teams? And then lastly, the you mentioned the nonprofit and community partners. So w w was that more on an ad hoc, and had they been engaged in any kind of the tabletop planning exercises, or might they be in the future? Yeah, first of all, I, and thank you for sending the okay. inspectors down. It really helped us get out in the field quickly. One of the things um, also we learned is when you have your, when the disaster's localized, you can get a lot of mutual aid and you can recover quicker. If this had been a, a, a total Bay Area situation, we wouldn't, we couldn't depend on getting that same kind of support as quickly. So that's kind of like, okay, you really do need to plan to be self-sufficient. Um, at first we used the school sites uh, for refuge. Um, they were closed for a couple days. And then we uh, moved to more centralized locations. And uh, again, communication was great. People got to know um, exactly um, where they could go and, and how they could get rid. One of the jokes was there sure were a lot of mattresses that got hurt during the earthquake. Um, but we just wanted people to get rid of the things they needed to get rid of. So we. And that talking to her staff, because uh, I also sit on various waste management waste management organizations where Kevin reports, but it is part of your emergency response plan, so these sites are identified already in terms of where this is going to happen so that, so it can happen. Never so. a good disaster. That's right. That's right. How about the... No, the, the nonprofits. Yeah. Um, we are really blessed by having a Vintner organization that is regularly raises money for, for nonprofit support, and uh, and so um, so that I think they've got a foundation where they do have accumulated revenue, um, and uh, so they just you know they stepped forward and said, yeah, we we, we want to help. Uh, of course, we were communicating with them about their damage and everything else. So they were part of the story all along, but then they came forth with with the contribution and 
Uh, that was, of course, is a, uh, well, <laughs> there's a lot of good things about it, um, but uh, it does offer the opportunity to do things uh, maybe on a larger scale, like a lot of these mobile homes that have been knocked off their foundation, maybe having one large contract to deal with that rather than trying to have 100 little contracts and, and different things like that. So, so they're looking at how to best approach this. But as we discussed with them, the criteria for moving forward again, it was, they were kind of like, well, we need FEMA here telling us that this group is eligible or this person is eligible, because otherwise, how do we, we don't want to spend all this time and money trying to do that. Uh, it could be very costly and, and really chew into what's available. Um, but it was also a great leveraging opportunity because others came forward as well to, uh, you know, provide uh, funds for relief. And, and, uh, and there are, you know, yes, there are a lot of mobile homes that were hit. I mean, lots of, I forget what the number was, but it's in the hundreds, right? Yeah. Or I, I believe that uh, mobile homes that were knocked off their foundations. And um, and so uh, those are the people that need help and that don't really have the resources to do anything. So. I, I guess I'm, I'm more thinking, you mentioned all the volunteers, people coming forward right. and wanting to help, uh, how you use the community partners right. to, because government's kind of overwhelmed, we've got right. their hands full in the moment, but Just how they might be able to help guide the volunteer efforts. So I was going to, because Mike was down at the EOC, so how, how, how we partnered with the, um, with the nonprofits. The, we had the nonprofits in the EOC within the first hour of the EOC opening. Um, the uh, South Asian Army served 7,000 meals the first five days. American Red Cross opened uh, shelter and uh, and for a while there, it was really scary. The this, this state has responsibility for uh, overseeing the mobile homes. We have 1,200 mobile homes in this city. And at one point, the uh, state that was, was doing inspections and said that they were going to red tag 80% uh, of those structures, which meant we could have hundreds of people uh, moved out. And they're mainly low-income folks who we weren't sure would have a place to go. So. Uh, with with having the Red Cross in America and uh, and the Salvation Army already up and running, we were able to get food trucks. We were also were afraid people would go back into the homes even if they were red tagged. Uh, so putting food trucks out in the sites uh, was very very helpful. Having uh, shelters available for them, and then working with OES and with others to get in and get those buildings back up and running so that they didn't have to remain unoccupied. Uh, all kinds of other support came from uh, from other nonprofits. We organized them separately, and had a had a unit within the EOC that was communicating just with them and and, and getting all those resources identified, lined up, so that when we needed something, we knew exactly where they were. So it worked very well. You, you reminded just, me to to add one of the nice things about this earthquake, it, it was uh, one of our storefronts, the uh, windows had broken and the merchandise had fallen out onto the street. And so we had people going in and putting the merchandise back into the store. So it's uh, <laughs> sort of just kind of typical of Napa, perhaps. <laughs> yes. We were asked about looting and it was just the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> just for the record, um, name and title, where you oh, position this is there's Napa. That's, I just wanted to make sure we got it all in the record. That's right. Mike Parnas, I'm the city manager in Napa. Okay, excellent. I was Thank the you. director of emergency services during the, oh, during the EOC. I thought right. you'd Thank recognize him. He was on TV <laughs> for about a week. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, Amir. Yeah. Um, so good afternoon. I have to agree with uh, Commissioner Miyamoto. This is, uh, was a very good presentation uh, and really could become a very good case study that should go out in the professional literature as to how response is, is adequately done. I have a couple of questions regarding uh, one of the main topics that the media was talking about, these unreinforced masonry structures and uh, state mandates uh, for retrofit. Um, perhaps in, in the issue of enforcement and compliance of the citizens uh, or even county and, and uh, other local uh, buildings, um, how and, and also going along with the, que with the question or the statement you made that uh, people saw buildings that were retrofit and still had damage in them where 
we know that damage can continue to occur. The main idea there is is to reduce the loss of life or injury, and that should be clearly stated. That I think uh, a lot of uh, the uh, uh, personal injury and the loss of life was minimized because of, of these retrofits. How far do you feel that in in the region the compliance with the unreinforced masonry structure uh, mandate is? Let's see. Yeah, we had at, at, after 2000, 2000, we had an earthquake, and um, we had renewed interest in looking at our unreinforced masonry. And we were using, we wanted to retain the buildings, so we wanted to use carrots and not sticks because we didn't want to move them to a place where they would be encouraged to destroy the building rather than pay to have it retrofitted. Um, we had been um, very successful with all but three. Four. four. And we had the Tuesday before the earthquake, we had just moved forward with one of those. It, it was going to become the Archer Hotel, and they're saving all the historics part of the structure. So we were moving on to uh, some of our more calcitrant uh, property owners, which got highlighted very much um, during the news. Uh, I can, uh, I can, and, and the thing I think as a council member I, I wasn't as aware of that I'm totally aware of now is, is the effect that an unreinforced masonry structure has on its on its partners on a block. Mm -hmm. So if this person chooses to not be safe, he, he's doing himself damage. But when his him not doing his part causes other buildings to be unsafe, that really moves us to action. Um, since the earthquake, we've had two closed sessions on this item. And the uh, property owner has uh, is, is got a plan to bring his properties uh, back into safety. Um, so it's... it's um, Never, you, never waste a good disaster Absolutely. and, uh, and <laughs> bring people into compliance. But, uh, you know, we talked about, and I'm going to try and shame Mark into keeping the courthouse, uh, but the private property owners that owned historic properties have across the board said, we love our buildings, we're going to bring them back, we're doing whatever we can, which is just a great feeling. To, to give you specifics, the, we had 43 unreinforced masonry buildings when the 2000 earthquake hit. Uh, we adopted an ordinance and, and mandated they be brought up to code. Uh, by 2009, we had uh, we had 24 of those voluntarily. We provided incentives. We paid for the redevelopment. We paid for the design and engineering and, and assisted uh, with those. By the from 09 when we started in, in enforcement, uh, we received compliance with all but four of those buildings. Three of them are the ones you see on TV that were all adjacent to each other on mm -hmm. one street. Mm -hmm. So we, we think we had pretty significant <coughs> positive compliance voluntarily, um, and we're definitely getting full <laughs> compliance as a result of the year. Yeah, I think that all of this should receive additional media attention of the success of uh, the mandate and the enforcement and the compliance of the uh, of the citizens uh, to something that perhaps is not obvious. It's going to be taking off the profit and probably a lot of cream from the profit. But in the end, it is to save lives and it is to to uh, be a good neighbor, as you mentioned, uh, because other buildings nearby uh, get affected. Huh? Yeah, you got your attention when you red tagged all the buildings around those buildings. Yes, yes we got a, a <laughs> lot of folks came to city council to talk to us about moving quickly. And now, and now is the time to do it. I mean, it, it's yes, it's health, uh, life safety, but it, it's also recovery. You know, a lot of buildings are standing that might not have been standing right now, and, and that means those businesses are open and, and doing business, and so it's a, a significant part of recovery, and if it, you know, it, you can't do it after the earthquake because the money's not there. You've got to do it before the earthquake. And uh, just to finalize, um, the, the good news of the earthquake, though, uh, the river flows, have they continued on? Uh, what, what is the status of that? That's very, uh, you know, the creek goes, one of the creeks go through my backyard, and, and it was, it, it rose a lot right at the earthquake. Uh, it, and I don't think it was water line breakage. It was, it <laughs> was, it was uh, just, uh, it, seemed to frack the whole area, so to speak, and uh, you know, a lot of water was released. I don't know. I don't know how it continues to flow. But. I don't know. We got hail two weeks ago. It's yeah, like, so what's helps. happening? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Everything's about the earthquake. Yeah. Mark Johnson. 
the mayor brought up a good point that I was going to make about the resiliency and the exposed buildings that were probably red tagged, even though they didn't have damage, but because they were exposed to other structures uh, that were damaged. We received a request uh, from the USGS for <coughs> specifics on the red tags uh, within the communities, and we were referred to your building officials for that data. So if you got a request from USGS, it came through my office okay. and down to you. So. That's all I had. Okay. Uh, Tracy Johnson, yeah. Vice Chairman Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it was. Okay. All right. I had a question about communications with uh, your citizens. Uh, I'd like to know if you could uh, say a little bit more about how it evolved over time immediately after the event. How did you communicate and how did that evolve over? if you would, please. Yeah, um, it was uh, kind of fluid, figuring out what opportunities we had. Um, the electronic media certainly worked, so Facebook and email and Twitter worked. Um, much of the town was without electricity, so putting your message out by TV uh, was not was, was not going to get to the folks. Um, I was interviewed by Cheryl Jennings on Channel 7, and she said it was amazing how much information was, was able to be given out once we figured out Facebook was probably one of the better ways for us to get out information. Um, the, the PIO said he could get his message out. He didn't have to get it filtered through through reporters. So it actually is a nice way to do it, is to get your message out there directly um, to the community. Um, had we not had that ability, you know, we would have gone to bullhorns or whatever we needed to do. I mean, it's interesting to say, okay, we had this. What will happen? Um, toward about the middle of the day when all the media came, the, um, the wavelengths were were um, somewhat saturated, so communication became a little more difficult. So that's something to think about too, is um, when, when those big generators of airwaves come in and take what's there, they reduce your ability to uh, make that direct communication with the people in town. So we had really, in a sense, two communication efforts, the county operating and the city, and um, and so I can observe the city, and, and I thought they were excellent. Uh, Mike was regularly in front of the, the public in terms of uh, the television, but that was also covered by radio, um, So and is very concise in getting the kind of information that people wanted to hear, how many buildings were damaged, how many water lines still remain to be repaired, um, just, you know, lots of factual information to know the status of, of how how things were going. And I'm sure they had the same situation. Our public information officer was fielding lots of phone calls and and allowing some of us electeds to take give us a chance and, and get out there and respond to, to some of the questions. Um, uh, so uh, but again, a lot of what I learned actually was watching Mike on TV or, or listening to him on the radio to, to tell what the latest was. And then the 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 information they put out on Facebook was also equally concise in terms of summarizing what was going on. Kit. Thank you. So uh, did you see the uh, uh, distinct difference in the damage, like a yellow and a red tag buildings for the either uh, strength or strength not strengthened buildings? Was it, you have a beyond like, uh, my pay grade, so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, probably if we. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the red tags were, were older construction. No, I mean that the strengthened one. I mean, yeah. you, you got a URM buildings, which is some are strengthened and some are not strengthened, right? Right. And so, um, so uh, you know, again, I think the red and yellow is basically, is this in danger of collapse or not? And that doesn't mean a yellow tag is not an expensive fix. Um, so it wasn't really a cost estimate as much as a hazard estimate in the, as you. Yeah, no, actually, my question was the, uh, okay, so you have a two different kind of a buildings for the URM buildings. Okay. One is the, the strengthening. Right. 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 Others not yet, right? What is the what? How the damage distributed? It's more for the uh, unstrengthened buildings versus the strengthened buildings. Do, do you see the remarkable that remarkable yes, differences? Yes, I mean, some some was night and day. Um, this one local builder uh, came in, and I he came into a structure. He just had it open maybe a couple weeks. The Vela Pizza, and he went in, and there was they the 
totally redone it and there was not, um, uh, nothing was out of place. And he said to the building inspector that he fought with the whole time about it. He didn't want to do it and he didn't, he thought it was too expensive and he said, Jill, he said, let me find that building inspector, I'm going to kiss him on the lips. Um, so, you know, he's probably a great person to tell the story about investing in a building and, and have it um, come through uh, just amazingly. Thank you. And I just anecdotally, and this may not answer your question, but the ones you were clearly red tagged were those that hadn't been secured to the foundation, you know, the older buildings that had been moved off of their foundation. Uh, there were some red tagged, like the Whitlocks, which was a brand new home, it's just that the earth fault moved right through the middle of it yeah. and split it. So, um, but probably I think you'd find that most of them were older homes that hadn't been reinforced in some way or another. Commissioner Parkinson. Uh, this message is for Mike, and Mike, I do recognize you from television, so you are famous. <laughs> I do now. Not the way you want to be famous, no. but you, you are famous. Um, my question is, you mentioned the EOC, and you mentioned having volunteers or um, uh, representatives or uh, nonprofits, I think one of the two. Do you, uh, does your fire department have CERT trained teams? Are you familiar with CERT? Yes, we do. You do. And how about VOAD? Pardon me? Uh, VOAD? I'm stumping you on these, aren't, aren't I? No. No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you know, there was, it, this was a disaster, a true disaster with things changing and information needed to get out there. And, and the press conferences, the conferences to get the information out needed to be exactly that with the people that had the data. So it wasn't a, a, a PR moment uh, for people um, in local government. It was, I mean, that was the essence of what was the thought behind us and the way we got the message out to the community. Yeah, just to clarify, um, VOAD is in reference to uh, volunteer organizations. Active in disaster. Active in disaster. Thank you. I knew you'd answer that for me. Um, and and so you you had mentioned or you'd shown on one of your slides about I think uh, things you could do better in uh, in relation to volunteers. So that's why I was asking if you had such an organization within the county uh, on the volunteers. Obviously, you have it on the CERT side, but on the VOAD that will help organize your volunteers in the disaster. We do have a volunteer center, and we have. A resource where people can volunteer that we can draw from, but we don't have that formal okay. organization you're referring to. In terms of communication, it's interesting because uh, we, we did try to kind of centralize the information so that it was going out consistently every few hours. Uh, it became more problematic over time because we had trouble, and we had most of the players in the room. So before it was time to go meet with the press, we could just go to each station find out what had changed, put it together in one report, and release it. It became more problematic over time because independent entities were moving faster than we could keep pace. So the hospital, for instance, they do their own press release, and we'd notice their numbers were different than what we had received from them half an hour earlier. Or uh, PG&E, even though they had someone in the, in the EOC, some of their numbers were different. So it was very helpful early on to have all the players in one room so that we could kind of corral, keep the, the information current. But over time, there's a tendency for it to blossom out. But generally, I think it went, went very well. Just one follow-up at, at Donna Mead, and, and I think communication was mentioned earlier. Did you have any communication failures within your police department, sheriff's office, fire department uh, that posed any problem for you? No, actually, actually worked very well. We had some sketchy uh, telephone communications at certain times just because the systems are overwhelmed. We had some, we, we learned a couple things about redundancies in planning. We had some close calls. Uh, for instance, we had a backup dispatch center that we had identified in case ours ever became, became a problem. We didn't think that through in terms of the, all of the, all those facilities go through the same switching station. So, and when the electricity went out in the switching station, AT&T downtown, it, it cut off their power. Uh, they were on batteries. Uh, we weren't sure how long the batteries were going to work, and both of our dispatch centers were reliant on that system continuing to operate. So we worked very quickly with them, with OES, with, uh, to make sure they had a backup generator that was brought in so, so that there was triple cut. Worked fine. We were able to bring in those are the kinds of things that you, we didn't think about. We think about how would we back up dispatch. We hadn't thought about the potential for losing a switching station. We, the same with the uh, mobile homes. 
uh, the thought never occurred to us that someone would come in from the outside and just shut down the uh, mobile homes that we could have hundreds and hundreds of people that we would have to take care of in a, in a, in a moment. Um, we'd always thought it would build up over time and we could we could build up our efforts. Uh, those are the kinds of things I think we're looking at now to see uh, how, how could we deal with that uh, in the future. Thank you. Commissioner Rabbit. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, the city manager, uh, Parnes, and as well as Supervisor Luce and Mayor Tickdall, uh welcomed us to Napa, I think, on Thursday after the earthquake uh, through my uh, uh, position at the Bay Area Association of Counties. So thank you very much for your hospitality on the day, I think, that you're re switching from uh, uh, response to recovery. So I, I do appreciate that and appreciate all the work. I just want to follow up on the uh, mobile home issue because I found that pretty fascinating. Certainly mobile homes are throughout the state and there's thousands of them and many times there's some vulnerable residents there with short on resources. You said the state came in and red tag hundreds of homes. How did that resolve itself? And I take it those were all just because they were knocked off uh, the blocks of the foundations. And uh, can you just tell us how that resolved itself? And did you have any authority to supersede what the state was doing? Or uh, and maybe some of my colleagues here can also comment on that. No, no we, didn't. we didn't have authority. And OES and the... Uh, HCD, I believe, is the agency that had responsibility for the inspections. They didn't have the ability to enforce uh, clearing people out of those units, making sure they didn't return. So we we pretty much had to step in and do the enforcement, even though we didn't we didn't issue the, the red tags. It, went, it worked very well for us because we actually went out and started working with the uh, operators, <coughs> the, the actual management on site. What the state did is when they came out and found that they had fallen off there, or either their they fallen off of their foundations or had structural damages. They directed that the utilities be shut off, uh, which in itself required the people not make people to vacate. So um, it turned around fairly quickly. We were able to get people into uh, facilities for the first couple of days, and then very quickly, the people that were running those uh, those centers were getting the units back on their foundations and able to occupy within the first few days, um, with the exception of a few dozen of them where they were back up in line and running. So uh, I, I personally was unaware that they were that fragile and that they could, many of them weren't secured the way they're required now to be tethered. They were simply sitting on top of pedestals. Uh, now they're required to be tied down and tethered. You can see why. And at that moment, um, I was dealing with OES and was had given them, they were part of the tour, I think, and they went, just tell us what you need and we'll take care of it. And I went, okay, Mike, they're taking care of it. So <laughs> we, we had great support from OES, uh, particularly on, uh, we had, we only have four or five building inspectors on duty. We had 60 that were out working within two days, uh, four weeks. Um, same with our water crews. We had, we had crews, uh, we went from, a, a, we, we repaired 153 water breaks in five days. That's our typical, that's how much we do in a year. Uh, we did it in five days given the support we had from other communities that brought not only people, but their equipment uh, into the city. Pretty remarkable, uh, the mutual aid is what made it all work. Commissioner Carball. Thank you. As a local elected official myself, I, I know the challenges we go through during these uh, types of disasters, and I really appreciate your sharing your experience with us because I think it goes to helping us learn more. We could always learn more as to how we deal with these uh, crises, uh, disasters in our communities. Could you share a little bit about how your uh, communication and response, how effective or lack thereof it was relating to vulnerable populations? Uh, and in particular, I assume you guys have also a significant agriculture community, being that you have a lot of uh, um, vineyards and what have you. How effective that Spanish uh, or other language communication was, uh, because oftentimes these are some of the challenges that all of our communities face. And I know it's it's always a, a, a learning experience as to whether we had good systems in place or, or um, resources or not, and how effective we were able to outreach to those individuals as well. We have a, a 
young Hispanic uh, gentleman, Alfredo Pedrosa, who was recently elected to the city council. And he, he had a real connection with the Spanish language um, TV stations. And he he really was the key communicator. I don't, we never really said, okay, here's, here's going to be your key. But it turned out um, during the event that he had made those early on, made those connections, and they continued to feel very comfortable. So we were able to get through that media um, messages out very, very quickly and in their language. You, you raise a, a terrific point, however. 37% of our population are Latino. 23% are immigrant uh, families. Uh, there's, a very, there's a significant hesitancy among that population to call government inspectors into their buildings for fear that they're going to be red tagged. Uh, they do not have the income to relocate. Um, in some cases, they have overcrowding. In some cases, they simply don't trust, um, the, the, regardless of their status. We believe there was heavy underreporting of, of damage. And so we, we were trying everything to try to, to get out into those neighborhoods and, and find damage and get, be invited in to document. Um, so uh, the mayor is correct. We, we tried all of this Spanish-speaking uh, social service agencies, council members, others to communicate and to go out. We had our Spanish-speaking building inspectors out there trying to explain to people why it was in their best interest to, to participate. And uh, we also made the argument with FEMA that we think that our numbers are, that we're going to find more and more damage, and uh, a lot of it is underreported. And then once it starts raining and we start seeing uh, the numbers will see more damage, in, particularly in those neighborhoods. It's can, a challenge. I can say I'm, a, I'm aware that we sent out uh, health and human service um, folks to go and just go door to door and interview and see how people were doing. Uh, I wish I could tell you more about what it was, but I know we made that it's made that time. effort in terms of what we we learned. But I obviously trying to explain where we were at and what we were doing with folks. So. Just to conclude, Mr. Chairman, and, and your senior populations or other vulnerable populations, did you guys have any um, challenges with um, those senior facilities, hospitals, uh, or were those uh, non-issues? You know, I, I don't think there were any serious issues other than, you know, anecdotally talking to family members who had seniors that were at the meadow, some of the senior facilities, and just how much it, um, it rocked their body function that for days they couldn't get their blood pressure back down. So it was, it, you know, the excitement of the shake, um, you know, created some other medical issues um, that had to be dealt with. I think the institutions did a great job, care facilities, those, for taking care of the people under their, under their care. Uh, in the residential areas, what we found was that the neighbors were very aware of people that might need help, and they took it upon themselves to check on their welfare. And uh, we received calls when people needed help, but almost only in two cases can I think where uh, we found that somebody was in their building unable to get help, seniors that... Uh, that, that took a number of hours for us to find out and get them get to them. In every other case, uh, usually it was neighbors and family that came to check them out. I was amazed at how much my neighbors knew about my neighbors. Because <laughs> as soon as I got out in the street, well, they're they're gone to this location, so they won't be back for a couple of days. They're, I mean, they knew everything. It was like, so it's a great community to be aware like that. Nobody knew who the little Australian was staying at my house, and no, they right. walked into the middle of the street, and it's like, who are you? Uh -huh. uh, JPL, Frank? Yeah, I have a question. So you mentioned earlier, is microphone. microphone, is there a switch on it? <coughs> is it on? Yes. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that uh, there's, you know, there's a need for obvious. into it, though. All right. <laughs> there's obviously a need for rapid assessment. Yeah. And I was just wondering for this event, you know, how rapid was the assessment? I mean, ha so how long did it take you before you felt you really understood the magnitude of the event and the extent of the damage? Right? Obviously, the earthquake happened at night. The EOC opened up in the morning, and then the sun came up, and you started, like, looking at, you know, the city. And information started coming in, but at some point, you know, you're, you go from assess assessment to more, like, response. And so... Well, we were uh, we were assessing right away. I mean, uh, yeah, I think we uh, e EOC was done by 
Thursday and FEMA was in on Friday and the earthquake had been, you know, that Sunday. So, um, you know, they, people were, it was rapid in terms of the sequence of assessment followed by, um, you know, a cost assessment. Um, so I think, yeah, that was really where we received a lot of uh, assistance was having other inspectors from the state come on and, and help us out in that regard. Okay. I think you had a good picture by the end of, of Sunday, but you know a lot of, a lot of the communities still didn't have electricity, mm -hmm. um, uh, but PG&E got an awful lot of it back up. I think that was the scary part for people thinking they would have to go through another night without that electricity. But I think we were able to go through and assess most of the all the neighborhoods. It was big enough that we knew, Dave, from the first minute, it was, we needed to bring in all resources. Uh, and the first thing, we sent the crews out to do damage assessments. So by the time we actually declared the EEOC open, we had damage assessments coming from all segments of, of the community so that we could put our heads together and figure out a plan. Uh, it evolved tremendously uh, over the next few days, but it, it, it didn't take long. And we had the fires immediately. So we had, we had working fires going from the first minute. We knew the water system. Was was in Jap was, had been damaged in many many locations. So it was pretty it was pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, the downtown was harder to to judge because we knew there were buildings that were damaged, but we didn't know the severity or whether they were stable and whether they were how safe they were. So we we tried to shut down. We initially shut down all the streets until we could get in and take a look. But uh, yellow tape does not keep reporters out. <laughs> yeah. Com common sense doesn't seem to apply. <laughs> Thank you. And Commissioner Goodwin. Good afternoon. I think, am I on here? Yeah. Um, nice. I'll speak loudly. Um, I, I want to thank you for having us and compliment you on um, your coordination and, and all you've done for your citizens and, and the region. Um, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation. I'm a uh, architect and building official, and um, I, I saw the information come out almost immediately as far as outreach um, and asking for inspectors. And um, to get down into the weeds a little bit, I, I'm, I'm just curious, and I think it would be good for others to hear how you coordinated um, what those inspectors would look at, because you were getting um, inspectors from all over the state, probably outside of the state. And who established that criteria? How, how'd you go about that? The uh, community development director and the building official uh, took took uh, responsibility for pulling that together. Uh, they set up a location where inspectors would check in, and they did it in phases, is, is my understanding. The first couple of days, they were simply doing windshield and touch base visual checks on building. They, they wound up looking at every building in the city uh, to determine if there are any obvious uh, safety hazards that had to be addressed immediately. They then started going to those buildings where they had identified problems, is, issuing tags, and, uh, and looking in more detail and talking to people. The third, the third phase was, go, was taking calls from people who I think Mayor Garcia mentioned that were concerned, had internal damage, probably didn't warrant a, an emergency response, but they were felt insecure. So we've been taking those calls, getting up to, we started about 200 a day, and we're now down to about 20 a day, um, and going into homes and just advising as to what, what they ought to do, who they can call. So we went in phases, but it was all coordinated through our building, uh, building department. One of the things we learned um, from PG&E, because when, when you called PG&E, you got a real person, and a, it made a difference as a victim of this earthquake. It made a difference to talk to somebody. And we had, um, the city system was on a recorder. And so the first time they went to check the recorder for these housing inspections, there was like 600 on the recorder. Um, so they quickly regrouped and took some staff from the housing department that then became answers of the phone um, so that we could also have a, a more personal response. We took 2,000 calls uh, from people that needed inspections o over that period of time. And did those inspectors have a checklist? Um, who, did the building officials say, this is what you're looking for, look for no more, no less? Um, the, the initial inspections were for safety, so they were given, uh, 
and, and yet they weren't going into homes, so they were looking at foundations, they were looking at chimneys, they were looking at uh, anything that was out of, out of alignment and drawing conclusions about whether or not uh, it was safe for people to be in those buildings. Um, and then they, on each of the tags, they would, they would write a note. Uh, in some cases, they would say, this is yellow, you can only go in in order to uh, get some building, but you can't operate your business. And in red tags, they would say that your foundation is not structurally sound, you can't even go in the building. And then they put together, we have a 72-page computerized uh, spreadsheet. At the end of the day, they would turn in their cards. It would all be downloaded, so we had a database for every address that had been inspected and why it was given the designation it was. Great. Thank you. Mr. Swiss. I just have a comment. Um, you mentioned that uh, emergency preparedness helped a lot. And I want to agree with you and uh, uh, just uh, share an example from what we do in San Francisco. You definitely don't want people to say, nice to meet you, you know, at the EOC or after an yeah. emergency. <laughs> So uh, the more you prepare the uh, people, the more uh, everybody knows who's who and how to contact them and what do they do, you know, you will uh, help, you know, your citizens and any situation in an emergency. I come from San Francisco. I work for the city of San Francisco. And we have at least 10 or 12 events, happy events throughout the year, such as New Year, Halloween, you know, Fleet Week. And we activate the EOC and the DOC f of certain departments for every event of those. Mm. And we rotate staff, you know, like those who, we, we don't necessarily send the same people mm -hmm. to each activation. You know, we send different people so they get to know each other uh, from different departments, from different utility companies, agencies, and understand what each one does, how do they respond, what kind of reports they have to fill out, and their phone numbers, emails, and so forth. So just the comment I want to say, you know, I agree with you, emergency preparedness helps a lot, and it can make a big difference. So if you have events throughout the year in Napa and surrounding cities that you can utilize for things like this, such as, you know, activating your EOC and DOCs of different departments, that will help a lot. You, uh, as I was thinking, you, you reminded me of an idea, I'm not sure it's a good one, but it <laughs> would be to have an event where citizens uh, imagine that it was an earthquake, maybe a Saturday or something now. So what would you do? Do you know where your neighbor is? Go knock on his door and, and really sort of force or ask your citizens to take part in the, sort of an EOC response. And yeah, we, we do have a similar program for citizens. We, we It's called NERT, the uh, Neighborhood Emergency Response Teams, where, you know, city staff, they go to different neighborhoods and uh, train you know, people how to respond, how to become commanders of the certain neighborhoods, what to look for, you know, who to call and so forth. So uh, I think many other cities have that and we'll be glad to share information with you if you ever need it. Okay. Um, seeing no more questions, um, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah. Uh, very, very much. Um, your insight was was fantastic, and it's great to really hear um, the lessons that you've learned, but especially the successes that you guys found. And uh, the, you know, Napa did very well, tragically on the wine side, but the rest of it is still um, overall one loss of life. Else, as tragic as one is. Um, I think, like I said the, earlier, the perspective when the question came from China, why we didn't lose 10,000 people is Definitely. is good. So thank you very, we, very much. We now much. know why China is sending a delegation to Napa in the next couple of weeks. Oh, OK. Well, and we'd like to, to thank you. because The region did well. I mean, it, yes. it, Napa responded, but the, the region was the one who came together and, and put us back together. So we, we really appreciate yeah. everyone's help and participation. So thank you. Well, one thing California is known for is it's, and being a fire guy, the, its mutual aid system. And, and obviously, this is a place where that mutual aid system expanded significantly yeah. from just the fire, but law and power utilities, building officials, all the way across the board. And and it neighbors helping neighbors. That's a great thing. So okay. thank you very much for your time and your leadership. If and you your, want a personal tour, come to Napa. Come on down. <laughs> Probably take you up on that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. 
Okay, our next speaker, um, Osby Davis, the mayor uh, from the city of Vallejo, which is right down the street. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I have with me my fire chief, uh, Jack MacArthur. Uh, let me, I'm going to start by just having a few brief comments. And I'm going to let him fill you in on the details, and then I'm going to uh, close with some comments and some lessons learned. Uh, we did, in fact, open our emergency operations center within an hour of the time of the, uh, the earthquake. And when I arrived there approximately an hour after the earthquake, uh, my fire chief and the um, police and public works were already there, already doing <coughs> what they needed to do. It was a um, rewarding experience to watch how our, our plan took shape and immediately uh, took place as they began to take care of the water leaks, the um, um, gas leaks, the other calls for services that were coming in um, immediately. It's also interesting to note that uh, when it first occurred and I wanted to find out what was going on, I found out much faster on social media than I did on the television. There was nothing on television, but there was something already on social media, which says a lot about communications that we need to start implementing in terms of disaster um, uh, re responses. Um, I, I do thank each of you and for taking the time to come and for allowing us to share some of our experiences with you. I'm going to let my um, police, my Fire Chief um, Jack MacArthur uh, give you the details of what we did and, and some of the things that occurred um, um, while we were going through this process and even now. So, Chief. Good afternoon. Uh, I have been, I'm going to change our presentation a little bit. We, we had the same earthquake that, that the city of Napa had, and, it, and we, 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 I did write down your questions, and so I've got some of those, and we can I'll highlight those kind of things. Um, the, the mayor's right, we were all uh, uh, in the EOC early in the morning for those in, interested in emergency management. We, uh, we rolled out our first incident action plan at around 8.30 that morning. And had a briefing, and uh, the mayor was was there, and so we, we had our incident objectives, and we knew what we were going to do, and we had our uh, joint information center together at about that time. We're going to thank the city of Napa for doing all of our uh, uh, TV work for us. <laughs> yeah. So and that, that actually, uh, we, you could, we could talk about that a little bit if you're interested, but it was a different way to communicate and I think something that the communities are going to have to learn. You're not always going to be the center of attention and you're going to have to find other ways to communicate with your folks if the satellite trucks end up in somebody else's community and I, I think we did a really good job of that. Um, our, our water structure took a beating. Um, we, we, that was evidence at not at any any incidents caused by the earthquake, but uh, um, as under the the heading of life goes on, we we had a uh, a four alarm fire uh, the next night, and and we had a three alarm fire that was not caused by the earthquake about. In the morning after that, when in one of those was uh, one of the issues on the fire ground was reduced water supply because of uh, damage to the to the underground system and changes that had to be made to turn off different uh, in the grid those kind of things. Those of you who know about that, 15 water line breaks. Uh, uh, we can talk about we had the same experience with the um, with the state. EOC, we ordered resources. We ordered resources uh, that were well beyond fire. Right? We ordered the building inspectors. We also uh, put in some orders for some folks to do damage assessment, which was very helpful. Folks who'd been and in um, and the state was able to send us folks that not only could just help out, but the folks who had been through it before. I want to thank all the, the communities that sent some folks. Uh, San Francisco sent some folks who'd done damage assessment before, and that was very helpful. Those, they, they helped us out. They even they brought in um, 
iPads and they brought in, uh, the, uh, they've got their system on the cloud for our building inspectors. And what was good about that was that it was simple enough to use that a Vallejo building official could hand the system to a building inspector from any one of 10 communities and the system rolled out and we did it, and we used it and so it was training's an issue but but the design of that system was was something i would point everybody to to take a look at it because when you can just gather up 10 building officials that show up in the morning to help you out and hand them all an ipad and they immediately know how to use it and and the data comes right back in that's helpful stuff um uh, the, the county stood up their EOC. They were there with us the whole time, got us all the resources that we needed and, and helped uh, helped get the message out to the, the folks that we had to get it out to. Um, uh, the press releases, the, the what, we, what you heard about social media is true. That's really, other than uh, we didn't get a lot of TV coverage. Uh, one night we had to tear down a, a, a part of a church and that got some coverage other than that we were it's pretty much all social media and local newspaper and, and social media was uh, seemed to work out very well for us um, uh, you're going to ask us a little bit about damage we have a, um, a laboratory of seismic um, uh, damage on Mare Island for those of you who don't know much about Mare Island that uh, we have we have buildings that were built Civil War era up to the 80s and, and they suffered all different kinds of damages some were reinforced some were not reinforced my personal observation is that the reinforced structures did very well the the ones that didn't I would I would draw the line somewhere around the 70s for for the codes that were in effect in the 70s the ones built after that were stayed together a whole lot more than the, than the ones that were built in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. And you could see that line in the, those vintage buildings. Um, one phenomena you might take back is we had uh, calls. Uh, immediately it was gas leaks. And, and those were all, without exception, water heaters. We Two days later, we had a commercial underground gas leak that we had to deal with. Probably, probably cause people can. We'll, we'll find out about that. The after that, it was structural damage, and we had things falling off buildings for 36 hours. So that's a lot of uh, firefighters went out to a lot of damage that happened right away. My chimney fell down. This fell down. The bricks are in the building, and then we spent the next day rolling on my my chimney just fell down bricks have finally come off this building and and i for 36 hours we did that and the the with a spike in activity around 18 hours after the original incident so things have just calmed down and everybody said well okay fine and and now all the chimneys started to, to to come down and that was a phenomenon that was surprised me at least um we'll take questions right after this but uh, uh we ended up with 120 uh, 1285 properties that were tagged um 35 red tags 26 of those are re residential 431 yellow tags and 369 of those were residential which was so as far as our community's needs one of the things that, that we had to deal with was, were tenants that had to be moved and so the, the issues about uh, um, our housing authority had a big role in getting people placed right away folks who didn't have any place else to go in for the gentleman who asked a lot of those you know, I'm talking about half a dozen folks had to be relocated permanently, and the majority of those were, in fact, elderly folk. And at least that was our experience. Um, I want to say a little bit about uh, VOAD. So we have a, a very good uh, VOAD. They were there. They were they were there with us. Uh, the way that we reached out to the public was. 
they took over and we had with with as far as permitting and things we had the, the city function we did it in city hall we opened it up over the, the first weekend kept it open during the next couple weeks and and did it from 10 in the morning until late in the afternoon and folks would come in and if they needed a permit they could get a permit if if folks needed some assistance, they could get assistance. If folks needed, uh, um, and we're still looking for people who need to have just volunteer groups come to help them, either get debris out of their yard or we're, there's actually volunteer groups that are stepping up to rebuild chimneys or to provide money to rebuild chimneys and those kind of things. And there's some, uh, and our housing authority stepped up to make arrangements for anybody who needed to to relocate because of the earthquake. Um, training, um, the mayor and, and council and the city manager committed. We sent 80 people to the CIST training in California, paid off uh, largely during this earthquake. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor. All right, thank you, Chief. Um, th there's a number of lessons that we learned in the process um, of this. And one of the things, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever had, maybe this is a bad analogy, but if you've ever had a burglary in your home or somewhere where you have property, you don't find out what's going on in there until later on when you're looking for something and you can't find it, you find out that's been stolen. Earthquake is kind of like that, an analogy that you don't know what's going on in your house or what's going on in your property until later on. You begin to discover cracks and things that have occurred, um, and you begin to find other damage that you didn't know about. So we're still learning about damages to various businesses and uh, homes. The problem is, is that there are a lot of people who won't tell you. And they won't tell you because they're afraid that you're going to red tag or yellow tag their home, and they have nowhere to go. Um, they're afraid that they're going to be required to repair it, and they don't have the money to repair it. So I am aware of a number of people in our community who have not reported the damage to their homes, and these are residential homes, because of that. Uh, the city has been, along with, I'm sure, Napa and um, attempting to get FEMA declaration of disaster so individuals can receive some assistance and that has been very, very slow. Which leads me to say that, to think that one of the things that we need to do is find a way to have a direct liaison with FEMA and a disaster declaration so this delay does not occur. Um, I'm thinking about we have technology and we can, if social media, media would allow me to know what has happened within five minutes of it happening, it seems to me that we need to utilize that same technology to directly provide the information to FEMA and some kind of system so they get the information on an ongoing basis so that they can declare a disaster without having to go back to the old way of filling out forms and then submitting them and then waiting for a response. We have to change that process. Um, and it's also more critical because we're going into, hopefully, a rainy season. And if we go into that rainy season, a lot of people who have their homes where the chimneys have detached, they're going to have water damage, then they're going to have mold, there are going to be other problems that's going to arise as a result of it. So we really need a disaster de declaration as soon as possible and the funds to help those people who can't help themselves. I applaud American Canyon for being able to provide low uh, income loans to those people who needed help. We are not in that position to be able to do that at this point. Um, and th the sad thing also is that sometimes disasters, even though it brings out the best of people, it also sometimes brings out the worst of people. Because we've had uh, people going around knocking on doors of, of little old ladies and little old men and saying, well, we can fix your, your repairs right now and, and give us $10,000 and we'll make the repair. Well, if you don't have 10, how about five? Or, um, and, and those kinds of things, those have actually been happening. And so communications with the public is very critical, but we have to recognize that social media uh, is not the only answer because a lot of people don't use social media. So we have to use all um, methods of communication. And I'm almost of the opinion that we're going to have to find a way to 
uh, individually get to each house that may have been affected in a disaster because otherwise you still end up with people who don't know what to do uh, and who to talk to and to avoid those kind of people who come out to take advantage of you in the middle of a disaster. Um, we, we learned a, a number of things. Um, our preparedness as the chief has said really paid off. Our disaster training uh, really paid off in this incident and I was amazed at how everybody came in. I was amazed at how um, the local communities began to flood us with resources we didn't even have to ask. Uh, surrounding cities and counties, even American Canyon sent people uh, to uh, our city to help um, when they were dealing with their own. And so um, it was a collaborative effort of everybody getting things done. Um, having uh, the, um, the ability to communicate is critical. And it's critical that we learn to communicate in more than one language because I think when we talk about c communications, we generally just think about communicating in English. Well, our community is about one-third, one-third, I'm sorry, one-fourth, 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 one-fourth in terms of population, African-American, uh, Filipino, Latino, and, and uh, uh, European. So, I mean, we have a, a community that we need to communicate in every language, and I'm not certain that we have designed what we need to, but it's a lesson learned to make sure that the communication gets out to everybody in the language that they understand, because I think we assume that everybody speaks English, and we know that they don't. But when we give out communications, that's our assumption. Um, the uh, ability to access um, building inspection officers uh, and to have them access buildings has been uh, invaluable. And we've had, I think, as many as 35 building inspection officers that are from around the area that came in to help us to do the inspections on the various buildings. Vallejo has a lot of old buildings, and those old buildings are the ones that you would find the damage to um, as opposed to the newer structures. And so it was very uh, helpful for that. Um, in terms of um, uh, other lessons learned, I think what's really important is to recognize that when there is a disaster, we as human beings are resilient and we come together immediately to try to help each other out. That's just the best of human nature. And we begin to collaborate in getting things done. I think we can learn that lesson uh, as we go about governmental affairs on an everyday basis. If we can come together and collaborate in disasters, we have to learn to collaborate when there is not a disaster to minimize the effect of a disaster when it occurs. And to me, the, the handwriting is on the wall. If government is going to continue to exist and provide the services that it provides, collaboration between agencies, cities, and other uh, bodies is absolutely critical. And so we can take a page out of this book of the disaster collaboration and apply it to government. Um, but now the most important thing for at least me as the mayor of the city is to try to get a disaster um, declaration so that those people who have not reported the damages to their properties who are going to have additional problems can get some help. So I will say that and, and I will close with that and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, I have one quick question um, on your water supply. Um, we've done a lot of work with the commission um, on fire following earthquakes. <clears throat> um, how did you manage the um, decreases in your pressure problems in the water supply on those incidents in the next couple of days? Did you anticipate that was coming in place in, because I believe doesn't Vallejo have a system set up to be able to draft if they needed to from the bay? Um, and how did you manage that until that got resolved itself? I wish I, I wish I had brought my public works director with me. I'm, I'm not <laughs> certain I have the answer to that question. Uh, Chief, do you have an answer to that question? We had, um, we did not lose complete pressure in any of our systems, and the and our, the water water issues were, um, as far as insufficient uh, supply, were limited to Mare Island. We were able to manage it 
they had to turn off certain parts of the grid. We were able to manage it by, when we had a fire, by calling in additional companies and doing long um, relay operations. So, and we do have a, so we do have a, uh, uh, a unit that can draft and, and supply water for a long, uh, for a long ways mainly into, into the inland. We didn't have to use that. So we were able to manage it with relay operations. If yeah, I could explain that to it, I'm, I'm sure you yeah, know what I'm talking about. The biggest problem we had with water was uh, one of the care facilities did not have no, water that's true. because of a break, and we had to get that repaired because there were disabled people in this facility. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Carbo. Thank you. Uh, I neglected to ask your um, uh, previous colleagues, does NAPA have a 211 system? No, they do not. I'm seeing them shaking. Thank you. And I only ask because I know that in other uh, areas where they've had disasters, uh, 211 seems to have worked pretty well. And us in our region, we recently, um, we've had a system of 211, but it sort of has been funded at its minimum. And we recently had to make a choice whether to continue it or not. And one of the, one of the main reasons for us continuing the funding for it and to try to continue that co collaboration um, was because of disasters. So um, I only asked to see if you guys had one so we could learn how it worked or not. But uh, thank you very much. Right. Any other questions from the commission? OK. Oh, Assembly Member Cooley. Mayor, you mentioned the issue of rain. In the recent rains, did you have folks whose houses were suddenly leaking? Because uh, that actually happened in Northridge. Southern California had a lot of homes with tile roofs, and it wasn't apparent till the till the rains came that the tile was leaking. Uh, so I'm just curious. We have had some rain. Have have there been reports of leaks? We haven't uh, had reports of uh, leakage in houses, homes at this point in time. Um, it doesn't mean it didn't occur. I'm really of the opinion that it may have occurred, but again, I don't think people are going to tell us because they're concerned about having to be out of their home and not being able to repair it. Thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you very much for your time and your insight. We appreciate you, especially taking your time to come up here and share your successes with us um, and the commission. For the Thank best. you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, uh, Commissioner, also Sonoma County Supervisor, 2nd District, David Rabbit. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I asked uh, our uh, chief building official from the County of Sonoma to join me today, Dwayne Starnes. Also like to point out that Dwayne is the building official of the year from the California Building Officials Association. <laughs> Completely sorry. embarrassed him with that just there, but I, uh, I want to give uh, hats off to Dwayne. Certainly unlike our neighbors, uh, Napa and Solano counties, Sonoma County suffered very lightly through this event. Uh, Two red tags, two yellow tags. One of the red tags was actually a pool structure, so it's hard to feel too uh, bad about that. Uh, one of the yellow tags was a bridge structure, a private bridge structure. Nonetheless, I think the uh, the overall uh, damage estimate, mostly personal property, was about five and a half million dollars. And of course, to those people who had lost uh, that amount of money, that is a disaster. Uh, and any under uh, any under any circumstances. Sonoma County, like Napa County, is uh, uh, not immune to disasters. Uh, most of the, our disasters are really around flooding, and the Russian River has had some infamous floods over the years, quite a few of them. My own home city of Petaluma, which is just about 30 miles west, northwest of here, has also uh, been flooded a number of times since I've lived there. Um, after the event, uh, uh, the earthquake, uh, Sonoma County did open the Emergency Operations Center. I think we kind of did a, a quick assessment. 
uh, determined that there was no public damage in to the roads, bridges, infrastructure, buildings and within Sonoma County, um, uh, major buildings that we did with the drive-by. Uh, I think we scaled back quickly there. Uh, Dwayne might be able to uh, add to that a little bit. We did immediately, uh, as, as a neighboring county to Napa, send some uh, crews, uh, specifically some fire crews, uh, uh, left immediately over to Napa. Uh, some later, and again, Dwayne can uh, expand upon this, sent some building inspectors as well, as you heard uh, earlier. I think um, looking back and kind of debriefing about what uh, lessons learned and uh, uh, you know what we could do better and how we can uh, continue to uh, 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 provide better service to our constituents. You know, communication, I think, is always something that has been brought up. Uh, communication, I think, is probably never gets you to the point where you've got it nailed. It's, there's always something better you can do. And you've heard uh, a couple people mention the uh, uh, making sure that we have some bilingual uh, uh, communication out there and, and have that uh, capability. I think that's uh, certainly true in our county. Um, I think Dwayne can also uh, attest to keeping certif uh, certif uh, certifications current at staff level, certainly something that we uh, uh, are, are big on. I think one of the things that we did after the um, uh, quake was took, th took advantage of the situation to some degree to send out letters to all of our unreinforced masonry buildings that we have uh, in the unincorporated area in Sonoma County, which I think numbers around 170. Uh, quite a few of those are actually agricultural buildings, um, but there are unfortunately about 24, I think, that are of a higher um, level occupancy, churches, private schools, and unfortunately, I think we still have eight uh, firehouses or, or buildings that are used for fire services that are considered uh, unreinforced masonry buildings. Sonoma County, should be noted, has uh, 41 separate entities that provide fire service to the residents, a very unique in, uh, situation, but still, nonetheless, not having uh, any kind of uh, fire service in a, in a building that's not uh, up to the latest code is problematic. Also, um, I should let you know that I'm a um, director of the Sonoma County Water Agency. We're a three-county system that supplies about uh, water to about 600,000 people. And although we don't supply, uh, we're a wholesaler, so we don't supply water to individual residences. So I, in terms of the earthquake, uh, certainly if one of our pipes breaks, that's a bad thing because most of the pipes are of a much larger size. Uh, but um, I did a quick assessment uh, immediately, obviously, uh, to the uh, system. Uh, it performed very well. We continue to do uh, seismic upgrades and have that on a regular scheduled uh, system going forward. In fact, accelerated slightly in these last couple of years. But of course, as you all know, it all comes down to resources and really to measure that out uh, with what ratepayers are willing to uh, afford and can afford. We also manage two, uh, two large dams, in, uh, one in Mendocino County, one in Sonoma County, um, the Coyote Dam on Lake Mendocino, uh, which ironically enough, uh, because of the drought, has very little water behind it, so the, the damage, uh, <laughs> any damage there would have uh, been minimal. And the um, uh, uh, Warm Springs Dam on Lake Sonoma, and uh, immediately had assessments of those structures, and, uh, and those turned out to be fine. I think um, one thing that I heard earlier, and I, uh, I just want to make note, we did approve a contract just a, a few uh, uh, board meetings ago with a, con a contract for a retainer to a private contractor for disaster cleanup assistance, something that I think we've had always on the books, and I'm not sure if every county has done this. It was new to me in this particular round because I think it's a, a five or a, it's a longer term contract. But um, uh, to, to be there in case of, in our case, usually we're thinking flood, uh, to be able to uh, come in and, and assist uh, the county transportation public works uh, in cleaning up um, uh, any kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, public uh, public uh, waste out there, as well as um, understanding our, what our waste hauler uh, franchise agreement allows us to do in terms of emergencies. So I think uh, those are kind of a, a few of the things I wanted to touch base on, and I'll, I'll put Dwayne on the spot and ask him if he has had anything to add to that. Uh, I think my comments uh, sort of reiterate some of the comments that have been made uh, that we've heard already. Um, I think that uh, the ongoing training, uh, making sure that folks uh, are, are uh, safety assessment program trained, um, making sure that those are uh, continually updated and, and, and that those folks are uh, uh, 
don't let their certifications expire. Uh, you've got new people coming on board all the time uh, in the downturn of the economy. We've lost several staff. We've had new staff come on board and have to uh, send those staff to receive training. Uh, we've also had uh, uh, folks in our architect's office, county architect's office trained uh, and SAP certified, and some of the engineers in public works also have received that training. So it doesn't necessarily have to stay within the building division or building department, but if you have architects Techs and engineers on staff, uh, they certainly, uh, within other departments, they certainly can receive that training as well. Um, one of the things that was also mentioned was the use of iPads, and uh, some of our folks that came back from the field said that that was very handy for them coming into a, even though we're Sonoma County, we're right next door, uh, they weren't familiar with downtown Napa, and uh, but they had an iPad, and they were able to not only locate where they were going, but how to get back to City Hall. So um, the, uh, the information from Google Maps and so forth that they were able to use uh, on hand uh, was very valuable, and so that technology, I think, is, is very valid. Um, one of the things that, uh, as far as a, a takeaway uh, that, that we've thought about uh, was uh, some of our folks that, that went out said that there, were, there was a, a high number of uh, uh, Spanish-speaking folks that wanted information, but they weren't able to give them information. And uh, we had thought that, uh, you know, maybe a brochure that, that uh, could be made up ahead of time uh, as far as us thinking about in the future, what can we do? Um, that would indicate things like, you know, what is a red tag? What is a yellow tag? What does that mean uh, for folks, whether both in both languages, uh, English and Spanish, um, so that people understand what those, those terms mean? Just some general uh, terminologies and maybe some website locations where they can get information if there's a, a hotline that's set up for uh, the, the county of, of Napa or the county of Sonoma uh, or the city of Santa Rosa, city of Napa. Um, where can they go to get information? Um, not necessarily putting phone numbers because those tend to tend to expire, but certainly websites, um, basic information uh, about, uh, I think it was brought up about uh, contractors coming in saying, uh, you know, we'll fix your place for $10,000 or maybe $5,000, but information about you know, licensed contractors, licensed design professionals, um, educating folks, giving them some basic information um, at the time uh, inspectors are going out. Uh, and doing these rapid evaluation safety assessments, uh, handing them out a brochure that just covers some b very basic information about uh, earthquake and uh, what what the different uh, uh, red tags and yellow tags and green tags mean, and also uh, what can they do. Uh, so I think that's basically all I have. And with that, certainly answer any questions that uh, the commission has. Yes. Any questions for our speakers? Okay. Thank you very much for your Thank, time. Appreciate Thank you. your information. Thanks, our next speaker is Aaron Hannigan, District 1 Supervisor from... Sorry, Chairman, if I could just ask at this stage, uh, we're running what appears to be... Uh, sorry, my name is Andrew Healy. I'm a resident of the City of Napa and would like to make some comment in the public comment area. We looks like we're running at least an hour over this day. Yes. So I'd just like an assurance from you that the public comment will not be cut short. The, the public comment will not be cut short. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, Aaron Hannigan, District 1 Supervisor from Solano County. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, as was announced, I'm Erin Hannigan. I represent District 1 in Solano County, and District 1 is from the Napa County border to Georgia Street in Vallejo, and uh, that's primarily where the damage occurred as a result of the South Napa earthquake. So, um, and I really want to say ditto, because I think what was what has been um, discussed prior to myself and Don Ryan, who is with the county um, OE. Uh, you know, is, is, is somewhat redundant. But there are a couple of things that I'd like to highlight that uh, the city of Vallejo, I think, um, you know, in their earnest effort to pr to try and upstage the Napa um, report might have forgot. <laughs> and 
Prior to becoming a supervisor, uh, I was on the city council for five years. And as you're all familiar with, the city of Vallejo went through very trying economic times, including bankruptcy. And we had filed for bankruptcy in May of 2008 and exited bankruptcy in 2011. So to say we're the underdog in this uh, disaster is a uh, um, an understatement. <laughs> we, we certainly are. And we are uh, still economically challenged in terms of our ability to uh, to address the, the full needs of our citizenry and our community as it relates to maintaining streets and roads, um, having inspectors to, into buildings and making sure that um, we don't have road construction going on and all that kind of stuff. So we do have some challenges in those in those manner. Uh, one of the things, though, while I was on the city council is supported Measure B, which is a 1% sales tax for 10 years. And that's proven to be about $12 million per year from 2012 to 20, uh, add 10 years, 2022. And uh, that $12 million, which will be rising over the years as our sales tax, do tax dollars increase, has allowed us the opportunity to look at some of our emergency systems and uh, really identify areas that we need to improve uh, in terms of communication uh, among our public safety departments as well as with the county. And then the communication modes that we have in place as well as how we communicate with our community itself. And I know it's been mentioned about Facebook, um, but the uh, city of Vallejo has put in place a very robust communication program that um, announces all kinds of things to the to the citizenry and that includes emails regular emails as well as new newsletters and those were that along with Facebook were very um, very important avenues for communicating uh, the disaster and the locations of the disaster and information for people who are affected and I, I, what the conversation I've had with the city manager, Dan Keene, is the effect of that is people weren't racing to the downtown to come see the damage. Uh, they were aware of what was going on. They knew to stay away and let the professionals take over. And so, um, and they, they knew who to contact and where to go and what programs were going to be available. So um, I, I'd like to give a, a shout out to the community that voted for Measure B that provided that information. Um, I, I'm really going to address kind of the soft uh, parts of, of, you know, dealing with uh, folks who have survived a disaster, and that feeling of waking up in the morning at 3:20 a.m. and um, being either, maybe even popped out of bed, but you know, not knowing what's happening around you in your community, where the damage is, maybe in, in your own home. Um, there was a uh, Jill mentioned about, you know, some folks' uh, heart medicine was uh, underperforming for a couple of days, and you know, that for me was was kind of what I was addressing. Uh, there was conversation earlier about the Red Cross. The Red Cross set up a facility immediately at our Florence Douglas Senior Center. It's the only senior center we have in town. And interestingly enough, that center had experienced its own damage. The ceiling tile grid had, had shifted almost two inches one direction and made what was the largest room unavailable for help. Um, however, we were able to assist folks who had been displaced from their homes uh, temporarily. Uh, there was mention about an opportunity that some landlords took during that time to maybe change their tenancy. Um, for uh, as this being that opportunity to do it. And we ended up with some folks who were disabled, who were elderly, who, you know, socioeconomically challenged, who were actually told by their landlords that they could not stay in their buildings when their buildings were not even inspected. And so I pretty much camped down at the Red Cross and made sure that those folks had their buildings inspected and if they were cleared, um, escorted them back because it was more important that they had a, a roof over their head. Uh, they were certainly also fed at the Red Cross. Um, the, the core of the damage in Vallejo was along Tennessee Street and uh, Sonoma Boulevard and uh, parts of, of Georgia Street. And that damage, as you've heard, was to buildings that were constructed any time before 1950. Um, we're talking about chimneys. We're talking about plaster on walls, um, some ceiling tiles as well as roofs, and then, of course, personal property damage. 
Interestingly enough, that's an area in the town that um, is, we have a high uh, renter's rate, tenancy, uh, landlord, uh, facilities, older buildings that have not been, uh, you know, who, that are lacking in repairs or repairs that, um, you know, may not be up to code. And uh, so, what, so what we have are folks who are in a situation that, um, it's going to be very challenging for them as we seek, uh, as they look for funding to help either cap off their chimneys uh, or, you know, do whatever minor repairs that they can to continue to reside in their, in their facility. Uh, you've talked, you've heard about underreported damage. Interestingly enough, I heard a comment about fire suppression systems. We had a large church who, uh, which had been inspected. It was built uh, probably after 1990. Uh, it did have a fire suppression system that that created. Uh, they're estimating about $250,000 worth of damage to their property. And the initial inspection was that's not earthquake damage, uh, but in subsequent inspections, they they've determined that it is. Is. Uh, I, I, I also believe that underreported damage is um, going to be a problem. I think that, you know, when you talk about water damage between chimneys and buildings, that kind of information, you know, whether that's happening or not doesn't come out for a long, long time. And if we're lucky enough to have a big rain over a successive period of time, then we'll know it's occurred. But otherwise, you're going to find out when you start smelling, you know, mold and that kind of stuff that's growing. There was a conversation about VOAD. Um, there is a Solano VOAD. It's now called Vallejo Earthquake Recovery Group that's been put in place. Uh, I have a member of my office who is on that team, and uh, we'll be working with them throughout this entire process. If I could talk about a, um, maybe this is a lesson learned or, or what I would term uh, maybe a recommendation to the city of Vallejo, and that would be uh, during the bankruptcy, which I mentioned earlier, we had put together a very robust neighborhood watch group because you know, we had lost uh, almost 40% of our police force. And we have over 300 neighborhood watch groups. And I was really, I've been really impressed with Mark Luce's comments about how the neighbors got out and knocked on their, their neighbor's door to find out if they were there, if they're okay, do they need help cleaning up, are they injured? You know, they had a lot more information about their neighbors than, than other people did. And I think this kind of um, disaster uh, could, could to me, sort of highlights the need to neighborhood watch, yes, could be a crime suppression safety type of a, a program, but I think we could also train our neighborhood watch coordinators to, to react in a disaster of this magnitude. Uh, we also have a citizens on patrol and a CERT uh, community uh, emergency response team that were not called into duty because, again, you know, the damage in Vallejo uh, was not as great as, as, um, as I, you know, as, or ex the extent of it, like in the city of Napa. Uh, but in the event that, that it, you know, would rise to that occasion would be also two other groups that I would uh, see being deployed. Uh, I mean, I can't say uh, any more about uh, needing an IA declaration. Um, so, uh, you know, we have, uh, it doesn't matter, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, you can talk about red tag, yellow tag. Uh, what we're looking at is beyond the safety issues, it's the repair, and how do we do that? I love the comment of the architect, I forgot your name, um, in regards to the historical buildings being your community, your, your history. Vallejo certainly has its share of beautiful historical buildings, and, and having IA assistance for our community to be able to restore those buildings is important. It's important to the fabric of our city. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Don Ryan, who will introduce this title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I'm Don Ryan. I'm the Emergency Services Manager for Solano County Sheriff's Office. Um, uh, based on the questions that you had for the earlier speakers, I can keep my comments short and I'll uh, uh, tailor them to what uh, I think you're interested in. Um, on the morning of the earthquake, I was in Massachusetts pack packing my bags to come home after after a family visit. So I didn't feel a thing. And the first uh, uh, indication I got that something bad happened was from the Red Cross saying, do you want me to open a shelter in Solano 
County. <laughs> so our VOAD program is strong, as uh, uh, Supervisor Hannigan mentioned, and uh, they're very active in trying to uh, help our, our citizens recover. So we immediately activated the EOC. My assistant manager came in and, and opened things up. And in uh, Solano, we're very fortunate that we have two new plans that, are, that were updated in 2012. So we have an emergency operation plan that included checklists. So if you get into a seat in the EOC, you know what to do if you haven't done it before. And then we have a multi-hazard mitigation plan that's brand new that includes the uh, earthquake damage areas or uh, risk areas. Uh, and I was able to uh, send out uh, search and rescue teams to do damage assessments on everything from levees to bridges to um, roads in the county that were, were critical. So those two plans helped out immensely for us. Uh, we activate our EOC if a city activates an EOC. So we were there, um, and uh, unfortunately all the damage was uh, concentrated in Vallejo, so we did everything we possibly could to get Vallejo the, uh, the assets and the people that they needed. So quite often in our EOC, the experts weren't there, and I had a, a, a sheriff's lieutenant or a, a deputy running logistics, but it worked out pretty good thanks to those uh, uh, very extensive plans that we had in place prior to. So we um um, we had about $1.8 million total in damage to county buildings in Vallejo and to some extent uh, small superficial damage to a garage in, uh, in Fairfield. But uh, those buildings were closed temporarily. They're all fully open now. And we were able to continue the services from everything from health and uh, social services, medical, physicals, the courts, and, and got them all uh, up and running within a few days. So the, the work continues, and we have a group in the county that is coordinating those efforts. So if some office has to move out someplace else, uh, we can coordinate that without interrupting services. Uh, the major, the big ticket item is a chiller on one of our buildings down there that has to be replaced. Uh, and we are continuing, just as uh, Supervisor Hannigan mentioned, uh, we're hoping for rain. Uh, but if, if the rain does come, we need to seal up these buildings, and that's kind of a priority right now, is to get the outer shells uh, sealed up. Um, residential damage has been minimal. Uh, I still get small uh, uh, calls. I did get one yesterday from a house that was actually built on pilings uh, that has had some serious uh, foundation issues. So the building officials immediately went out there. Uh, the morning of the fire, uh, um, as was mentioned earlier uh, from our firefighters, the mutual aid system in California uh, is very strong. And uh, within uh, minutes of the earthquake, we had strike teams mobilized, one for Napa and one for the city of Vallejo from outside agencies within our county. And uh, from my, my goal now is, to, is the individual assistance uh, or to actually get these houses rebuilt uh, through our VOAD program. So we have everything from faith-based groups to uh, Habitat for Humanity working with VOAD. Uh, and hopefully uh, the last I, uh, update I got was the uh, bylaws and the policies and procedures are about finished and they can start getting to work. And so that's all I have, and unless there's any questions. Questions Thanks. from the commissioners? <laughs> It's easy going last. I know. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you very you. much for your time. Thank you All again. Right. Appreciate thank the you. information. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Our next speaker, Ms. Tracy Crumpen, senior field rep for Senator Lois Wolk's office. Good afternoon, Commission. Uh, my name is Tracy Crumpen with Senator Lois Wolk's office. She was hoping to be here today, uh, wasn't able to. Good to see Supervisor Rabbit on the Commission, so good to see you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep this very short and brief so we can go ahead and get to some of the other uh, experts because that's who we really want to hear from. Uh, the Senator did have really three questions that she wanted to go ahead and pose to the Commission. Obviously, not to be answered today, but just something to go ahead and keep in the back of your mind as we're having these discussions. Discussions. Uh, one would be uh, our seismic standards and implementation for housing and buildings adequate. And I think it's already been touched upon that obviously safety, human safety and human lives, that's first and foremost the concern, but maybe that's something that we should look at is whether or not those uh, safety standards are up to par and uh, the implementation. And what or are or wh what are the barriers or are there barriers to better seismic safety results? And how can we all work together to work towards those better results to go ahead and keep not just the public safe, but then to go ahead and keep the buildings and the historic buildings uh, in one piece. And third is even though the this commission really doesn't deal with insurance, insurance is an issue that we need to look at. And whether or not insurance and insurance practices are really adequate for the policy holders and what are the barriers that are keeping some of these individuals from purchasing the insurance that they may need. 
So uh, our office is here to go ahead and work with the commission. I've been in touch with uh, Mr. McCarthy. Feel free to give out my information. Everybody will be meeting. Uh, our office is very interested in doing what we can to go ahead and move forward. And that's it. Thank you. Told you it'd be quick. Question? <laughs> Thank you, Tracy, Thank you. very much. We appreciate your time and, and uh, the Senator's interest. Um, our next two we'll bring up together, uh, Mr. Charles Radamad, the Assistant Director from the California OES Recovery Section, and uh, Mr. Steve de Blasio, FEMA Administration Region 9 uh, Federal Coordinating Officer. Good afternoon, and <clears throat> thanks for having us here today. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, all the first correspondents, uh, for first responders, and everyone who worked uh, very hard and long hours to ensure the public safety is protected. Although it had been uh, over a decade since this uh, area has experienced an earthquake, similar earthquake, or stronger, it was very impressive how the local jurisdictions responded to an event of this magnitude. In response uh, to the South uh, Napa earthquake, the recovery section had deployed immediately uh, many staff and managers to assist the, the, the affected uh, counties. We had, uh, we sent safety inspectors, we, 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 over 60 of them, we deployed them through a, a, some kind of uh, 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 process that we have. We also sent a, um, a debris removal specialist to assist the affected area with the debris plan and to ensure that the process is done properly. We also send inspectors who are specialized in public assistance and individual assistance. In addition to that, we also deployed uh, individual assistance uh, specialist who is very experienced and, and uh, expert in, uh, in donation management, volunteers, uh, and, uh, and coordinated the uh, VOADs and uh, faith-based organizations uh, with the county and the cities. So uh, immediately uh, on the onset of the event, we realized that uh, this, ev this uh, disaster would require uh, immediate assistance from the state and the feds. We, we coordinated immediately with Washington, D.C., and our partners in, in Region 9 uh, FEMA. We invite them to, uh, to conduct a preliminary damage assessment on both the public assistance side and the individual assistance side. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the first uh, preliminary damage assessment took place the fourth day after the event. The affected uh, local jurisdictions uh, helped us a lot in preparing to that. We completed the uh, preliminary damage assessment for the public assistance side on uh, about two days, and we secured the, uh, the, the president proclaiming a, a major declaration on the public assistance side. Uh, we're still waiting for the individual assistance, and hopefully it's a positive response. <coughs> While we may have experienced some frustrating moments uh, during the joint PDA process, and we admit to that, uh, it wasn't much, but it, we, we did experience some. Uh, we definitely had some constructive lessons learned from this event. And I would like to take a few moments to share the, those outcomes and lessons learned with you today. Uh, first positive outcome, uh, the prompt and swift actions uh, of the local jurisdictions on the onset of the event allowed Cal OES to better coordinate the resources. All jurisdictions were very welcoming of Cal OES and FEMA and were eager to participate in every aspect of the response and recovery effort. The locals felt comfortable to contact 
call OES with questions and request resources. Most importantly, the local jurisdictions provided professional staff to accompany the joint team, with, which made it easier to verify the damages. Specifically on the public assistance side, they, they pointed out the damages, um, why the estimates are the way they are, and they were very professional in conducting themselves with the team. Lessons learned, we had some duplication effort in the PDA process. The tagging of homes and uh, tagging ho of homes for safety was not consistent with FEMA and SBA major minor uh, process definitions. This has created kind of confusion since the yellow and red tag don't correspond with major and minor. So we're hoping that uh, we can work along with FEMA and, and uh, the safety assessment teams when they do their, their inspection and they write on the yellow tag and red tag, they may, we, we'd like them to explain a little bit more um, about the damages, the level of damage, and how that will correspond with major and minor, what FEMA is looking for and SBA is looking for. Of course, local jurisdictions were still in response mode when PDA was initiated. That created a little bit hardship on the uh, local jurisdictions. And we need to look into this in the future to see if, if going immediately on, uh, on PDA is, is really helpful, uh, needed, or we can wait a little bit longer. Um, it's not uncommon that PDA are done immediately after an event because we'd like to expedite the process, get the ball rolling, get some funding on the streets. <coughs> the PDA list that we had, um, the tagged homes and businesses, it should be uh, updated periodically because we had so many uh, homes that were inspected twice and, and later on that was corrected, but that should really be avoided in the next event. Uh, locals, sh local jurisdictions should start planning to draft a, a local debris plan. This is really important to have a, uh, a debris plan uh, ready. Uh, that will assist them in identifying uh, disposal sites, identifying how FEMA will look at the debris management, what things are eligible, what things are not eligible. Uh, how they can benefit from recycling, how also if they have a debris management plan that will increase their, their our share by 5%. So that's very helpful. Um, the SIMS reporting responsibility and mission tasking request was also problematic for us and for the locals. So we need to work on that. Uh, understanding the insurance policies, that's very helpful because at the time when we were doing damage assessment, that was very problematic because we didn't know how much insurance proceeds are and how can be deducted from the total damage, which is a requirement by FEMA. Moving forward, next step, we need to provide a comprehensive training on SIMS, PDA, uh, on PA side and, and individual assistance side. Uh, the PDA preliminary damage assessment was just a small part of the uh, recovery training. We'd like now to make it a more comprehensive training because we realize that's really needed. Debris management also, we're gonna offer debris management training. And safety assessment, we need to look into the process again and see why the inconsistency in tagging homes. We found like probably a couple of them, at least the one I'm aware of, they were tagged green and they should be tagged red. Individual assistance programs, uh, also we need to uh, provide training about, uh, for, for that, uh, comprehensive training, uh, as well as the public assistance. 
we're working toward now to have a uh, the uh, w historic programmatic agreement signed between us and FEMA and SHPO, the State Historic Preservation. This is really important to facilitate the uh, the projects, the historic building projects. And uh, the other uh, issue that we're working toward right now is the uh, building codes and standards uh, with FEMA policy, because that's really problematic for us, uh, the way it's written and the way it's going to impact California. Um, my partner and I, we're, we're committed to that, and we're going to find a way to supplement what the policy doesn't provide. And uh, we're going to use to the maximum the 406 process, the hazard mitigation process, which will provide additional funding, repair, improvements uh, beyond the codes and standards that's allowed. I'll take any questions if you have now. Commissioner Parkinson. Just wanted to clarify something. So there was a problem with the red and yellow tagging um, as far as meeting FEMA standards, is that correct? No, it's not FEMA standards. It was for uh, the, uh, the, the uh, safety assessment program standard, which is we coordinate. Okay. And is that, um, is that been, been fixed or uh, been resolved in we, some way? We're going to look into it and, and find out why that specific person or inspector um, tagged a, a home green where it's supposed to be a red. Maybe, maybe that it was done fast. He didn't see or she didn't see the, uh, the, the, the building wall. Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, this is something we really need to look into because it shouldn't hap have happened. Those safety inspectors are very well trained. They have, they follow the process well, and uh, we're going to look into it and find out why. Are you describing a single building or multiple uh, buildings? I think it was a couple houses. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Questions? Okay. Steve DiBaggio from FEMA. Good afternoon. Uh, I, too, would like to thank you for inviting me here. Um, you know, as has been said here a couple of times today, you know, all disasters begin and end at the local level. And, and clearly, this is representative of that. Uh, the locals, the county, uh, our state partners uh, did a fine job here in, in responding and beginning the recovery efforts to this event. Um, Needless to say, you know, FEMA is there to support in, in a response, and uh, we were not called upon to do that. Um, I heard it mentioned earlier, you know, it would be nice to have a, a FEMA person in my hip pocket, you know, to help guide us through the earlier uh, goings on an event like this. And we are available to do that uh, if the need is there and if there is a request for us to be present. Uh, we will staff uh, li uh, liaison officers at the state level, uh, at the county level. A lot of times we will call them division supervisors. Uh, but depending on the, the level of response necessary and coordination during that response necessary uh, would, I guess, drive the request for FEMA to actually be present. Uh, we do not want to get involved unless we need to be there. And, and that's what we depend on the locals, the county, and the state folks to make that determination. And they do a great job at at assessing exactly what other assistance uh, is necessary. After the state, it, it would be the federal agencies. Uh, as my partner uh, Charles here said, a request did come in for public assistance and individual assistance. Uh, the president did grant public assistance on September the 11th uh, and appointed me as the federal coordinating officer for this event. Uh, since then, uh, the state has conducted the applicant's briefing, uh, which is really a state meeting, and, and FEMA supports that meeting uh, with our public assistance uh, folks. And then uh, immediately following that applicant's uh, briefing is when uh, the more FEMA-centric meetings begin, and we call those the kickoff meetings. We are in the process of doing them right now. Uh, as of this date, uh, we have 13 kickoff meetings completed. Uh, we're beginning to uh, assemble, uh, and this is uh, the state and FEMA are at these meetings, although it is a FEMA responsibility to run these kickoff meetings. Um, we are uh, obtaining a list of potential projects. 
it, it's hard to get a good number on the projects right now uh, because a lot of uh, individually identified projects could be rolled into one project worksheet. Uh, so it's difficult to say how many there will be. Uh, I can tell you that we have at this point 30 uh, requests for public assistance, and that means there are 30 different applicants, and that could be state agencies, including Cal OES, uh, county governments, and municipal governments applying for assistance. Uh, in addition to that, we have local uh, private not for profits, depending on their mission statements and their charter, could also be eligible for FEMA reimbursement for the repairs necessary. Um, in a couple of cases, there, these are, there are some applicants out there that have never applied to FEMA prior to this event. So they are going through those eight of the, 22 of the applicants that are already in the system were clean, had already worked with us. There are about eight additionals that uh, have to go through a state and FEMA review just to determine eligibility, and then we will get them into the system as well. Uh, like Charles uh, said, um, you know, the emphasis here is not just on rebuilding, but uh, rebuilding smarter, more resilient, and more uh, resistant to the next event, whatever that may be, whether it be earthquake or flood or any other natural or man-made disaster, which we have to always be uh, prepared for. Um, the way we're going to do that is, is through, uh, as Charles said, the 406 mitigation is the mitigation money. Uh, those are FEMA dollars that can be applied to a project to now build that building back stronger, smarter, safer, better, uh, to get uh, the, the buildings built up to the code and standards that are current. As Charles said, uh, there have been uh, uh, some, uh, let me, I don't want to say confusion, but there have been some struggles in the past in terms of what's eligible in terms of getting to that new code and standard. Uh, you know, Charles and I have worked through some difficult issues in the past. I have every reason to believe uh, we will be able to get to yes on, on most all of those issues. Um, and, and that is clearly our intent. Our intent is to get to yes uh, on, on the eligibility and the dollar values of these damages that have to be repaired. As he said, a huge emphasis on historical, cultural issues. We have to maintain that fiber in these communities, in these counties. So clearly, uh, we are going to bring the forces to bear necessary. Uh, we're going to bring in the architectural historians, uh, the uh, earthquake um, insurance law specialist to help us interpret some of these policies, which are very complicated, and make sure that, that the insurance companies do right uh, by their insured, uh, and, and we do right by our applicants. Um, uh, we will continue this in a, in a great partnership. Um, again, uh, I, I've heard it, it said a number of times today that we're anxiously awaiting uh, an answer on the individual assistance. I, I can tell you that uh, the state and FEMA have done the best job possible with all the input uh, provided to us through the, the local and county governments to send a package into uh, the administration, uh, which will hopefully get you to the answer that you're looking for. Um, in any event, whether we get an IA declaration or not, uh, clearly you're doing what you need to do right now out here in the state and in the counties and, and communities in, in California. Work with the voluntary agencies, active in disasters, uh, get those uh, community recovery uh, groups stood up. Uh, as Charles mentioned, his voluntary agency liaison from the state is out there in these communities and helping to organize these uh, uh, faith-based and, and other not-for-profit organizations that are out there doing some great things. Um, our voluntary agency liaison is out there as well, uh, assisting in those efforts. Um, I stand here to support the state and the communities of California uh, the best, to the best of my ability and under every um, you know, ability afforded me under the Stafford Act, the law. Um, and uh, you know, uh, it's not my first rodeo. Uh, I, I'm with the federal service over 38 years now. A number of events I've managed uh, in California, either here from within the state or from a headquarters perspective with FEMA. So I have a good feel for uh, where we need to go with this. Um, and, and, um, and I can assure you that we're going to get there as fast uh, and as smartly as we can uh, through our partnership uh, with the state. Uh, I will submit to any qu questions that you may have for me. Okay, thank you. Any questions for our FEMA representative? 
Okay, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for your valuable information. We will definitely be, that will absolutely be incorporated in our final report when it comes out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation um, is our NASA JPL lab um, implications for the future. Uh, Dr. Susan Owen. Pointer? Is, you, is this work as a pointer? That's a recorder. That's the recorder. Yeah. Okay, no pointer. Okay. Thank you for, oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us to talk today. I'm going to uh, give a presentation. Uh, this is a different perspective on the earthquake. Um, we at JPL deployed our resources to look at the earthquake, um, partially from a science point of view, but also thinking about how this information can can help with response. And we've been working, um, we've been working with several federal and state agencies to. Um, help them understand the earthquake and I will describe the data that we observed and how that was used for this earthquake. This is the work of several people at JPL, not just myself, but also Frank Webb, Ron Blom, and the other people listed here. So just an overview of the earthquake. Um, all of you are familiar with, with where it occurred, when it occurred, and, and how big it was all move forward. Um, this slide here shows a timeline of what was done uh, at JPL uh, to respond to the earthquake. And so you can see here, August 24th, day one, the earthquake occurred in the morning. Uh, within hours, we had several automatically generated model products based on the seismic data. Uh, and then that morning, the California Earthquake Clearinghouse was activated. We've had, we've been working with the California Earthquake Clearinghouse for a number of years uh, and been participating in their earthquake exercises so that we're familiar with providing information to that group and they've seen some of the types of data and observations that, that we can provide. Uh, we worked with the GPS data in the area. This is global positioning system data to measure how much the earthquake changed the surface of the earth, how much it moved the ground. And that can help us understand um, how much moved, how much the fault moved underneath the ground, generating a fault model. So this was within the first couple of days. We had our first space-based observation uh, on day three. The Italian Space Agency that we're working with collected its first image after the earthquake on day three. We got the data within 12 hours or so after the observation. We're able to generate a result uh, on the, uh, shortly after that, a few hours after that. And then at the end of the week, we were able to take an image of the Napa area with our airborne instrument, UAV SAR. And so we had an image from UAV SAR uh, a couple of days after that. So within the first week, we were able to get uh, information from ground-based <coughs> instruments, from GPS, from space-based radar, and from, uh, from airborne observations. So I'm just going to go through in a little more detail uh, the data products that we provided and how they were used. So this is an example of the model products that were generated on day one shortly after the earthquake and provided to the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. So this is a damage assessment based on the seismic data run through uh, the HAZIS model to give a detailed estimate of where the damage was and this can help with prompt allocation of resources. On day two, we had actual observations of how much the ground had moved. So this helps us understand what happened in the earthquake, both at the surface and underneath the, underneath the ground. So these yellow vectors here, these, um, these show the displacement, the movement at the GPS stations. So the GPS stations are the blue triangles. The color map underneath the yellow vectors shows a model estimate of how much the ground moved. And uh, it's a little bit 
it's a, an acquired taste to, inter to interpret this way of looking at the ground deformation, but it gives the deformation, it gives the ground motion in a lot of detail that, um, that the geologists like to see. And so if you look at these color bands here, it's kind of like looking at a topo map or a contour map where one single blue band here indicates the same amount of ground motion. And then um, as you see the, the bands is, as they're dense, in the same way a topo map, if you see a lot of lines together, that indic indicates a steep gradient. Where you see lots of color bands tight together, that indicates that there's a lot of ground motion happening. So you see that close into the fault. So we can use the GPS to understand how much the fault moved and they make a prediction of how much the whole area moved in the earthquake. We're also observing the GPS. Um, you get for the days after the earthquake. So one of the things that was noticed about this earthquake was that there was a lot of motion after the initial rupture. So people who were out mapping the surface rupture noticed that it nearly doubled from, day, from Sunday to Monday. And so this is due to continued motion on the fault and we can observe that uh, with the GPS stations and continue to monitor that so we have an idea of how much things are continuing to move after the earthquake, which might cause additional damage. This is not just due to aftershocks, this is actually due to creep on the fault. So this is the radar image. This is another um, diagram that has these color bands. So again, where you see lots of close uh, color bands together, that's where there was a lot, of a lot of deformation, a lot of motion. This area here, where it's sort of confused and jumbled, that's actually where we can't measure it very well, either because the ground was broken up too much or there was too much, too much motion. So for this particular instrument, we weren't able to image this area, but we were able to see a lot of motion here. And geologists were able to take this map that we provided on day three and where they saw, where they saw sharp changes in these color fringes, they were able to go out to the field and identify additional surface ruptures. So these are examples of where they use this information to go out and, and locate additional places where the ground had ruptured and might have affected water lines, um, other infrastructure. Along with mapping the deformation, we were able to um, get a damage estimate. So for this earthquake, the type of damage that occurred from this earthquake was not easy to see from space, but there were some areas where we were able to image the damage, for instance, in the mobile home park. So this figure here, where you see these red pixels, this is where the radar detected damage from the earthquake. Uh, this type of of assessment, damage assessment, is good for detecting building collapse or liquefaction. It can be used for floods as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, see where wine barrels have, have fallen off uh, and broken inside buildings, and it's not so good at seeing uh, facade, areas where the facade has changed because of the angle of the, of the way the radar is looking. But, uh, but for larger earthquakes, this can be useful, and, and we were able to detect some of the damage from this earthquake with, from space with this radar. Let me go back. This figure here shows the first uh, image that we had from the, from the airborne instrument, from UAVSAR. So this image here shows in greater detail where we see the, the surface faulting. So this was deployed in rapid response to the earthquake. Uh, we talked to, with NASA headquarters and were able to reroute the plane from its uh, observation plan to deploy it to Napa, where we had some pre-existing observations because we were looking at this area because we knew it was an active area for earthquakes. And so by Friday, they were flying over this region. I'm gonna go to this next figure here, and it's a little hard to see, <laughs> but there's, um, there's black lines here where the fault, the surface fault rupture was mapped based on this UAV SAR imagery. And here's where um, these red dots indicate where the USGS geologists had mapped the offsets of, of the earthquake. So this is, this is helpful for the scientists and the engineers and people in the field trying to understand where this fault had ruptured and what type of surface deformation was caused by the earthquake. 
Another way that this UAV SAR data is very helpful is in assessing the levees. So there's been a project by, uh, run by Kathleen Jones at JPL where she's been using UAV SAR to monitor the levees. And so following this earthquake, she imaged some areas close to the earthquake to see if there was damage. And so this helped the Department of Water Resources in targeting their LIDAR assets. So this is more information investigating possible liquefaction uh, caused by the earthquake. And it was also used to determine that some of the levees were stable. So this is a way of imaging a fairly large area that might be hard to do uh, by people on the ground to get an assessment of how much this area was damaged. There are some other, I just wanted to mention that there are some other resources that JPL has, other projects that are important for or can be used for earthquake response that weren't used for this particular event. So there's a project called Finder where we uh, developed a technology, a radar technology, microwave radar technology to detect live heartbeats of people trapped in collapsed buildings. Fortunately, this wasn't necessary for this earthquake, but for a larger event, this is something that could be used. There's also a, a lot of projects at JPL looking at other types of hazard assessment. So these are two figures looking at, or two figures showing some of our capabilities for fire response. So mapping fire danger hotspots and also mapping damage following fires. So this is just a summary uh, of the work that we did for the Napa earthquake. Um, so within the first day, uh, the JPL teams had started working on the earthquake and started coordinating with the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. Uh, all of the information that I showed here was shared with the Earthquake Clearinghouse, was shared with the Southern California Earthquake Center. Uh, these space and airborne radar observations were very useful for field teams in identifying the fault ruptures. We can provide these high resolution maps of, of motion caused by the earthquake. So if people want to know how much the, uh, the, the vertical datum has changed, so how much was the ground uplifted in particular regions, and has this changed the flood hazard in particular regions, the type of information that we're collecting here can be very helpful in answering those questions. And uh, this is part of a partnership that we're starting with the Seismic Safety Commission uh, to identify how we can best use this type of technology and data to help with the response needs for future events. And so the goal is to make sure that we're coordinated and integrated with, with the state so that we can help as much as we can with disaster response and recovery. So that's, that's what I have on our JPL earthquake response, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Susan, so much. Um, Commissioner McCarry and then Mark Johnson. Uh, Susan, yeah, very impressive. Uh, we saw portions of this uh, at our last meeting, right. and this is more relevant, really the, the, a lot of detail, especially on the timeline, how long it took you to, to get some of the information yeah. and the collaboration with the Europeans, I guess the Italian satellites over there. Um, my question is the availability of the UAV SAR. Uh, it's not a common airplane that you can just call up. Uh, how easy is it for you to be able to call it, to, to have it there? Where where is it located, and how how much does it cost to have uh, an airplane with that kind of capabilities uh, to be able to do this work? Well, I can um, I can answer your first question. Uh, I might defer to my colleagues for the cost because I don't have that on the top of my head. But um, UAVs are it's used globally, and so fortunately for us for this event, uh, it was. It was within the state of California. Uh, like I said, it was planned to go and observe elsewhere uh, at the time of the earthquake. We can't plan for the earthquake um, in the observation schedule, but, but we were able to get it within a week. It is based in California, so it's always coming back to California. So chances are it's going to be here you know, more than just a few times a year. But there are times of the year when it's in Iceland or down in South America. And so it would take a little longer to, to get it back. Is it a JPL uh, piece of equipment? It's a NASA piece, a of, NASA equipment. piece of equipment. Yeah, okay, it's a NASA great. piece of Thanks. equipment. And I don't know if, um, Frank, do you want to speak to the cost or how much the UAV SAR program? 
Well, just so ju just to be clear, it, the, the UAV SAR is a it's a NASA aircraft, so it's a Gulf it's a G3, a Gulfstream three, and the instrument was built at JPL um, over the last several years, and it's still being designed. I'm not sure if we built more than one. But uh, I think it's, you know, on the order of the cost of the plane to get one of these and the cost of the instrument is probably on the order of millions of dollars for the instrument. It's on the low ones, I think. But uh, when we fly it for events like this, you know, NASA is very interested in hazard response and they, you know, make it available for disasters such, like, such as this in the state and elsewhere because they want to do what they can to help the state of California and the country in responding. UAV SAR has been used in other situations as well around the country for response, I believe also for the Gulf oil spill, it was deployed for some oil slick monitoring and it's been deployed probably some other times, I think for the fires, the station fire in, in Pasadena, which uh, Susan showed a picture of. So it's basically not an, a money exchange. It's kind of like uh, needing computational time in a supercomputer. You apply, you make a proposal, and you get selected. You may not be charged for that. Uh, NASA is basically under, uh, or, you know, uh, paying for, for these fees, uh, but you have to request it and get approval to be able to use it. We have to, yes, yes, so we, we have to request and get approval, and of course, you know, like like all agencies, there, there are budget constraints on everything, on, on, all, on their prior, and they prioritize accordingly, you know, yeah. within their budget, so, um, you know, get, getting the plane in the air, you know, I think the DWR, for some of the work they do on the levees, EWR actually funds some of that levy work at JPL and okay. provides, you know, resources to fly the planes and to actually do the analysis. But for hazard response and rapid response, you know, NASA, you know, it, you know, it does its bit to help. Thank you. Mark Johnson. Uh, my questions tag on uh, Commissioner McCarry's questions. And uh, just going to back to provide just a brief summary of the Earthquake Clearinghouse. That's a coordinated effort of the California Geological Survey, USGS, the Seismic Safety Commission, and the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, bringing together uh, resources inspectors, uh, those people that can help out uh, with the process. So the question is, uh, when we have a major earthquake, the uh, clearinghouse mobilizes to provide intelligence to the state operations centers so that we, to help with the assessment and the prioritization of our resources to respond to the earthquake. So when the clearinghouse uh, mobilizes, they'll probably reach out to you. Is that the, the protocol right now? Yes. And do they request your resource, or do you start working to see if you can mobilize your resource? So we, we start to work to mobilize the resources pretty much right after the event happens. And then when the clearinghouse is activated, we're on the communication list. So we have somebody that he gets the email message or gets the phone call from the clearinghouse notifying them that the clearinghouse has been activated. And then we know to submit the information that we have to the clearinghouse and to call into the telecons. Okay, so it's pretty much your procedure that the clearinghouse will reach out to you to see if you're available to help? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Dr. Davis, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the information. Our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Mahin, Mahin, I, thank you. <laughs> I knew that and I struggled with it every time. Director of the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, or PEER as we call it. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to meet with the commission one more time. I am particularly humbled by being here uh, with the uh, distinguished list of speakers who have already addressed you, who actually lived through the um, earthquakes that uh, have occurred here and have uh, demonstrated a great deal of uh, professionalism, dedication, diligence, and agility in responding and living through the events of the last uh, six weeks or, or so. 
So uh, I'm a little bit, uh, as I said, humble in sort of talking about something that other people have lived through. But there were a number of questions that people asked with regard to what uh, the engineering implications of some of the, in, or interpretations of some of the things that they saw might be. And let's see if I can get my computer to remember that it's a computer here. Up. No, uh, well, it remembers it's a computer, but this thing doesn't know that it's a computer. Yeah. Saying anything, searching. There we go. So sometimes you get lucky. In any event, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm as I uh, have mentioned, uh, I think a, a, an engineer and a structural engineer. And so I'm going to basically give some views here that are from that perspective of how you get structures that you can build that will hopefully stand up and not collapse in an earthquake and in the future that will be more resilient and um, uh, perhaps we will one day have an earthquake uh, of this stature and, and not care anymore because everything will work uh, as we hope it might. Um, I think there's a lot of people in the room who know far more about the earthquake than I know. But one of the things in terms of earthquake engineering is that we try to make things better and to improve performance. And the way to do that is to learn as much as we can from uh, earthquakes uh, as they occur. And so thanks really to the generosity and cooperation of the local officials and the citizens of Napa uh, uh, and surrounding areas, uh, I think this has become one of the most well-documented earthquakes uh, that we have seen certainly in the last several decades. And uh, because of that, there is an opportunity to do some important things both in terms of communicating with the public officials as to what are the consequences, what are the intents, what are the remedies associated to, with earthquake engineering. And so over the last uh, few weeks since the earthquake, there's been reconnaissance efforts by people on the ground from EERI peer, uh, the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Organization, the Structural Engineers Association of California, Applied Technology Council, the Technical Council for Lifelines Engineering, and, and and so on. I think this earthquake also has benefited immensely from the fact that the California Geological Survey and the Strong Instrumentation Program have put an enormous number of instruments into the field, which allow us to have a better understanding of what the earthquakes are that struck the town. And if we didn't have those information, we wouldn't know if it was a big earthquake, a little earthquake, something special, something odd, or the like. And so we have a better way of doing that. And you'll hear a little bit later that we are at the nascent stage of a very important early warning system. And there's some information that is coming out uh, from this earthquake that allow us to better assess the uh, opportunities and, and things that we ought to try to address in the future moving forward. And then lastly, as the last speaker mentioned, there's new tools for documenting the behavior and response and performance of structures. And just in the last uh, several years, uh, Peer and my colleagues have been sort of investing in things in addition to, you know, sort of digital cameras. But uh, we have uh, 3D high resolution laser and LIDAR scanners that are sort of street mounted. Uh, we just got delivery early this week of a very high resolution street view camera that will take movies in high resolution at 30 or 60 frames a second. And uh, we have a little drone that we've been flying around Napa to probably the annoyance of some of the local residents, but they uh, provide a number of opportunities that we haven't been able to see in the past. Uh, with some luck, uh, I think my movie is not going to show here. 
Uh, but uh, we have a little drone uh, here, but uh, we have one on a movie on our website. And I think it's the Lake Berryessa News that has a, a YouTube video that's sort of gone viral. So uh, we, we, uh, I would encourage you to look at what you really can do. Uh, in many cases, inspecting buildings is very hazardous. You don't want to go up on the roof of a building that's on the verge of collapse. You don't necessarily want to walk inside of one of these buildings. And you can fly these things through. And they're very user friendly and uh, uh, relatively inexpensive. So we've gotten to a point where you can get some very good quantitative data. So with all of these resources, what I thought I would do is to say what we might do moving forward. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about ground motions. Uh, was this really a big one? There was a question about that before. Did the buildings behave as we think they would if we were engineers? How did the industrial facilities in the area do, the lifelines, and some weaknesses, but also some success stories and end with some observations? So the first question I think that one might logically ask is, did we expect an earthquake in Napa? And uh, an engineer would normally look at some of the maps that are available to see whether or not there are earthquake faults. And uh, USGS uh, prepared in around 2008 a new set of maps, which show then on the western side of Napa Valley a very uh, uh, distinct set of uh, interconnected faults, uh, and uh, uh, which are believed to be active. Um, this was then not available in this level of detail before 2008, so it's logical that people built on top of the faults, but we shouldn't because of the alquist priola Special Studies Zone Act build on these anymore. All right. So the next thing that an engineer would do would be to go to USGS and say, well, what kind of earthquakes might you have? And if you just go to their site and put the coordinates of, I think this is Napa Valley College, in there, all those little uh, uh, colored um, uh, columns that stick up there are sort of representing probabilities of earthquakes happening near Napa Valley College. And you can see because of all of the faults that are in that area, there's just lots of earthquakes that can happen almost anywhere. So coming towards you is the distance from the fault and uh, in the direction sort of parallel with the screen is the magnitude of the earthquake. And so if you look at all of those uh, events, you get sort of an average which is around a 6.6 .6, uh, magnitude earthquake with a distance of around 14 kilometers. And so we ended up with a magnitude 6 earthquake, a little bit smaller, but a little bit closer. So proximity is a big issue. Close to a small earthquake may as, be as bad as being far from a uh, larger earthquake. So, so we would think there's going to be a heterogeneity of, of earthquakes going to happen in a variety of places near Napa. So that little map that was on the previous slide, which is in the lower left-hand slide this portion of the slide here, is really struggling. It makes my eyes struggle. It makes your eyes struggle. But it's no better if you get up close to it. But if we wanted to find out uh, where a fault might be in the neighborhood, you could take a building. And I looked up this morning where we're at here. And, and that's where we would be. You look down here on this map, and then you would look at map C uh, on, on uh, this bigger plate, and that's where the red arrow goes here. And if I blow that up, because you can't even squint, and look where our, we're located right now, it turns out it's right there on top of that fault. Uh, which I don't know if anybody knew we were within 150 feet of uh, the fault trace, but maybe so. Uh, but people now can do this, and you shouldn't get too clever because there's a little red dash line, and then there's like a quarter of an inch, and another dash line, so you can't just build between the two lines because the, the fault is presumed to continue in that area. It just hasn't reached the surface, uh, and so uh, that y y you have to stay away from those as well. So. So there's a potential for an earthquake in the area. So this is a shake map 
uh, shake cast map of the recent earthquake. And you can see that around Napa, there's an area that is red and yellow and so on, which is more heavily shaken. But if we go back, as was mentioned by a couple of the previous speakers, to 2000, there was a magnitude 5.1 earthquake uh, north of Napa uh, near Yonville. And it has a similar area, but it was described earlier as being about as quarter uh, of strong, as strong and maybe with as a quarter amount of the damage that we had. So, so we have information that there were past earthquakes here a, a, as well as in other valleys nearby and in the Bay Area. An interesting thing is that the shake cast, if I take the map that is on the left-hand side that is sort of yellow and move it down to Berkeley or to the San Francisco <coughs> Peninsula, in addition to, you know, covering the 150 or 200,000 people in Napa Valley, I might have in San Francisco 750,000 people or in the East Bay 750,000 people. And so the consequence of this uh, earthquake was devastating for Napa, but it would be equally or far more devastating for a large urban uh, area. And so it would be focused in a small area, but would affect far more people. Okay. So um, the question then, we did have an earthquake. How big was it? So as I said before, this California Geological Survey and the Strong Motion Instrumentation Program, USGS and others have instruments out in the field. And you can see here, all those dots represent instruments that are actively recorded in real time near real time, and you can look the ground motions up within a few minutes of uh, the uh, earthquake, uh, sometimes faster than that. And uh, if you look at this uh, for the Napa area where the dots are red, the peak ground accelerations that you get tend to be somewhere between around 30% of the acceleration of gravity to 50% of the acceleration of gravity. And it really is hard to see here, but at the Carquinas Bridge, there is one pulse that goes up to 1G which means that uh, it would be the force of jumping out of an airplane or it's a large acceleration, but very narrow, narrow spike. So we're engineers and earth scientists are trying to figure out what that means and what causes it. So then if we had this earthquake, is the motion that is recorded consistent with what we would expect based on our current engineering models? And so what I have plotted here is the uh, pseudo spectral acceleration, which is basically the force that you would have to apply to a structure to get the displacements that you would think the structure would go through during an earthquake. And the little black dots are recordings, the red line is what we would think it would be, and there's an error bound on there. And so basically, if we take a magnitude six earthquake and look at how the ground motion should change as you go away, basically as we're close on the left-hand side of all the graphs, we're basically very close close to what we would expect to see in an earthquake. So if we had a magnitude six earthquake, our models are pretty good for uh, most of the frequency range and, and the like. For long periods, the, the ground motions are more severe. And as you get further away from the fault, the ground motions are a little bit smaller. But this is just one earthquake, and the curves are based on many earthquakes. So uh, we'll take that into consideration. Engineers love a graph that is called a response spectra, and this is one here that is developed for uh, the Main Street uh, area of downtown Napa. Uh, and it basically, it consists of this solid black line, and that's what you would design a new building for if you were putting it down right in downtown Napa. And that building is expected not to collapse but to have substantial damage. And this is the earth, the, the forces that it would have to be designed for if the structure didn't have any damage. But the current building code basically says you would design a structure such that it would only have a capacity of a half or a quarter or a six of that, assuming that the society would permit to have some structural damage in the structure. So this is what we're trying to target for. Uh, for design purposes in downtown Napa, the red lines are basically what downtown Napa got. 
And so if you're in uh, the short period range, which was basically one, two, three story buildings, this is actually very close to the design level earthquake. So buildings are not supposed to collapse for this earthquake, so, uh, which is a called a maximum considered earthquake. And so in that case, this is not the big earthquake, but it is what is the prototypical design level earthquake like that. There's another way of looking at this, and the, this is the same earthquake plotted over here in sort of the purple line. And these dashed lines are the probability of that earthquake uh, occurring at that site. And so this is a 50% probability in 50 years. This is a 20% probability in 50 years. So out in the longer period structure, so if this were in San Francisco and you had 10-story buildings or five-story buildings, this earthquake would not be particularly severe. It would be something that you'd have a 20% probability of having during the life of the structure. But in the short period, the low-rise buildings would get something that would be on the order of 10% or 5% uh, probability of occurrence in uh, uh, the life of the structure, let's say. So this is in downtown Napa where there was a lot of damage to low rise buildings. But if I go to um, the Napa Valley College, what you see is in the l short period range over here where uh, the downtown Napa had the one, two story buildings, it's actually lower than in downtown Napa there. And there was le less damage for uh, the Napa Valley College in, the, 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 in that area. But there was a lot of damage in the wineries and, and, and especially the stacks of wine barrels that were there, which have typically long periods. And there's this uh, really obnoxious pulse there that is bigger than the maximum considered earthquake by about 50%. So that is a really extreme earthquake that you got here that would affect things that are tall buildings or precarious rocking things like the wine barrels. It's even worse when you go to the fire station number three north of town. So somehow downtown is bad for low rise buildings, but north and south of town have these long period pulses, which then someone in the earth sciences has to explain better to me and a lot of study needs to be done to try to understand that. But the ground motions then are not the big one, but they're not small either. That naturally leads to lots of yellow and red tag buildings. Uh, I think it was mentioned that there was about 150 red tag buildings and about 1,500 yellow tag buildings, and they're distributed around. Uh, and the damage is associated with the age of the structures, the type of structures, the soil conditions, and of course, the ground motions. But one of the things is, uh, you can't see this, but this is a map of some of the damage. But if you look at where the damage happens, there's a string of it. There's a linear delineation of the damage, which turns out to be right on top of the fault rupture. And so the fault goes through the middle of town. People built their buildings right on top of the town. And so if you look at garage floors, there's cracks that come across it. There's a crack here going through this foundation. There's a crack through the dirt under this building. It goes over here and cracks the foundation. And uh, the, the, the buildings are just moved around if they're built on top of it. And that causes an enormous amount of, of, of damage like that. So Alquist Priola should prevent you from building on it. But you have to know the faults there, and so you need to make sure we map all of the faults in you know, buildable areas, uh, 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 but there may be like many legacy structures that are built before the maps are available. In downtown uh, uh, Napa, and, and, and as I heard earlier, other cities as well, there was a lot of damage to single family residential houses, particularly wood frame buildings that were either built many years ago. And so you had lots of damage to porches that fell off. But many buildings were built on stilts, or basically what are called cripple walls. And they act like stilts. The earthquake happens, the building shifts, and the building drops down, as you can see in this area. So that is built on these stilts and, and that gets really disproportionately damaged. This is a, a two-story building, so these aren't all one-story buildings, but if you look at this, all of these columns are leaning over 
And if you walk around the building, uh, I'll show a better picture of this, but the back of the building looks like this because it dropped and fell over. This is sort of continuing, continuing to walk around the building. It doesn't look so bad except for this little piece back here that was an add-on that had a lot of damage, but if I look at the building, this stairway up here used to go into this door. So this building has moved over about five feet and dropped about three, like that. And so nothing good happened on the inside of the building to the plaster, the walls, the furnishings, and the like. Uh, most likely no one was killed in this because it's intact, but the economic losses are enormous. Uh, one of the tools that we have are these LIDAR or laser scanners, and this is a picture that has about 10 million little points in it, and we know the location of each of those points within a millimeter. And uh, so we can get some very good indication of how uh, buildings have displaced. We're doing some continued, we've monitored about 24 buildings now. We're doing some things of looking to see whether the displacements are increasing with time. The thing I noticed the other day, which I didn't notice oddly before, is when this building went over, this uh, little uh, uh, thing that was holding up the porch, uh, the base of that used to be up here. But as it came over like this, it basically ripped out the, the gas meters. So fortunately, there wasn't a fire in this. I don't know how there wasn't a fire in this, but that building basically shoved the gas meters over a couple of feet as it came down. Um, many other buildings, it just go, I mean, there's 50, you know, there's many of these buildings. This is a two-story building. It doesn't look so bad here. You look at this side, there's some props on it. You look at the props. Basically, the building has shifted over a few inches. It's just on the verge of falling off the mud sill and dropping into the uh, uh, pit uh, underneath the building, so to speak. And so the engineers and the, or someone has put up these props here to try and hold the building up if there's an aftershock in it sort of springs over there into the little gap like that. But this is just repeated over and over again. This is near fire station number three. This is a new wood, newish wood building. Doesn't look, it's occupied and it doesn't look too terribly damaged. If you look at it really closely and the lighting here isn't that good, but there's actually some stepping damage in here. And if you look closer, there's more of that damage in, in this look in a very particular kind of way that's typical of horizontal sheathing on wood buildings. And if you look at that, uh, you can see these cracks, but uh, the nails have all pulled out about an inch of the wood. And that's just because the wood has moved back and forth enough to pull the nails out of the framing uh, uh, there. All right. So there's a lot of damage, lots of different kinds of damage in really old buildings, some not so old buildings, one story buildings, two story buildings, three story buildings. But there are some successes. The, the building that's right there is a picture of the building that I just showed, and the building next to it has no damage in it whatsoever, and so it's presumed by, the, by uh, Steve Pryor and Joe Maffei that uh, th this was retrofit. And so there's a success story there. Um, wandering around Napa a couple of, uh, a, a week ago, there's many buildings that are starting to be retrofit. This building had a lot of damage in the lower level. The house movers basically come in, lifted the building back up, leveled it up. They tore out the bottom level and are basically pouring a new foundation and rebuilding the lower level of the building. And so you see this repeated over and over again, and it'll be increasing because there hasn't been that much peep, uh, work started yet but it's coming. There's a number of other kinds of damage. Um, one is a, a, a type of thing associated with tilt-up kind of buildings or warehouse kind of buildings where the roof becomes detached from the walls. The walls often are heavy. The, the, the ceilings are fairly light and wood. This is a safe way, I sh probably shouldn't mention, a gro large chain grocery store. And uh, the walls of it uh, basically fell away from the roof and they're propped up here to keep them from pa falling into the adjacent property. And this is a warehouse that had wine barrels in it southwest of downtown Napa. And the same sort of thing happened here. It's postulated the wine barrels wobbled around and the inside of it pushed the walls out. 
the wall started to go out, but the ceiling just simply fell down. And so this isn't an incline thing. That should have been a horizontal flat ceiling in there, but it dropped down here because of this class of failure. And this was common in the 1971 San Fernando earthquake and the Northridge earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake down in Hollister. And so this is, a, again, a type of recurring kind of, of issue. Um, Mobile homes were mentioned before. Uh, they, um, again, with the lighting here, this is one that's dropped down off of some concrete blocks and has moved over about three feet here. And it also is in a vicinity where a gas line did break, started a fire, and uh, because of the water disruption, there was damage there. Um, this is an attempt to get a picture of the Trefefen Winery again, uh, which had some remarkable damage in it. Uh, wine tanks had damage in them. But there was a lot of damage to warehouses that stored barrels of wine. There was a lot of economic losses. This is from a winery that a, a, a former neighbor of mine has. And he says that there's maybe a half a million dollars worth of loss of, of product uh, here. Um, I think that this is not going to work, but let's see if it works. Several years ago, Josh Morrow and uh, Professor uh, Nikos Makris did some tests of wine barrels at Berkeley, and we tested it, and they basically do this. They just fall down very easily like that. So I apologize for the video. It's not working. But uh, again, by doing some research, we can try to figure out how to prevent this from happening. Because this was at 3 o'clock in the morning. If this was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a work week, th these barrels weigh, I believe, roughly 600 pounds. So they're not something that you can just push out of the way or deflect. And you can't run fast enough to get away from these things. So uh, we might have a different, far different conversation today if the earthquake happened at a different time. Uh, society depends on buildings, the built environment, but it depends also on the lifelines. Fortunately, I think that is a success story in, in many respects in the Napa area. The bridges, for the most part, that were state and private, uh, uh, county owned were often retrofit and generally did well. This is the State Route 37 on the Napa River. And there's one of the bays uh, right there that looks like it's tilting, so there's been a lot of people inspecting it. This is again um, uh, a point cloud uh, thing. There's like 30 million little points in this. You can separate that out. You can measure whether it is vertical or not and how big the diameter of all the members are. And uh, we have these little helicopters now that uh, this is one from San Diego that we send out to inspect the bridge and we have uh, some now at, at Berkeley as well. There is a, a Napa a slough bridge that had the greatest amount of damage. At the top of all of these piles, there's uh, concrete spalling damage. At the base of many of them, there's concrete spalling damage. And this is a very typical kind of damage that was seen in the Loma Prieta earthquake and other earthquakes. But it's one of the few bridges that wasn't retrofit. Uh, a few miles away, there is one on Sonoma Creek that has all these little piles in here. And Caltrans came in and put this big beam in here and four really big columns in here. And there's no damage to this bridge whatsoever. And so the retrofits do work if you do proper engineering of it like that. Going below ground, lifelines didn't do so well because of the movement of the ground. And these slides are taken from Charlie Scawthorn, who is in the audience here. But there were something on the order of 160 water line breaks in the city. There was a large water storage tank uh, called Montana B that uh, had damage to the roof as the water was sloshing back and forth. And that's going to take maybe six months to repair, from what I understand, and the water pressure in that area of the city has been reduced in the meantime. But you have now very nice maps of where the earthquake fault rupturing, where the shaking was, where all the, fire, where all the mains were, and then where the breaks were. So there's some good studies that can be done there. One of the things that Charlie pointed out was that 90% of the 
water mains in the city of Napa are more than 20 years old. The bulk of those, 44% uh, of them, are made from cast iron. And if you come down and look at the damage rate for cast iron, the majority of the, those 75% uh, of the water mains that broke are made from cast iron with uh, almost one break per mile of pipeline in there giving you 123 breaks in cast iron pipes. Whereas if you have more modern uh, ductile uh, iron or steel pipes, the rate is maybe one seventh or one tenth of that rate. So there's some practical lessons here and the importance of water for fighting fire and for drinking and recovery is something that would suggest that many communities should consider upgrading their water systems like that. The water was, though, put back into service. As was mentioned very quickly, more than 50% was put back in service within five days. About 90% of the water supply was back in service in about two weeks' time. So people were working very diligently. But if the earthquake covered a much greater geographic area, whether people could have mutual response to help in this area as well, as much, I don't know. Electricity and gas work pretty well. It appears that about 90% of the electric power was restored within about 20 hours. There's a small percentage that went out for up to, it looks like, two, two full days and maybe three days in some, some limited number of cases. But as was mentioned, PG&E stepped up and did that. Less natural gas uh, damage than many people would have thought. The wastewater treatment facilities had breaks in the uh, lines that they had, pipelines, uh, especially where the fault ruptured. And as was mentioned before, uh, the wine that went into the wastewater system disrupted the op operations of the treatment plant for somewhere between 24 and 48 hours because the acid in the wine basically um, disabled the bacteria that are used to treat the, the, um, the effluent. Uh, communications facilities were also mentioned. The AT&T facility had a piece of cladding fall off, land on a, a transformer, and so emergency generators had to be brought in to uh, reinforce the battery power. So uh, we've all seen all of this, but I think it's useful to put it all together like this. But it really serves as a reminder that earthquakes didn't go away uh, just because the last one in the Bay Area was 25 years ago or the last big one in Los Angeles was 20 years ago didn't mean that they went on vacation to Tahiti uh, on an indefinite uh, uh, vacation, but that uh, we basically have to be prepared. This earthquake was a significant event, but it wasn't the big one. So, you know, there were several comments that suggested that, well, if things were a little worse, the city might not have been able to respond as well because it would trigger having to find places for people living in the jail or uh, people living in hospitals and, and old uh, retirement uh, facilities and the like. Um, the other question that I think that was brought up by others um, was can these very successful emergency response efforts that were done in Napa be replicated if there were a bigger earthquake here uh, or if the earthquake just happened another 30 miles south of here in a more congested urban area. And then life safety, as many of the city managers and mayors mentioned, is paramount, but they're really concerned by the fact that there's so much damage. And so resilience and being able to recover quickly is really important and something that engineers need to focus on. And then many engineers did quite well. I think the earthquake provided a reminder that you should not build on a earthquake fault, so efforts to you know, map faults. Uh, uh, complete mapping faults uh, uh, would be useful. Uh, we have reaffirmed that many types of buildings with known hazards are still hazardous, but I think this earthquake pointed out more than some previous earthquakes that falling hazards uh, where a building or part of a building can fall on one that's next to it is an important thing. And it's also pointed out that all retrofits are not equal. That is, if I retrofit, ret retrofit my building 20 years ago, it's not the same as retrofitting it last year. If I retrofit it for 
$15,000 versus $50,000, I'm not going to get the same performance, generally speaking. So we have to have a better understanding of what that means. Newer structures were shaken significantly, but not up to the level that they were designed to, re to be shaken at. So most of the damage was in the non-structural components, and we see from many cases that the drifts and the damage uh, to non-structural components become increasingly important to deal with. And then lastly, I think, you know, lifelines have to have continued uh, uh, scrutiny and, and focus in upgrading uh, to preserve the cities that they serve. Uh, the city cannot live without business, it can't live without housing, it can't uh, live without public services. And so businesses like the wineries here are uh, very important, but in talking with many of the people in downtown Napa, their paramount interest was getting back into operation and selling product, talking, doing their commercial operations as quickly as possible. And then I think the question, is, you know, that we all ask, you know, is if what happens if there's a bigger earthquake? So I think in the earth sciences, there's been great progress and better understanding of the uh, types of earthquakes we might have, but we can see from what happened in Napa that the ground motions you get can vary within a half a mile of one place to another. Depends on the soil condition, the proximity to the fault rupture, and many other kinds of things. It, uh, there's a question about aftershocks, uh, and, and many people contacted me about was it safe or prudent to start retrofitting a building? Was it safe to inspect a building after an earthquake? And given the uh, earthquakes in Christchurch in New Zealand, where the earthquake basically was stalking the city, you know, so it happened south of the city. Is it moving toward us here? There was an earthquake to the north. There's an earthquake to the south. Is it just bracketing Napa? I mean, not to be paranoid here for everybody. But, you know, aftershocks do happen, and those can be quite worse. Uh, and then lastly, from the engineering point of view, what are all these lessons that we learned from the structural performance such that we can improve our analysis methods, our design methods, retrofit methods, so we just don't fix every structure uh, unnecessarily or we waste money unnecessarily to try to improve the performance. So anyway, that's, that's my presentation, so I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Widow. So much a question, but a, a comment. Uh, it's interesting to me that through all of the discussion of, of damage, et cetera, nobody's talked about schools. And obviously, I have a, a bone to pick there because uh, as the state architect, my responsibility is schools. And I'm very happy to say that there was absolutely no structural damage in any of the schools. And no longer, quite frankly, are people questioning whether the field act is working. The place that we do have to take a look at, and actually there is a document that was prepared and that we're going to be uh, sending out to everybody, uh, is the non-structural elements. The light fixtures and the bookshelves and those things that uh, came down that fortunately it did happen at 3 o'clock in the morning and so no children were there. But the Field Act is working and it has worked well. Now that doesn't mean that if we don't have the big one, <laughs> whether it will go over yeah. those, those, those uh, uh, parameters. But uh, we're really pleased about that and it's very interesting to find that uh, uh, all of those folks that uh, for many years have been saying, well, why are we spending so much money uh, upgrading uh, the school design are now stepping back after, after Napa and saying, okay, it's worth it. Yeah. Now the question is whether we can get enough money to do it on the other buildings. That's really going to be an issue. Yeah. I looked at two schools in, in detail myself, and, and, and one was right next to fire station number three. I forget the name of the high school, but it had, as you said, very no damage whatsoever that you could see. It didn't, there was no indication that there was an earthquake in the area. And uh, people were running around like normal. And then there was another one in an area that had substantial damage to uh, the surrounding houses and buildings. So I think there's some really 
lesson that good engineering and good, uh, you know, criteria and inspection, you know, are, are quite useful and successful. And, and we do know that the city of San Francisco is now looking at whether private schools should, in yeah. fact, uh, start going to a higher standard. Uh, I think that's a big issue because it's obviously going to have a major financial impact on schools and at a time when, quite frankly, the, the money's not there. Somebody said uh, uh, earlier that uh, was talking about the fact that uh, we, should we raise the standards? Well, yes, we should, but uh, right now the codes are designed, and uh, Jim, you want to, might want to speak to it, but codes are designed to save lives right now, not to maintain the buildings. If you want to go above that level, and if you, in fact, want to maintain a building that's going to live through the process, uh, it's, it's a more expensive item. We design to minimum standards. So it happens that DSA's minimum is higher than commercial standards, but it's set as a minimum standard of design, not as the best design, but the minimum standard. Enough preaching from DSA. I won't do it. Either. Commissioner McCarry. Uh, yeah, very good presentation, Do you. Dr. Mayhem. Um, one of the issues that you stated as, as clearly as could be, do not build on top of a fault. Uh, the, the problem is that sometimes we don't know that there's a fault right there. Uh, this particular fault perhaps was not as well known as could have been. And during my confirmation process in the Senate, uh, Senator Steinberg, uh, Senator uh, President Pro Tempore at the, at the time, um, asked me about um, why aren't we spending more money on remapping and really finding out where all of those faults that we didn't catch with older technology uh, are because that is the first uh, line of defense. Do not build on that. And perhaps Dr. Allen may be able to comment as well uh, next. But do you, have a, do you have a comment on that? Are we continuing to do uh, fault mapping uh, at the pace that we should? And is, is the newer technology available to us? Uh, certainly <laughs> what was shown very clearly by JPL's presentation, uh, could some of these things help us out uh, to better identify uh, location of existing faults, even if we think that they're dormant. Yeah, I, I think you're you're right. Uh, I mean, a lot of the faults, I mean, a lot of the earthquakes that have happened have been on, you know, not the major faults that people think of, like the main you know, San Andreas Fault in Southern California, or there are and lesser known or lesser uh, uh, thought of areas of San Andreas Fault system. So uh, I think understanding where those are is, is very important. Uh, it's sort of twofold. One is sort of the field geology and getting people out in the field who can, you know, really interpret it. A lot of it is that there is, like in Berkeley, where I, I work, um, a lot of disruption of the soil. So people have 20 feet of fill on top of, of uh, you know, where you'd be able to see the fault uh, since the last rupture. So I think there's a lot of electronic instrumentation, uh, looking at micro tremors and, and, and some of the ground penetrating radar kind of things, looking at this uh, and the things that they use for oil mining, co computational tomography. So maybe Richard or um, Commissioner Helwig or someone uh, could uh, address those kind of issues more than a structural engineer should. But I think there is that. The other side of it is I think there have been uh, issues in terms of what I engineers could do to resolve that. I mean, there, there's ways of designing foundations to not necessarily el eliminate damage entirely, but to make the structures more robust so that they are more tolerant of the ground movement that you might have. I think it, you know, it's it, it, one of the things of the ground movement itself in, in New Zealand, there was just lots of liquefaction that happened. And, uh, and so the differential movement in the Bay Area and Berkeley in particular and Southern California, there's hillsides that are likely to slide. So the, 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 the earth under us, you know, needs to be looked at very carefully. Any other comments, questions? Commissioner Helwig. Yeah, so Commissioner Mercari, I think part of the answer is that we may never find all the faults in California. 
And if we want never to build on one, we'll have to all move to Nevada or farther east. Well, we do, we do know that Nevada, our colleagues from Nevada are back there, there are plenty of faults out there as well. And then further back east, they're starting to frack so that there's more, there's more earthquakes, I think, uh, per year in Oklahoma than in California. I, I may be wrong on that statistic. It was in the New York Times. But. Yeah, no, no there, there's still more here than there are there. Yeah, the, but, yeah. but still, farther east have other problems, too, that we may not be interested in yeah. tackling. Okay, Dr. Mann, thank you very much you. for your time and your excellent presentation. <clears throat> We're going to move to uh, the performance of earthquake early warning systems. Um, on the NAP earthquake, we have Dr. Richard Allen, director of the UC Berkeley Seismological Lab, and uh, Mr. Michael Price, the chief technical officer of seismic warning systems. Uh, Dr. Allen, you'll be up first. Well, thank you um, for the uh, the invitation um, to present here. I'm going to echo uh, my colleagues' uh, comments prior to me how I consider myself to be an earthquake professional, but it's quite humbling to sit here um, this afternoon listening to uh, to what we've heard of people responding to the event, and I look forward also to hearing uh, the public comments as well along those same lines. Uh, so my name is Richard Allen. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley. I'm director of the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory, um, but I'm here really representing a broader group Group, a group of folks that have been developing the Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System, what we call the Early Warning Development Team. Um, and this is a group of people at Berkeley, at Caltech, at the University of Washington, um, at the US Geologic Survey. And this is an effort funded largely by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, but also, of course, um, by the US Geologic Survey. So I just want to acknowledge that it's a much broader group that, uh, that I'm representing. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of how the shake alert system performed in the Napa earthquake. And then I was asked to kind of give a, my view, my vision of how this could be rolled out to, to a public earthquake early warning system. So that's what I'm, I'm going to do, those two things. Um, the first thing, first question is, what is um, earthquake early warning? Um, I am not going to try and explain this to you myself. I'm going to have somebody much better do this for me. And that's Rachel Maddow, who, who described earth, what earthquake early warning is in the afternoon aftermath of the Napa quake um, very succinctly. So I'm going to play you this three-minute segment um, from MSNBC. I hope you can hear this. Very interesting. Can you Digital hear? communications travel at the speed of light. Thanks to things like fiber optic cable, we can move information literally in a flash. And that is good, you know, just in the abstract. But that is, it turns out, potentially life-saving. If the information that you are moving at the speed of light is notification that an earthquake is about to happen. Uh, earthquakes happen in a specific place in the ground, right? Earthquakes have an epicenter. But you don't just feel an earthquake at the epicenter. The shuddering waves of motion in the earth from an earthquake, they, they emanate out from the epicenter of the quake, traveling at the speed of sound. So if you had the kind of motion sensors that detected earthquakes, if you had seismometers along fault lines all over earthquake-prone regions, when there was an earthquake, the seismometers nearest to the epicenter, they could register that an earthquake has happened, right? feel the shake, and then they could send a digital signal at the speed of light, notifying communities nearby that this traveling at the speed of sound tremor, this motion of the earth, is about to arrive. This is not a way of predicting earthquakes before they happen. It's a, it's a way of basically warning people that an earthquake has just happened and that they are about to feel its effects. Brace yourself. But this thing works. Scientists at UC Berkeley say that their shake alert to earthquake early warning project, it set off an alert. It did go off this weekend during this weekend's large quake in Napa, California. It was about to be felt in Berkeley, and this is the alert that told them so. Watch this. Earthquake, earthquake, light, shaking, expected in three seconds. 
They got a 10 second warning that they were about to feel the quake. And 10 seconds is not much time, right? But this, this brace yourself warning system, it works thanks to the simple fact that the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound and earthquakes only move at the speed of sound. With more sensors in more places, they presumably deliver even more warning time. California's hoping to have that bigger system in place in the next few years, if they can get it funded and finished. Uh, from the LA Times today, once fully developed, the system could give downtown Los Angeles 40 to 50 seconds of warning that the big one was headed from the San Andreas Fault, giving time for elevators to stop at the next floor and open up, for firefighters to open up garage doors, for high-speed trains to slow down to avoid derailment, and for surgeons to take the scalpel out of a patient. Giving your surgeon enough time to get the scalpel out of you before the giant earthquake starts shaking the operating room? That idea of a tectonically shaking scalpel inside your body somewhere, that is something you can never unknow, and I am sorry, but the idea that this warning technology, that it works, that it worked this weekend, in fact. It's not just on a drawing board somewhere. It is in effect, and it could be expanded and is being expanded. That is an excellent thing. They've got a system like this in Japan. They've got it in Mexico and some other places around the globe. California could get their whole statewide system done in a few years. God bless the geeks. They will save us all. Now it's time for the last bird with Lawrence O'Donnell. Hi, Lawrence. Rachel, I just want them to make the earthquake warning voice a little less scary. Yeah, a little more soothing. <laughs> Maybe with a little music or something. Okay, well, that's the first time I can say I don't object to being called a geek. <laughs> Um, so that was that gives you an overview of what earthquake early warning is, what it does, and then of course an overview of, of how the system performed for the Napa quake. So a little more background. First of all, the shake alert system um, as it is operating today. Um, what we do is we make use of the state's uh, existing seismic networks across uh, northern and southern California. This is the Berkeley uh, seismic network that streams into the current shake alert system. This is the strong motion program throughout the Bay Area that feeds in. This is the Northern California network that feeds into the processing center in Menlo Park. And then down in Southern California, it's a joint USGS and Caltech operation streaming data uh, into, uh, into Pasadena. These three processing centers, Berkeley, Menlo Park, and Caltech, process all of the data continuously, obviously, in real time. They share parameters statewide, and, and that's how we detect the earthquakes, um, uh, estimate the size of the earthquakes, and then push out alerts um, about, uh, about these earthquakes. And we push these alerts. We call this a demonstration system. It's important to recognize that this is a demonstration system. It's not a fully robust system. That's why it's not a public system. But we push out these alerts to a range of, of external partners. Um, and I'm going to, well, in fact, I'm going to talk about those um, on the next slide. To give you a sense, uh, BART is one of them. Uh, Tracy Johnson, of course, is from, from BART and has been very involved in our cooperation with BART uh, to, to start to think about how we can use early warning. They they are already using the alerts from this demonstration system to automatically slow and stop uh, the trains. Um, it's obvious, I think, why that is of interest to BART in terms of slowing the trains to reduce the likelihood of derailment um, during the course of an earthquake. But the other motivation here is that BART has gone through um, a major retrofit program with a view to being able to move people away from the damaged zones after an earthquake. Um, however, if there are a number of trains that have been derailed during an earthquake, they won't be able to do that. So this is a twofold thing. It's about reducing the injuries initially during the quake and then allowing BART to provide that em uh, critical emergency response. Um, the city of San Francisco is uh, partnered with us um, early as well. They currently receive the alerts in the operations center um, on Turk Street. They've been talking about how they want to, to use this more broadly. Um, the, well, the police center already gets it, the fire department. In fact, following this snapper quake, um, the, uh, the city fire chief now um, has decided that she wants to put um, shake alert in every firehouse in San Francisco. So we're working with her to do that right now. Public works, public health. Um, the airports as well are very interested in starting to make use of, of this. Another of our early uh, adopters in Northern California is Google. Um, they have this in their crisis response center um, in, in Menlo, um, in Mountain View, sorry. 
and they're obviously thinking about how they can use it internally to reduce damage, but I'm sure that they're also thinking, of course, with the, um, the rollout of a potentially rollout of a public system, how they, they might want to broadcast this uh, more broadly. We also use it uh, on the Berkeley campus. Right now, the police actually issue a code red notification to all users, all, all of the police departments, sorry, across campus, but other folks that are thinking about how they can use it includes people like the data center, hazmat groups, chemistry labs, things like that. I focused on these because these are some of the key ones in Northern California who received an alert in the Napa quake. Um, but the, the group of users is ever expanding. In fact, I just approved Salado County um, to start getting the alerts as well. And so emergency response um, folks um, are getting these in their operations center. And then, of course, the private sector is getting these and, and starting to think about how they can use earthquake early warning to reduce the impact of, of future earthquakes. Okay, so for the Napa quake specifically, um, 3.20 in the morning on August the 24th, I'm going to show you the alert that they got at the 911 center um, in San Francisco on, on Turk Street. Earthquake, earthquake, light shaking expected in two seconds. So obviously not a huge amount of warning, nine seconds for, for San Francisco for this particular earthquake. The amount of warning that you get, of course, increases as a function of distance um, um, from the earthquake. And so city of San Francisco um, got about nine seconds um, of warning. To, to show you kind uh, what the total warning was in various places, I'm sorry, it's very difficult to read that. It's very difficult for me to read that. Um, you can see the epicenter of the earthquake in the middle, the red star there, and then the brown circles show the amount of warning. The red circle closest to the epicenter is the zero second warning. That's the blind zone. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then 5, 10, 15, and, and 20 seconds of warning. So the uh, UC Berkeley Police Department got five seconds of warning, um, but the Operations Center in beneath Lake Merritt, eight seconds. Um, the city of San Francisco, nine seconds, as you just saw, and then um, the Google uh, Command Center. So obviously, the amount of warning you get increases as a function of distance um, from, from the fault. And I point out, this is the amount of warning time until the S wave arrives. And so we, we measure the amount of warning time in terms of the time between when we issue the alert and when the S wave arrives, and that's what these numbers are here. The actual strongest shaking occurred a little bit later than that. So if you wanted to measure the warning until the strongest shaking, the amount of warning time is actually a little larger than that. Now, of course, one of the challenges here is this blind zone, this zero seconds of warning contour line that you can see. Um, for shake alert, for this particular earthquake, the blind zone um, had a radius of 16 kilometers, okay? And that's because the alert was issued 5.1 seconds after the earthquake origin time, 3.3 uh, seconds after the P wave arrived at the closest station. And so clearly one of the key things that we want to do and that we're working on very hard is reducing the size of, the size of this blind zone as much as possible. And of course, as soon as you reduce this blind zone, not only do you get some warning uh, within that blind zone, but you increase the amount of, of warning that uh, people get further away. And I'll show you why I'm emphasizing this in a moment. I just want to make the point that ShakeAlert has now been running end-to-end -end system issuing warnings since uh, 2012. So it's been issuing alerts for many earthquakes. So I'm quickly going to show you another earthquake, the Lahambra earthquake, which was the sort of the last large-ish earthquake um, in Los Angeles, a magnitude 5.1. So, of course, didn't do very much damage. We wouldn't want a magnitude 5 earthquake to be doing much damage. But, of course, was felt um, by most of the population um, of Los Angeles. This was back in, in March. This issue was, this alert was issued four seconds after the origin time, meaning that the blind zone uh, was about eight miles um, in that particular case, um, which means that the majority of the people who would who felt that shaking uh, could, receive, could have received a warning if this system uh, was public. Um, and again, just to illustrate how real this is, another little news clip. Shells, the quake registered as a magnitude 5.1, centered 20 miles southeast of LA. There aren't any reports of major damage this morning, but the earthquake broke water mains and gas lines, cut power to thousands of people, and made a mess of homes and stores. The quake caused this rock slide that knocked a car on its roof, causing minor injuries to the people inside. Dozens of aftershocks followed the main quake, including one one during a news conference held by the U.S. Geological Service. So the early warning system, four seconds. You're, you're in, you're in. And now we're having an aftershock. Okay. So, 
well, there you go. That, that's estimated no magnitude. Right, 2.6. And, and, yeah, and the intensity is one, which is basically no shaking, and obviously we didn't shake. Well, we're we're out. Out. Experts warn that more aftershocks could occur over the next several days, but are likely to weaken in intensity. So again, this is just to emphasize that this is not, you know, this is something we are now doing on a routine basis um, using this demonstration earthquake early warning system that we have. So um, I was asked to talk about sort of where are we going, and so this is sort of going from what we call this demonstration warning system to a full-blown public system, of course, and this is in the context of CUES, or CHOOS, I think we pronounce it, California's earthquake um, early warning system. As the commission obviously knows, uh, California now has an earthquake early warning law that was introduced by uh, Senator Alex Padilla at the beginning of last year. Um, many of us were involved uh, in the process of, of that uh, legislation um, coming to fruition uh, with testimony and hearings and briefings, etc. And this was signed into law by uh, the governor in September of last year. So what does this mean that we have this earthquake early warning uh, law? Well, the law requires the governor's office of emergency services and uh, Mark Johnson, who's here today, is uh, is leading this charge um, to develop a comprehensive statewide earthquake early warning system, um, to develop standards and a mechanism to review compliance, and to identify funding. That's the catch. So they passed this law unanimously, but no funding was identified. Um, and specifically, the general fund was excluded. And so uh, one of the uh, tasks that the uh, Governor's Office of Emergency Services has right now is to try and identify a uh, source of funding um, for that system. So this system, the, how this system, what, what might this system look like as we were to roll it out um, across the state? What is key, of course, is that this needs to be a public-private partnership that really takes the best of both of these components. And so this is sort of how I um, view what that system might look like. I think it's important that we leverage the state's existing seismic network, those 400 seismic stations that are already streaming their data um, into ShakeAlert, um, provide a backbone to get started with the, the, the warning system. Additional stations are needed in some of the gaps. You can see the distribution of stations. It's obvious where the gaps are. And some of these stations need upgrades, specifically to the data log, as I'm going to come back to that issue uh, in a moment. So we have these the network of instrumentation across the network streams its data into a, a parallel statewide processing center. Of course, parallel is about being robust and making sure that the system provides an alert in all earthquakes. And so that those parallel um, processing centers then push out um, alerts. Um, and then these alerts need to be pushed out in as many ways as we can in order to get them to as many people as we can and make them as effective as we can. And this is uh, one of the first places that I think there's an absolutely essential role uh, for the private sector. Um, and that's to add value-added information for high-end users and, of course, automated uh, devices to action uh, the, the information that's provided is the other uh, key component. And there's already um, an industry out there um, that is sort of uh, uh, ramping up to be able to do this. Um, Ad hoc, Regroup, and Early Warning Labs are just three examples of companies that have already partnered with ShakeAlert so that they can get ready to deliver these al alerts um, to users in a, in a broad sense using a whole variety of apps and, of course, additional hardware to uh, automate responses and things like that. The alerts, of course, should also be pushed out to the, whatever available public alerting means that are. iPause is the new system, uh, the uh, emergency alerting system, um, and so push that would push it out to TV and radio um, and things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's another very important role um, for the private sector here, and that's in terms of providing additional data um, to the system. Uh, groups that already do this, um, PG&E, uh, Trimble, um, uh, Seismic Warning Systems, who are going to, to speak next, is perhaps another example of this, Calpine. These are all private sector uh, groups that actually have instrumentation out in the field and are interested in, in participating in this earthquake early warning effort. Now, that data, of course, can feed into a centralized statewide system uh, to, to improve that system. That would obviously be a good thing. But in addition, of course, that data can be used to directly provide alerts uh, to end users um, as, as desired by end users. And of course, that information can then also be integrated with um, the statewide system. Um, and so you can have integrated alerts as well as sort of uh, individualized alerts. And in fact, the best example of cost benefit that we have for earthquake early warning right now 
is the Okai chip manufacturer plant in Japan. And that was, in fact, exactly this kind of example where they integrated a nationwide system provided by the Japan Meteorological Agency with an on-site system um, that they put in their, in their individual uh, locations. So um, this piece here, the grade box, is, is, would be the public piece in this public-private partnership. Um, and the cost of that is $80 million. So the, that's the cost of completing the system, so building on top of the existing state seismic networks um, and operating it for the first um, five years. Now, periodic, I often get asked, well, why not just simply make the alerts that we have today, the alerts that I've just shown you, why not just make that openly available to the public and, and call it good? And there are two key reasons why uh, it's worth investing this $80 million. The first is for faster warnings. So this blind zone issue that I mentioned, uh, in the case of the Napa quake, the blind zone uh, was 16 kilometers. One of the things that we need this $80 million for is to upgrade some of the hardware that's part of those 40 stations. And in fact, specifically with this Napa quake, the closest seismic station to the earthquake, it turned out, was the slowest uh, seismic station. And the, the latency of that particular station delayed getting the data by about two and a half seconds. And so if we had that investment and we upgraded that infrastructure in the way that we have planned, then the warning would have been put out about two and a half seconds sooner. Um, that would shrink the blind zone down to about eight kilometers. And that means that Napa could then have had a warning. So clear demonstration of the value um, of improving the infrastructure. Of course, addition, in addition to that, putting additional stations in the gaps means that we'll be able to detect the P waves faster uh, in a more general sense. And that obviously also makes the system faster. And then the second reason is robustness. A big piece of that is to, to make the system more robust. Right now, it is not par fully parallelized at all. We've done the best we can with the limited funding we have. But it is not a parallelized system. It is not fully robust. And, and making it a redundant system um, is obviously key. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. I'll just put this back up. And I'm happy to take questions uh, uh, when you want. OK, I've, uh, I've got a couple questions to start with. And then if there's any other commissioners. Um, first of all, you and some of this is going to be a discussion item for down the road as this system moves forward. But I do have a question on what you said about what is the public piece. Um, from what I understand, the, the, the public piece isn't decided yet at a That's statewide right. level. So um, that would be what you're proposing, your, your vision of what the public piece is, but yet is and hasn't been decided, correct? That's exactly right. Yes. OK. Um, secondly, um, being in the fire service, um, we look at false alarms as, and I call them alarms and not really alerts, because on that piece, the USGS, and I believe the piece that you showed in Pasadena is not your system that created that alarm, correct? Because they're uh, they're independent right now, is that? Do you mean the, the Southern the California, conference? the Pasadena during the yeah. press conference? So that, no, it is one single integrated system. So the way that the system works is that it's a single statewide system. There are three sets of algorithms that operate statewide, and in fact, those specific alerts um, actually came from the system that is running at Berkeley. But the whole system is a single unified statewide system. OK. So then my question would be, because if in my perception that was an alarm, just like you would get a fire alarm in a possibly in a building, which we get hundreds of times a day across the state, if not thousands, that one, you get an alarm, and then all of a sudden it says, oh, by the way, no shaking detected. How is that going to be valuable? Or probably the bigger question is, how do we avoid that? Because we can't be sending out alarms saying earthquake's coming and then have especially public safety officers reacting in one way or another, and then the public when there's not going to be something. Yeah. So you know, that's my question, because that, that video piece was a perfect example. Whoa, we got an alarm. Yeah. Oh, nothing's coming. Sorry. No, 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 no. no. You're, you're exactly right. So let me clarify exactly what you saw. So that I would. So that was not a false alarm by your definition. So in that particular video clip, that was actually a very small magnitude earthquake. That was a magnitude 2.5 earthquake. And so when you get the alert system, of course, you can choose your threshold of when you actually want to be alerted. Now, in the press, um, the press conference, 
conference room at, at Caltech there, they have their system set up to alert for every single earthquake. So when an earthquake occurs, and that was a real earthquake, it had a magnitude of about two and a half, the system then determines how much time until the S wave arrives at your location, the Caltech press room in that case, and how much shaking at your location. So the reason that the system went off, it said, you know, earth, I forget what the words are, but earthquake alert, mm -hmm. no shaking expected. So it was because the system knew that there was no shaking coming. So you could choose to only be notified when you either expect to feel shaking or when you expect the shaking to cause some sort of damage. So the idea is that the system is detecting earthquakes above about magnitude three, but it detects some magnitude two and a half earthquakes all the time. But then of course, you get to choose when you would, when you would get a warning. Now in the case of a public warning system where we're pushing out a warning uh, statewide to the public, we may well want to choose some of those thresholds, we being the, the queues, the California Earthquake Early Warning System that the USGS um, and Cal OES are, are defining right now. So for a public alert like that, there might be a threshold. But then for a, a sophisticated user, such as a, a fire department who understands this, they may choose to set their threshold themselves. And so I would imagine they wouldn't want to know about earthquakes that are occurring that don't cause any shaking. Um, but they may want to know when there's going to be an earthquake that just feels shaking, even if it's not an earthquake that's expected to do damage. So that was not a false alarm. That was, uh, that was a choice of the, re the user of how, how many alerts they want to get. Okay, so then what, what I see on that and what you've said is there's still a significant amount of policy discussion that has to be made with the governmental leaders, probably this group, on what and how the notifications are going to look like as I think they get rolled out. I mean, we, we, we kind of have a system that's close that's obviously sending out alerts, that's fine, but we've got a big jump still between what we say is a system that works functionally and in the safety realm for society and the public, especially the public safety folks, because I know Commissioner Parkinson and I being in law enforcement fire, stuff like this makes us really nervous because how the public reacts to fire in a crowded theater, if you will, using that metaphor, yeah. is significant um, in the public arena. So uh, that's my question. So in, in your, you, you will acknowledge that we do have a huge jump still to get Absolutely. to the point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a seismologist. My job here is to detect earthquakes accurately and generate the alerts. Then how we use them is a whole additional domain that is something that as a group, I think as a community, an earthquake science community and an emergency response community, we really are starting to grapple with it but it's very definitely a, a whole separate section. I completely agree. Can I just uh, follow up on that for one second? So if we set the threshold to only alert when the ground was going to shake, what, are, what is the chance of error? So in other words, you've been using the system, and if you set it there, are we going to get false alarms without shaking? So, so, okay, so let's use the Japan example, if I may, to answer this question. So in the case of Japan, their nationwide earthquake early warning system, they have defined a threshold. They want to issue an alert for all earthquakes that have an intensity greater than five, and it's a different intensity scale to us, but that's, that's, a, that's a minor point. So then when they measure their false and missed alarms, what they do is they ask how many earthquakes called, caused ground shaking intensity greater than five, for which they didn't issue an alert, how many caused ground shaking that was less than five, and they did issue an alert. Um, and what they find is that there is, you know, in, and I, f I can't remember the exact numbers, I apologize, but maybe over the course of some period of time, there are issued 20 alerts, and there's one false alert, and there's one missed alert. And the one false alert will be a situation where they pushed out an alert, and they said the peak ground shaking intensity was five, and in fact, it was four. So it was just slightly different across the boundary. And the missed was the case where they thought the strongest shaking was going to be a four, and the actual shaking was a five. So the point is that these false and missed alerts are the earthquakes that are very close to this, this line that you're drawing. So, so when you draw this very clear line, there are inevitably going to be events that are just above or just below. And so you could ask, do you consider those to be false and missed alerts? And technically, absolutely they are. But of course, the actual prediction was very close to the, to the actual observation. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman Kari. Yeah, I'm, I'm originally from Mexico City, so we've, uh, we've been experiencing the early warning for some time. Uh, now it's uh, everybody carries their app and their phone. Um, about two months ago, uh, Governor uh, Brown uh, had a delegation go to Mexico, and among the things that were discussed was the early warning system. Um, I was welcomed on Monday by an early warning that it was going to be an earthquake coming in. It was imminent. It was in the, in the subduction zone uh, where a lot of the strong motion uh, occurs. Um, it, it didn't materialize. Uh, traffic came to a halt. Everybody panicked. People were running out of places. So it, 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 false alerts and false alarms uh, do cause uh, a lot of panic, on, sure. especially for my sister, for example. She just goes crazy uh, when an earthquake occurs. Um, but the next day, uh, as we were getting ready to go and meet with uh, uh, Mexico's uh, seismic experts, uh, we were woken up by a good size shake. If people were in the 25-story building in the hotel, they certainly felt it. However, that region was in the volcanics zone that does not have the strong motion instrumentation, hmm. so there was no warning whatsoever. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that I think that the early warning system has its applications for certain locations and for certain examples. Um, I think that it is way too early to try to get the public too excited about uh, Rachel Maddow's, uh, <laughs> there it is, we have it already solved, which was really in a way a little bit more sensational than it is. Uh, the, and it's going to have to be a, a policy decision. Yep. Uh, 80 million, uh, 500 million, 3 billion, uh, how safe do we want to be and how early do we want to be able to detect? Can we send things down there to see if there is going to be, at some point, the possibility of a rupture? That would be an, uh, a precursor or an early alert, in, in my uh, opinion. You mean a prediction? Yeah. Prediction, yeah, I, of, of them to occur. And I remember, I mean, in the in in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, B. T. Brady from the U.S. Geolo Geological Survey made a predictions. He had all sorts of alerts, and no, it was way too early to make yeah. those kinds of things. No, I mean, let's not make any comparisons between early warning and earthquake prediction. These are two very different things. I do not see that we're going to be foresee that we'll be predicting earthquakes for the foreseeable future. So I don't think we should um, be th considering that. Earthquake early warning is something that we could do today, as we've demonstrated uh, with these various earthquakes that I've shown you. But I completely agree with your, your comments about that this is no panacea for the earthquake problem, first of all. This does not solve the earthquake problem. And this, this particular approach, earthquake early warning, has its own challenges that come with it. There is no perfect system. Uh, I think any Anybody that tells you that there are no false alerts or will be no false alerts or no missed alerts, um, it's just simply not telling the truth. This is not a perfect system. Any system that's engineered is going to have problems. At the same time, I think we can work our way through the process of thinking about how to intelligently use this and what are the applications that make sense. And um, BART, I think, is a great example of that. Um, that was one of the reasons, and so Tracy, please jump in whenever you want. Um, but that was one of the reasons that we thought that BART might be interested because uh, because of their automated control system, uh, when they get an alert, they can slow and stop trains, um, and, and then they can start them up again. And, and our experience with BART was that actually BART was even more tolerant to the possibility of false alerts than, than we thought they would be. So that's one example of identifying what is an intelligent way to, to make use of, of this earthquake early warning information. If I may, um, the, um, for BART, it was a rather easy decision to uh, participate in the pilot program because the consequences of a false uh, positive were um, not so severe. It was something that BART riders experience every day. There would be a slight slowdown, a, a halt in service, hold for a few minutes, and then off you go. So it was really um, a way for the agency to, uh, uh, you know, jump in and see, set an example, show others what, you know, what is doable for us. Much easier for BART than it would be for PG&E. 
right? And um, and so uh, we were happy, you know, that we've um, I think been working together for three, four, five, Quite a few years wow, now. six <laughs> years, and um, and we look forward to you know continuing the partnership as uh, things you know continue to improve. Commissioner Gardner, I, I think everybody agrees that an earthquake early warning system exists and it it's just a matter of money to get it to cover a broader area. I, we've kind of danced around it a little bit, but one of the areas I think is most important is how do you use it once, once we have it? Um, and that's, that's the big policy dis discussion that has to happen. It's not a technical discussion. It's, it's a, how do you want to use this tool? And on the technical side, how do you write the algorithms that let you use it the way that you want to use it? But you really don't want to be shutting off gas meters in Oakland and Berkeley because of the Napa earthquake. Um, you don't want to stop trains on, on the main line railroads because they block intersections and they're hard to start again and you know, all kinds of bad things happen. It, it becomes crew shift change and they can't move the train until they bring new people in. Um, so it, we have to think that through really carefully and I think that really is more of the question um, than is there a system or can we make a system that functions? It's how do we, how do we want it to function? And how do we plan that out? Um, I think it's, there's real value in different entities being able to be alerted at different levels of, of shaking. But for, uh, particularly for the public side, um, things that go out to the public, if the public perceives things as a false alarm, they'll stop paying attention. <coughs> the little boy who cried wolf. Um, if the public perceives that they're getting an alert and yes, there's an earthquake, but sort of a so what one, um, they'll stop paying attention. And if we miss one that does <coughs> do damage, then that will be all of everybody's fault. You, you failed. Um, so th those are the kinds of things that I think we have to work on. And I really think it's the harder part. Finding the money is something we'll ultimately do. We as a, a state will find the $80 million, whatever the number is, and we'll, we'll get the system in place. But we, deciding how to use it best is, I think, the bigger challenge. Yeah, I completely agree with that. There's just one comment I'd like to add is that you think when you mentioned about deciding who should shut off their gas, I mean, as an example, I mean, what's important to recognize is with this sort of regional earthquake early warning approach, what you can essentially do is create a shake map, but before the shaking starts. So um, Steve Mahan showed some shake maps from the Napa quake. So, so the whole idea behind a regional early warning system is that you essentially can calculate what that shake map might look like before the event. So you can estimate estimate where the shaking is going to be strong and where it's not going to be strong. This is not just an on-off switch. This is not just that everybody gets warning or nobody gets warning. Um, and so, so that obviously adds an in, in, you know, a lot of complexity when we come to think about how we push that alert out to, to the, the groups that you're talking about. It, it isn't a simple on-off switch. No, it's right. not. I think along those same vines, veins, <coughs> excuse me, We've got to be mindful of how we are communicating with the public, both in the policy side of the community and the science side of the community. Um, we have policymakers sitting in this room probably who has hardly addressed this. It has not even come across their desk and they go, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Um, We've got to be very careful, it kind of uh, in line with the unreinforced masonry problem. I mean, I got hundreds of phone calls, it seemed like, from the media, why the buildings were damaged after the Napa quake. Well, I think the question is, did people survive in the buildings that were damaged? And it's a, not a reasonable expectation that a reinforced building is not going to fall down or be damaged. It's the same on early warning. I think we've got to be very careful as we move forward through this process that the policymakers are very involved of representing the public on how these warnings are going to be rolled out um, and, and assuring them that when we do media and talk about how this stuff is happening, 
that the public doesn't go, oh, well, we have early warning and I'm going to get a text on my phone, you know, 10 minutes, but, but well, 10 minutes, not reasonable, but, you know, several seconds on an earthquake in next, the end of next year because we have a deadline in the state that was imposed by the legislature and I have early warning up and running. Yeah. So um, this is a much deeper, bigger, broader conversation that it's going to have many more people involved than the ones at this table. Frankly, if you're ele an elected member of anywhere in the government or state government in California and probably con con our congressional delegation, this is going to cross their desks at some point in the very near future and, and to be dealt toiled with for many years to come. Commissioner Helwig. Yeah, I I wanted to say sort of in reply to what Commissioner Mercari said and pursuant to the rest of the discussion that's been going on that yes I understand that we're not ready for it yet but if we the scientists don't talk about it in venues like this and whatever chance we get nobody's going to know that we need to discuss it before we can put it into place and we're not going to get the money to do it whatever it is unless we keep waving the little flag that says there's this thing out here that we could do to make life perhaps somewhat safer in our earthquake country. And in that respect, yes, it's not ready. Yes, it's going to take a long time. Yes, there are a lot of policy decisions that need to be made. And we've been trying to encourage the people who need to weigh in on them to weigh in on them so that we can actually have the discussion. I think it's really important for us to reach out and for Rachel Maddow to remind people that it's a possibility so that we can have the discussion that needs to happen before we make it and before the next big earthquake comes so we have this in place before. Thank you. Commissioner Sweets. I think uh, um, one component that uh, maybe people don't think about of a system like this is awareness, preparedness, emergency preparedness, and education. People tend to think and focus on the technical aspect, you know, the sensors, the computers, the signal, how it's going to be pushed. Okay, we got the signal. What do we do next? Whether it's five or 10 seconds or 15 seconds, there will be a program, procedures to educate people students in, school, in schools, uh, workers, um, the first responders about, if you get a signal, what do you do? And I think uh, people tend to forget that component. It's a, it's a huge benefit, it's a huge advantage for having such a system, equivalent to the signal that we will get, whether it's five or 10 seconds or so. So with the, with the uh, early warning system, there will be a huge program to educate people about earthquakes and what do you do in case of an earthquake. So yeah, just no, wanted that, to mention this. I think that's absolutely right. And I, I would actually turn it around and turn this into a huge opportunity for education about the earthquake issue. There's no question that earthquake early warning captures the people's imagination, right? People imagine getting this warning on their phone. They can see how they can directly connect to this system and benefit from this system. Now, of course, for them to use it in an in a appropriate way, as several people have commented, requires a serious education campaign. So we can use that interest, that interest in early warning, and when and if the state decides to roll out a public early warning system, the fact that we need that education campaign, the fact that people are interested in it, to not only educate them about early warning and how to make use of early warning, but about more broader issues when it comes to earthquakes, include of, including all of the sort of structural building issues that we've been hearing about and responsibilities that we have for our own earthquake plans and the buildings that we live and work in. So I see that being a great synergy of, of being able to take that interest and, uh, and turn it into broader education. Okay, um, before we take any more questions, I, I don't want to forget Michael Price is sitting here uh, also with uh, the seismic warning system system that was up and activated uh, during the Napa earthquake. And so let's uh, let's hear from him um, on the performance of that system and, and what it was able to accomplish during the warning.
Okay. Thank you for letting me uh, present to the commission today. Um, my name is Michael Price. I'm the Chief Technical Officer for Seismic Warning Systems. And I want to talk a little about the, uh, our experience with earthquake warning during the Napa Fault. It's a little background. Uh, we started doing research in earthquake warning back in 1995 and produced first products in 2000. And we went out into the, the market and tried to sell earthquake warning to people, which in 2000 was hard to do because no one ever, ever heard of earthquake warning and they had no idea what it was good for or, or even that it could, was possible. But we very quickly ran across a couple of applications which were uh, very interesting and, and I guess I call it the fire station app, the uh, killer app of earthquake warning in, in early days. Uh, and, that's the re and the reason for this is in earthquakes, the uh, fire stations rock back and forth. Their equipment bay doors are on, um, they're, they, uh, they raise up on rails with rollers and the rollers pop out of the rails and the doors jam. They can't get the trucks out of the station after the earthquake. Uh, this has happened many times in California and we talked to lots of fire departments that, that had actually seen this. And so we offered a device which we'd install in a, in, in a uh, fire station which would detect an earthquake. Um, and if it wasn't a small one, it was going to be a large one, it would then open, automatically open the doors, turn on the station lights, and alert the personnel that something was, that there was quicks about the strike. First of these was installed in a fire station in Palm Springs in 2001, and it looks like that. That's a typical installation. A controller box mounted on the wall with cables to cover the doors and lights and audio. And it's hard to see, but that's the inside of one of the devices, and it's full of interfaces to various control equipment, depending on the application. Uh, but these are fire stations or any other applications we've had. These things are in hospitals and schools and offices. Uh, Vallejo uh, has quake guards in their fire stations, and this is because of Loma Prieta. During Loma Prieta, the Cypress freeway structure collapsed. Uh, Don Parker was a lieutenant in the uh, fire department there in Oakland at that time, and he noticed he noticed that Station 5's doors jammed during the earthquake. Station 5 was about a block from the Cypress structure, and it took the firefighters about 15 minutes to clear the doors and get out and go to the Cypress structure and try to rescue people. And this is, of course, um, something that people was very, it had a big impact on pe people because they realized that they had been delayed in their response to the community because the doors were jammed. This was uh, something that Don remembered a lot. He became fire chief over in Vallejo, and in uh, 2002, he heard about Quake Guard. We were selling it. He talked to the city, and they decided to install Quake Guards, which they installed in all eight fire stations in the city in 2002 and early 2003. Uh, fire station. And there, on the map, you can see uh, there were five of these stations. It only doesn't show up very well. Those black squares. There are five active stations with Quake Guards uh, <coughs> during the Vallejo earthquake. Two stations have been decommissioned, and one station has been remodeled, and they haven't reinstalled the Quake Guard yet. I'll talk a little about what happened during the Napa earthquake for uh, these five stations. There's the epicenter uh, vaults. This is the, the, the stations are about six to 10 kilometers from the epicenter. And, and the way the, the system works is it detects a P wave, and I'm just gonna animate this. this, is a P wave arrive at the station when it arrives, the, the, the station has sensors and on the quake guard detects that the ground, there's some ground motion. It can distinguish between seismic ground motions and human caused motions. It can also distinguish between a lar what's going to be a large earthquake and a small earthquake. And if it's going to be a large earthquake, which, which for a fire station application is typically means that it's gonna have an intensity five on a Mercalli scale, which is about where things start to get interesting, then it triggers a, its actions. Then this S wave arrives, and in this, you can, I'm just going to step through. The S wave arrived at each of the five stations, and it produced somewhere between 1.7 and 2.4 seconds of warning in Vallejo. And at each of these stations, the doors opened, an audio alert was produced to uh, wake up the fire fires in this particular case. Um, one station, the power failed just after the alert arrived. And this brings up a, you know, a point about applications for earthquake warning. If you're going to have some activities you want to start on a warning, um, you probably want to have uh, you know, some power backup if you want it to actually complete. Um, in this case, the, uh, the doors got slightly open and then the power dropped. But in the other stations, the door is open. Uh, 
There's also some fire stations that had uh, quake guards in Albany and Berkeley. Uh, but down there, uh, the intensity was slight. And so the, uh, there was no uh, alert on those stations, and, then, and it ignored the earthquakes being too small. Um, had we had opened the doors, that would have been a false alarm, and we uh, try to avoid false alarms. Um, in the 13 years that this system has been in place, there haven't been any false alarms, and that may be just luck, but it's, it is the performance we had. And of course, the false alarm doesn't cost much. You open up the doors, it doesn't really cost anything, but the, there's huge reputational damage, and this is early days in, in earthquake warning. And the last thing we want to do is have people learn that earthquake warning is like a fire alarm to be generally ignored because most of them are false. And so it's really critical in our view to make sure that, that we pay very close attention to the false alarm rate or people are just going to ignore us, as mentioned. Uh, also, so here I put up the, the locations where buildings were red tagged. And you can see that uh, in Vallejo, they're, they're, they're pretty much right where you expect where the fire stations are, which is no coincidence because the fire stations are put where the buildings are. Um, and so one of the questions was asked you know, is that if we've got so many stations in Vallejo and they're warning the firefighters, why can't we use them to warn the rest of the community? Which is a really good question. If you do that, then what you'd want to do is take the signals from these quake guards and somehow distribute it to people in the community. Uh, so I'll talk a little about how the quake guard works and, and why it can do what it can do. We're only six miles from the epicenter, yet it still produced a warning. So here's a building at the epicenter. There's a hypocenter, which is in California, typically eight kilometers deep. And so we're going to have some quake guards shown by that little orange triangle spread around. And you know, they're going to be not, not necessarily right at the epicenter, but nearby. And they're going to have to communicate with the data center. And then the data center or some server is going to have to send this warning back to the epicenter to get the warning there. The, um, the, the quake guard in a fire station, when it detects an, uh, the earthquake and decides to do something, makes a local decision, and it just turns on a relay or something to make the doors open. But if you can actually distribute the warning out around the community, then you have an additional problem. You have to deal with communication delays. And so actually getting a signal out of the station and back to people who uh, need to have the warning is another delay to be considered. And if we look at the, the budget to do this, for it looks like this. If we want to warn people who are at the epicenter of an earthquake, we've got a second from the arrival of the P wave at the surface to the time we deliver the earthquake warning to the epicenter. You've got one second. And so, if you if we want to uh, warn people everywhere in an earthquake, um, then that's the, the the total system time budget. And this epicenter is in American Canyon, as we know, and it's not a lot of it's not a very dense area around here. But if that epicenter was in Hayward. Then there's a lot of people who are going to be right on top of the epicenter and very near it, and we want to give them a warning. And if we can, then what we can do is we can initiate actions before the S wave hits the surface, or coincident with it. And there are lots of actions that can be done in a very short period of time, like shut off some power to avoid a fire being started. There's, some, there's lots of things you can do in data centers that are very fast and so on. Um, so this shows the, in this particular case, um, about 300 milliseconds of warning at the epicenter. Um, quake guards were designed to provide this kind of warning. Typical quake guard can analyze a P wave and decide on, on whether or not to produce uh, an action in typically 400 milliseconds. Um, and so the rest of the time would be used up in communication out to some kind of a server and back to the data center, or back to the, the epicenter where people need to be warned. And there's not much going on in the data center because all it's doing is relaying the, the warning because all the comp computation of P waves and all the analysis of whether or not this is a large earthquake or not is done in the, uh, in the station, so it's fully distributed. So the intention in, in f going forward is to build a network of quake guards. Um, There'll be you know, a number of them spread around. And the advantage here is you get an increased warning time over a standalone device. So this, if we were to have an array of quake guards, then the warning time can be increased. You can see in this particular case for a proposed layout of additional systems in this area, the warning time goes from instead of 1.7 to 2.4, it's 2 to 3.5 or so. So it's not a huge increase right near the epicenter. The, the increase in, uh, is greater the farther away you get. 
And the advantage is that you're taking this, this ability to detect the, uh, to, to produce an alert uh, and provide a warning to the, to regardless of where the epicenter is, to a region rather than just to a station where, or a facility in which the system is, is deployed. And so if you, as we talked about, there's blind zones you can, you, that um, you can avoid by doing this. So the goal for the Quake Guard has always been to provide a, a warning that works everywhere because we're selling this to, to pe people who are putting these in the facilities and they don't know where their facility is with respect to any prospective earthquake and, and uh, we warrant our product so it needs to work everywhere. So it was from very early we had to d design a system fast enough to provide a warning. Uh, and our goal here is to increase resilience by actually having action. So the product has always been focused on applications. We talk about schools as, as an alert, but in, in a fire station we're controlling doors, in other places we're controlling valves and so on to, to take some action which will have an impact on the, um, on the, the results of the earthquake. So uh, with this idea of, of building a network of quake guards and distributing a warning around a, a region, we, we've approached a couple of, of uh, areas here in California with a, the proposal for a partnership. Uh, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, which is down in Palm, Palm Springs, the Salton Sea area, and Imperial County have both agreed to partner with us on building a regional system, which involves placing quake guards uh, in the area near uh, where we, along the faults and where we expect epicenters and a few other places in between, and then distributing a warning to public facilities there, in, in this case schools, uh, fire and police stations, emergency operations centers, um, hospitals, uh, water infrastructure facilities, and so on. Uh, and, the, and the way that works is that we raise private capital to build the system. We use revenue from s selling products to commercial end users to pay for operations and maintenance going forward. And then we provide the warning to the, these public facilities for no ongoing cost to them. Um, and they get then public warning in all these, these facilities and, and, and of course from the company's point of view we're helping the, uh, protect the public. Our model here is that, that if you want to protect people, you, you realize that wherever they are, they're some place. Uh, they're at school or at church or they're at a store or they're at a restaurant or they're in their place of work or they're in a hotel. And that the people who own those places, the facility owners, are responsible for the people's safety when you're there. So that's why there are lighted exit lights and emergency lighting and fire alarms in this building because the, the, the owner of the hotel is responsible for our safety while we're here. And so our view is we go to the facility owner and say, look, there's an earthquake warning system that you can install in your building. And you need to work with some emergency planners to, to understand what the best response to the warning is. But then if you had a warning in this building, you would start this meeting by saying, welcome, this building is equipped with earthquake warning. It sounds like this. And you just do a test of it. If during the course of this meeting you hear that sound, what you should do is crouch down next to your chair, put your hands over your head and protect yourself from falling objects and don't move until the ground stops shaking. Now let's get on with the meeting. Or if this had been a banquet, there would be tables. They say, push your chair back, crawl into the tables and hold on to the legs. Or if this was some kind of a home show, there would be booths with vendors and they'd sell you something else. And elsewhere in the hotel, they'd have an entirely different message if you're out in the swimming pool or if you're in the kitchen or you're in a restaurant or in one of the guest rooms. The point is the facility owner is, has an interest in making sure that he can, they can convey to you what you need to do when an alarm happens and they can also provide the context in like this meeting uh, that's most appropriate. And so by working with the facility owners, you can protect people wherever they happen to be and, and that is the way to make earthquake warning effective. And so that's really the model that we've proposed uh, for businesses and also for these regional partnerships. So then there's this statewide project or um, effort that has been started, uh, which um, Professor Allen talked about. And a working group was uh, initiated about two years ago and a number of, of uh, organizations were part of the working group, uh, CISN members, uh, Cal OES, uh, Seismic Safety Commission, and we were part of this member, and we talked this group, and we talked about uh, what it would take to get earthquake warning going in California quickly. And our role in this was essentially to bring the point of view of an industrial uh, company because we've been selling to you know, earthquake warning for 13 years. Um, and we have lots of customers in the state. Uh, and this has since then moved on to, uh, to have a number of committees looking at various aspects of bringing the system up and operating and maintaining. And a lot of other organizations have, have, have um, 
joint. And um, and our recommendations here is that there is a significant role that, that industry can make in earthquake warning. Uh, we have technology we think is very useful, and we think that bringing that to bear on all aspects of earthquake warning is, is great and is important. Uh, and we want to uh, make sure that the as we go forward earthquake warning, we realize that there's going to be lots of sources of earthquake warning as um, Professor Allen mentioned, there's going to be some private ones. There's already some of those. There's going to be more of those. There's going to be public. And they, we need to leverage as much as possible the investments that have already been made in these areas and, and build a system which can deliver uh, earthquake warning to everyone. So to summarize, um, we had quake guards in Vallejo. They protected firefighters and, and helped them avoid delays. Uh, this is not the first earthquake, warning, uh, earthquake where we've done that. We've, there have been several earthquakes in California that where quake guards have served the firefighters, the Sam Simeon earthquake, and the number are down in Coachella Valley, um, as well as protecting other kinds of facilities. Uh, the next step is to extend these kinds of protections statewide. <coughs> and we're working with the state as part of this uh, California earthquake early warning system effort to try to combine efforts and come up with the best solution. And I think everybody involved realizes we need to do this quickly. Um, and the, the time is, is now. Technology works. And the, really, the question is, as was mentioned, is how do you integrate this into society so that it becomes part of you know, everyday, everyday life? So thank you, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for Michael? Salute. Yes. Um, what is the cost? Uh, can you shed light on the cost of every unit, system, something to give us perspective? Yeah, what we do is we sell earthquake warning now. Uh, the cost to a, a, to a you know, typical facility is, is small, small office. It's, about, it's a subscription, about $1,200 a year. And the equipment? Uh, the, well, it, well is if, that you want to, part of it? if you want to buy a, a, um, a standalone device as a backup to a network alert, you can. Uh, but we're, but there's, those are two separate things. So a network alert okay. delivers an alert. It's a subscription. It's, it's a nominal kind of a fee. It depends also on the kind of facility. If we're, if we're talking about a, 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 a subscription for something to, to control an industrial process, that's more expensive. But for a, a drop, cover, hold kind of audio alert in a, in a facility like this, it's fairly inexpensive. Thank you, Mike. I have a question on you. Are, your company is also experienced not just in receiving the signal, but doing something internally for your client. Can you? Can you? What? What are they? What? What is their reaction? What? Do, what do you usually do? <clears throat> what are they asking for? You get the signal, and then how do you go about implementing that signal within a within a company to get it to to have it to do to turn it into action? I guess. Excuse me, is what I'm trying to say. Well, what happens is that the um, we work with a company to, to identify potential applications. And for each of those, you need to understand what the vulnerabilities are. So um, a drop cover hold alert is something that you do uh, if ever you're going to get any kind of, of uh, shaking, which is going to perhaps cause things to fall. And so they identify. Uh, th that kind of application and put up an audio alert. But for control applications, what they're looking for is to help them identify what what machines or what processes are vulnerable and it and how we can control those to have some impact. There are some things which you just can't um, have an impact on. Earthquake warning isn't going to help you. But there, are, um, for example, a valve application. They want to shut off a valve to prevent a spill to avoid cleanup costs. And so we work with them to figure out at what intensity level, what kind of peak, peak ground acceleration that, that is likely to cause some damage. And then there's a uh, uh, essentially a rule which they can specify which says if the peak ground acceleration is going to exceed this value with some probability, then we'll shut this valve off. Um, and it, it's more, it can be more complicated than that because it might be dependent on the state of the valve and the process it's running and so on. And so there's a consul consultation that goes on. And then there's also a cost-benefit analysis, which 
factors in what does it cost us to shut something down versus what is the benefit if it happens to get damaged in an earthquake and, and what is the likelihood of an earthquake of that particular intensity and so on to come up with a, with a financial model which allows them to make a choice on whether to do that or not. So that actually your question? Yes. Okay. Mark, the, uh, I think commercially driven you know, approach to uh, get the warning system rollout is a fantastic idea. And my question is the um, uh, is there are there enough uh, is there enough are there enough needs out there enough volume out there so you can network all those uh, stations to make the actual warning system? Not at the moment. We're in the process of. No, I mean I know right now. I'm talking about the future. Market yeah. needs. Market needs. Well, so no, we're not. What we're not doing here is installing quake guards in customer sites and then using those to build a network. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Mm. Uh, but the biggest one is, is that uh, generally you know, the people who are interested in earthquake warning are not necessarily located where it's most advantageous to have a sensor. And so uh, you, you, what you have to want to do is you want to evaluate a region and decide how do you want to place the sensors to maximize mm -hmm. the amount of warning that you can, do, you can produce, yeah. given some assumptions of where earthquakes are likely to be. And then you want to go out and find locations to put sensors there. So the process is actually to stick sensors in the ground specifically um, and then use that, uh, those sensors to produce an alert. Is it like a market for like a public and a private school would be a really good one? I mean, yeah, uh, sure. because distribution is pretty much... E yeah, anything which has good geographical right. descriptions, right. school districts are you know, a good example. Be a good place to put some sensors. Right, and uh, so students can just duck on the table yeah. before, before actually or right. at the P-Wave stage. Right. So what would it be? So do you have any discussion with the public school system about this? Oh, sure. Well, in, in the Coachella Valley, we're the, there oh, are three public base. school districts, and district all three of them base. are on the project. And we're going to be placing sensors in a few of the schools, because they happen to be well located, but not all of them. And so gen generally speaking, what happens is that the, uh, we'll pick, a, we'll pick a, a particular school site and say, that's appropriate for a sensor, and then we'll put one there. Uh, and then we put a server in this, in, in somewhere in the school district. And the reason for that is, is so if there are 50 schools in the school district, we can send a signal to the server and it can redistribute it to the school sites as a way of making sure that we can scale this thing up to hundreds of thousands of users. Mm -hmm. And so there's, it's part of that. And that's part of the regional plan is to design the system as well as the communications to be able to get that signal back to them in a second. You need to optimize the communications out, which is a, which is a harder problem because you don't know what kind of network they have. Uh, you don't have as much control over that as you do your own sensor network communications. So it requires a lot of optimization. But we've been working with, experimenting with that with our own, with, with the existing Quake guards for the last seven or eight years. And so we, know, we think we you know how to solve that problem. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank Excellent you. presentations. Both of you really appreciate your time and your energy. And look forward to working together as we move this uh, EE earthquake early warning forward. Um, our next speaker, Ms. Marianne Phipps, the president of eStructure, will be talking about building retrofits, damage, and business continuity issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and I am very grateful that you're still here and applauded your stamina and grateful that there's still people in the audience. So um, I'm here as a structural engineer, a practicing structural engineer. I'm here because I was co-leader of a FEMA ATC effort where we um, gathered data from the earthquake. We investigated all of the buildings within a thousand feet of the strong motion device down in Main Street in Napa. And I'm here because I'm a, a design professional and I want to learn as much as we can from this earthquake and take it back home to improve practice. So um, the topic I was given was something like uh, retrofits and business continuity and something like that. So um, I am going to try to do that as succinctly and quickly as possible without any repetition. So if something's been talked about, I will go right through it. And if we can just get this on the screen, we will get through it pretty quickly. Um, pretty much all of my slides are from Napa, just because that's where I focused my effort. That's the one, yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, great. So I want to start by saying, 
Like every earthquake, at least in the building community, kind of has its signature. When we think back to the 1971 San Bernardino earthquake, we think about non-ductal concrete and what we learned at the Olive View Hospital. And, and in lower Prieta and buildings, it was probably soft stories in the marina and liquefaction. And then Northridge, of course, was steel moment frames. So the obvious question is, what's going to be the legacy for the Napa earthquake? Because there's always one. And I think, in, in my opinion, it's going to be retrofitted URMs. There's a whole bunch of unreinforced masonry buildings. A large subset of them were retrofit in accordance with an, with an ordinance so that we've got this nice class of buildings, all of in a, in a similar geographic location, seeing similar ground motion. It's an amazing opportunity to study what happens, study our techniques, study our ordinances, and, and, and learn from them. So I think that's going to be the legacy here. Um, the important point I want to make about the ordinance is what the stated objective was in the Napa, Napa Municipal Code, and that it was to reduce the risk of death or injury. So we're going to look at a bunch of the retrofitting, and, and when we think about did it do its job or not, you really have to come back to the objective. Did it reduce the risk of death or injury? So in fairness, I wanted to start with the unretrofitted uh, URMs uh, that were still in Napa. Uh, here's a restaurant. If you can see that photo on the right, it's an image that I don't think many people have seen. That is an interior brick wall. And it is splayed all over the tables in that restaurant. So for those of us who have been saying if it was a few hours earlier or later, this is a pretty graphic representation of what the difference would have been and how different this hearing today would have been. Uh, another URM, this is uh, one of the commonly photographed ones. Uh, again, pretty obvious that these are very vulnerable buildings. However, I don't want to say that every URM that was unretrofit was damaged. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why they weren't. Uh, some of them are what I'll call leaner buildings. They're sort of tight in between two other buildings, so they literally lean on the building next to them. And if it's been strengthened one side and the other, they can actually do fairly well. And sometimes you just get lucky. These buildings are vulnerable. We know it but sometimes they're not damaged. So let's look at the ret some of the retrofitted ones and see how they did. So I have a few here that I'm going to judge personally to be acceptable performance. This one is actually right where the strong motion device is on Main Street. Downtown Joe's really had absolutely no damage. Um, the Bounty Hunter restaurant, they um, retrofit the building, had a little bit of movement of the parapet, no stones, no brick lost. Um, they're doing some repair measures, put some a canopy over the entrance. It was back in operation very quickly. Good performance. Uh, Chop House, a beautiful stone building, a beautiful retrofit. It lost a few stones from the parapet, both at the front and the rear. Uh, you know, uh, again, the 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 purpose was to reduce the risk to earthquakes. These buildings didn't collapse. They protected life, and they, they reduced the potential life loss significantly. I think they were all pretty good performers. Then you have the Vintners Collective down the street. Uh, I'll, I'll step up and say it was pretty bad performance for a retrofit building. I'm told uh, that the walls were 20 inch thick stone, and I'm told that the anchors went in about 10 inches. So there's a whole lot of stone on the outside of this building that was not tied back to the floors or the roof, and this is the kind of performance you get. Uh, this is sort of the poster child for the earthquake. Um, that's a busy corner. That's a lot of brick. And uh, that steel and those anchors did not fully engage the masonry on the outside of that building, and it did not perform in accordance with the way uh, I think anybody would have expected or wanted it to. You know, here's the Goodman Library, a, a beautiful historic building. Some stone was lost from that, that um, cornice piece, that tower. I'm told that the engineer of record for the retrofit had uh, planned and requested uh, to take that off, strengthen it, and put it back, and that was not done. I don't know whether it was cost. I don't know whether it was historic stuff, uh, but I just add that as a little bit of information about that. There is some stone down there. If somebody had been standing there, it would have certainly um, had the potential of, of causing a casualty. However, that building uh, can be saved. Uh, and, and this uh, building had some steel moment frames on the interior, uh, some very bad damage on the brick walls on the two far sides. Uh, the, de the 
Apparently, I'm told the design had some deficiencies, the construction had some deficiencies, it performed very poorly, it's going to be closed for a very long period of time, the strengthening is going to get, have to get redone largely, and I'd say it was, uh, um, while no one was killed, that's probably not the performance we want in there, those kinds of retrofits either. Um, one of the big pictures, one of the big stories in this earthquake, and I think precedent setting, is this whole adjacency issue uh, that the mayor spoke of earlier about these closed sessions. Here's, you know, poor Velo Pizzeria who went through their retrofits, spent their money, invested in their building, but because of their adjacency to the center building, which did not, they had to they were, first of all, first green tagged, then red tagged because of this vulnerability. Then they had to build a barricade on top of their building. If you guys can see that wood up there, that's a, a wood frame barricade, essentially, to prevent the brick from posing a hazard to the building below. Similar to other buildings um, in the area, you can see another one on the lower left, and there's another one on the, uh, on the right there. Other buildings had done their retrofit but because of the adjacency issue, they were red tagged. Um, also ready to brick are chimneys. And I don't know about you, but I can't believe we still have brick chimneys out there that are falling over in every earthquake, causing considerable potential life threats. And it seems to me, if you're thinking about things you can do as a body, think about these chimneys because, I mean, if we can strap water heaters at the point of sale, can't we get rid of chimneys too? Um, you know, there's the 13-year-old boy um, who was had the fireplace. If you can see on the upper right-hand corner, that is the fireplace that came down on him. So. I don't think I have to say more to make this point. These are vulnerable, they're damaging, they're dangerous. They are dangerous in every single earthquake. We have a lot of focus on cripple walls, which is important and essential. These chimneys are equally essential to deal with. Um, other vulnerable buildings, I'm going to skip over this. This is some more tilt-up stuff. Um, Professor Mahan talked about these. There are other classes of buildings out there that are vulnerable. I'm not going to talk about them right now. I just know that they're there. Uh, this happens to be a glue lamb beam connected to a pilaster that almost fell off and there were three in a row like that and, and came very near to collapse, collapsing the roof. I'm going to spend the next chunk of time, short chunk of time, talking about modern buildings. Uh, this building was of interest because the date was plastered right up there, 2008, and right below it you could see the stone veneer that fell off from the building. Around the building there were different pieces of veneer, uh, solid stone, some um, insulated, but they, uh, they came off the building and, and I'll say probably should not have. But the big issue is this issue on the, um, the far, that would be the south side of the building where if you look carefully in this you would see a lot of cracks in the stucco wall, you would see bowing out of the wall, and that image on the right, you're seeing daylight through there. That's actually a gap between the outside wall and the inside wall, and you're not supposed to see a gap there. Fred Turner was at the building, building this morning. He reported that that exterior wall uh, moved about 12 inches relative to the steel moment frame that this building is. So bad detailing. There was bad detailing to accommodate the drift of the, of the moment frame, uh, and um, protect the exterior wall in anticipation of that movement. Um, and that's the shoring that went up afterwards. The other interesting, you know, modern building is, is the hotel, the Andaz Hotel. Um, the, presently on the website, you'll read that it says, you know, we've been impacted by the earthquake and we're going to open maybe at the end of October. So what happened there is, first of all, on the exterior there was some loss of adhered veneer. On the left is what happened the day of the earthquake. On the right is they came in afterwards and knocked off all the loose stuff. Um, from the day of the earthquake, this is what the bathrooms look like. And you get these kind of images if you sort of go into Facebook and stuff and go online and read some blogs because um, I didn't get in there right after the earthquake and not too many people did, but it was fully occupied and people had cell phones. So what was reported is that the mirrors fell down, all the art on the walls fell down, the televisions were tossed, the furniture moved around, the sheetrock was very badly damaged, there was water damage. I mean, the hotel saw a lot of non-structural damage, and it will, as we said, be out of service for quite some time. I want to pause and talk a little bit about this fire protection, these fire sprinkler issues. Uh, it is true that not all water damage was caused by fire protection piping, but most of it was. Um, and 
if you could get up close, you'd see some amazing photos there of actual cracks in the pipe where because these pipes are swinging around, sometimes there's the pipe hits something or the sprinkler head hits something or there's a discontinuity and a turn and a bend. Something happens to make the pipe break. When the pipe breaks, it's pressurized water, so it's flowing out of there really, really quickly. And it's hard to turn off. Firefighters are busy the next morning. They aren't available to come and turn this water off. They're out fighting fires. So water was flowing for a lot of time in a lot of buildings, and it caused a tremendous amount of damage. So this was one that was talked about earlier, the Napa County Offices building. It's a two-story, tilt-up building. Structurally, it was unscathed. It was perfect. One sprinkler head on the top story, right below the roof, went off. The water flowed for five hours. and. 200 people are out of this building for many months. Um, Sheetrock had to come off because we get moldy, the floor coverings, the ceiling, all the contents, everything. It's an amazing story, and it's fundamentally about one sprinkler head. There was some rooftop equipment that was damaged, but this is really where the story is. Uh, McCullough's is the same way, department store. If you look at that image on the left and you look right there, they had about three or four uh, breaks in their sprinkler line, and the water shot right out the side of the building, and we're seeing, uh, that's what we're seeing right there. So all the ceilings were down, all the sheetrock, everything else are going to be out of business for a long time. What I want to finish up with is a little discussion about contents, and if you just Again, think about the earthquake being eight hours before or after, and think about if you're working in the winery, if you're shopping in the grocery store, if you're sitting at your desk, you are vulnerable to damage, and to, to, you're vulnerable to injury or death. These are serious con contents that cause real life safety issues. Um, I think as a, as a, as a body, a, as a commission, it's interesting to think about what you do about contents because contents are not even regulated by the code. You know, furniture, for example, if it's under five foot nine, it doesn't require a building permit, so you, you can't keep somebody from putting a bookcase unbraced right next to their desk and, and, and have it be vulnerable for, some, for the person sitting next to it. So I think there's some really interesting policy issues here. There's certainly an important uh, public awareness uh, campaign, I think, that goes along with it. This image, it's the one that was at the upper right. I'm going to show it here again. There's a grocery store. Those are the shelves on, in one aisle, every one of them overturned. So. You know, those were not original when the store was installed. They did some re-racking. They brought them in. They did not anchor them down properly. And this is the ramification. So I think it's serious. I just want to point it out. I want to make you aware of it. Um, I think it's essential that we spend a little bit more time thinking about the consequences of non-structural damage. I'm not going to repeat all my observations because you just heard them. Um, I'm simply going to say don't forget about the chimneys and thank you very much for the work that the Commission is doing. I'm really delighted to be here and be part of it today. Thank you very much. Any questions from the Commission? Not, not specifically a question, but um, I'm really interested in the work you're doing on how unreinforced buildings performed. Are you, will there be follow-on to the work that you're reporting now? Will there be something available in six months or a year that's got a greater level of analysis? Uh, I, I believe so. The plan was first to get some data and, and uh, identify those buildings that are good candidates for further study, which we've done. Now we're in the process of obtaining drawings from the building department for the buildings of interest because we can't really do an in-depth study until we have the drawings. And that process is underway and, and staff is helping with that effort as we speak. So Fred Turner is very involved in that. So we're hoping to get those drawings. That will enable us to do more study and I think FEMA is going to fund some of that and is planning to do that. So I think the answer is absolutely yes, there's going to be much further study and I think it's going to be a very valuable stuff. That's great. I'm, I'm glad that we're being supportive, You're I think right. it's I think it's important that we understand that so many of California cities have unreinforced masonry buildings that are important to the city um, for a variety of reasons, and you don't want to just knock them down and build something new. Um, but if we don't understand how well different reinforcement techniques 
actually work in practice and if they fail, why did they fail? Um, if you're choosing between different reinforcement techniques, which ones make the most sense? Which are most economic? If you've only got X dollars to spend. Um, yeah, those are all important things for us to know. So I'm, this is what I'm really glad to see you doing, and I'm, I'm glad to see our commission being supportive. Um, and if it gets to where we need to consider some direct funding, it would be my recommendation we give that consideration if, if we need to do it to make sure that the work gets done, because I think it has statewide implications. I, I agree 100%. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Uh, just a quick question on the chimney issue. So I was intrigued by that. Uh, you're right, that's always been a problem. I seem to recall after Loma Prieta, the average cost to rebuild one of those external chimneys uh, is about $25,000. Is that is that still, is that right or is that too expensive? I, I honestly don't know the number and I'd feel okay. I was acting outside I've my heard it's expensive expertise. to rebuild them. Uh, well, first of all, you don't want to rebuild. You, right. can't, you can't rebuild those, and you don't want to rebuild those. Well, that's what I'm so coming to. You have to go back and right. put in a light-framed yes. shell with the proper fire rating and stucco and all that stuff. That's what goes back. 15 to 20. Okay, so that, that that's my point. Was that so Lumber Prieta dollars? Was that Lumber Prieta dollars? Uh, <laughs> Excuse me? Today's dollars. No, no, you don't build right back. No, 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 no. I, I know, but but I, I'm just saying that if if I'm if I'm the built the the owner and it's down, if I'm given if the local government allows me to rebuild that chimney, okay, or I'm given an option an incentive not to do that. I'm just looking at the cost to me. If I, I'll take the cheaper alternative, right. me personally, other people may not. So I, I, I'm, I've, I've just heard the cost, the complaints on the cost to rebuild chimneys. So it's pretty significant. It, it is significant. I mean, that's not a minor cost for a lot of people. Yeah. And it's very easy to defer because you just take your chances. You know, what's the chance is going to be my chimney? And that's not an unreasonable argument if you're talking about damage to your house. When you're talking about a life safety threat, that's where it changed the discussion. And that's, that's where you guys come in. So not easy, not simple. I, I get that. But because they're so hazardous, you know, because they pose a risk uh, to people, not just in the house, but outside the house as well, it seems like something needs to be thought about some more. Just a quick question, Marianne. The, uh, so you, you got the three examples of the, uh, each of a good and a bad for the seismically upgrade URFs. So three, three there. But what is the actual the, uh, uh, distribution of it? Let's see if you got the 100 um, strength building, 100 unstrength building. What is the, the difference? I, I know the question you want answered, and I can't answer it yet. Uh, unfortunately, there's some, the, some of the statistics about the red tagging is very misleading. So you can look at the red tag, the number of red tagged strengthened URMs and the number of red tagged unstrengthened, but the percentages don't look very good because some of them were red tagged because of adjacency issues, some of them were red tagged and then green tagged. So, so I can't say yet, and I hope that the results, and I believe that the results will, will point to the effectiveness of retrofitting, but I don't have the numbers yet, and we're absolutely going to get them because we need to be able to tell the story with the fact. I think it's critical. I agree. Because if you've got a three picture good and three picture bad, it's just like 50 50 no, I, chances. I, I, I agree. I was just giving you a taste of what's out there, but <laughs> I agree. I wanted to have that information, and when I saw what was out there, I put it aside because I thought that was misleading as well. I see. So okay. but we'll get it. It'll Very be well. there. Thanks. Peggy? Yeah, I just wanted to ask wasn't the only person killed in the Landers earthquake also killed by a falling chimney? That's correct. Well, so and this time, place, this, place, yeah. right, Indoors. and this time the death was as a result of a falling television, and it gets back to that contents issue. You know, I don't know that you want to have a law that, you know, somebody's got to get a permit to put up their television, <laughs> but you sure want people to pay attention to what they're doing with all this stuff, and I think that's, that's important. It's important that, you know, we help people. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Phipps. Appreciate great information. Thank you. Okay, we're moving uh, our 
last, uh, almost our last agenda item after a long day. Thank you, everybody, for uh, hanging in there. Uh, we've got about six or seven public comment requests. I hope everybody's still here. I know it's been a long day. So the first one I got was uh, Patrick Baker. Um, just a quick com a note on co public comment. We keep that to three minutes maximum. If you have uh, more information that you would like to get to the uh, to the commissioners, you're welcome to submit that in writing to Karen Kogan, which is over here to my right, um, and that we will distribute that to everybody and it will also be a record of the meeting. Okay. Patrick? Thank you. Thank you. Again, my name is Patrick Baker. Uh, I'm a wine grape brewer, winemaker, and former general manager of some very large and small local wineries. And I thank you for the opportunity to learn from this uh, and address this commission today. I've seen the perils and damages caused by current barrel rack designs and stacking methods firsthand, and you've seen some of those pictures today. The uh, rack on barrel system that is pervasive and allowed by uh, current Cal OSHA regulations by design requires visual judgment and experience precision with the forklift to balance curved racks on curved barrels. <clears throat> I've seen and experienced at my own hands the danger and destruction from falling barrels in the normal course of business in our barrel cellars. <coughs> We've all now seen how that precarious arrangement reacts in a seismic, extent, seismic event. <coughs> I can reasonably assure you that a similarly timed event during harvest with round-the-clock cellar shifts would not have escaped uh, unscathed. <coughs> I stand before you or sit before you as an advocate for uh, safer cellar operations and a proponent to update and enhance current labor and safety rules to protect employees and pedestrians alike in California wineries. I must also state that I, I am a representative of a company promoting a four post rack on rack system which is very different than the barrel on rack systems and these racks are likely contributed to Chinchero family estates example of having uh, more than 10,000 barrel estate sellers on, barrels on their uh, these racks and having zero loss in this last earth earthquake uh, and I think you saw a picture of the Trefethen uh, winery and the damage that's there and uh, I just secured an order with them yesterday so um, there are options is my point. That said, falling barrels um, are an avoidable hazard and current stacking methods do little to protect barrel stacks from errant daily activities like forklifts, um, let alone seismic events. Contact, my contact with Cal OSHA consultation offices so far suggests that they have but one guideline to follow to enforce barrel stacking in wineries safety. Um, it's contained in California Code of Regulations, Title VIII, Section 3241, which um, briefly is, I quote, live load regulation, item C, material wherever stored shall not create a hazard. It shall be limited in height and shall be piled, stacked, or racked in a manner designed to prevent it from tipping, falling, collapsing, rolling, or spreading, end quote. So nothing specific to how high barrels are stacked in the manner that they're stacked, proximity, or anything like that. This rule leaves much for interpretation and ultimately puts employees and pedestrians in peril's way when, not if, the next seismic event hits. I'm here to request a full review of the current regulations by which Cal OSHA and other governing bodies regulate barrel sellers. Um, I jointly started a new advisory council to the wine industry uh, made up of wine industry veterans like myself and applicable field experts. We're calling ourselves the Seller Safety Council. Uh, we are foremost and fo foremost focused on safety for our employees and guests and compiling a paper with advisements for best safety practices in barrel sellers. Uh, in conclusion, we have options that can potentially save lives and make barrel sellers safer. The reality is the wine industry, like most, is unlikely to shift practices until regulatory bodies like Cal OSHA are required to enforce safer practices. Uh, I invite everyone here to join me to make some of California's favorite destinations a safer place for employees and the public who visit. Thank you very much, Patrick. I appreciate the information, and uh, we'll have it. We have it in the notes here for consideration for the future. Thank you. Our next speaker, if he's still here, Jason King. Hello. 
My name is Jason King. I'm with, I'm the director of Bolt Down the Bay Area. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the committee. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this is kind of a window of opportunity for uh, my niche. It's a construction company. Um, but what I'd like to do is start to try to raise awareness of a thing called standard plan set A. And I'm just curious, by show of hands uh, in this committee, is anyone aware of, of what that is, standard plan set A? Have you heard of it? No. Um, so plan set A is a document uh, provided actually from the Association of Bay Area Government, Association, Association of Bay Area Governments website. Uh, it's signed off by the Association of Bay Area Governments, um, the International Code Council, uh, Structural Engineers Association, uh, California Building Officials, and the EERI. Uh, what this document is, uh, is a um, map for us to be able to go into uh, one to two story uh, single family residential homes and uh, reinforce the um, connection from the wood structure to the foundation. And the engineering is already built into the document. And so great examples were shown earlier. In fact, we even have customers in Napa where we took the measures from plan set A and applied them appropriately. Their house is standing, is just fine, while the neighbors um, with the cripple walls was knocked down and red tagged. Uh, so um, in addition to raising awareness for the existence of standard plan set A, I would just like to share that um, for a typical installation, uh, like we saw in those two-story houses, Victorian with the cripple walls under four feet, uh, if it's just a straightforward stance plan set A application, the cost is less than $5,000. Um, so I just think it's an important issue to be, to bring, especially towards this council. Um, application of this standard, this plan set, not this exact one, but a similar one, is mandatory in, in Southern California and in LA. Um, and so that's the goal is trying to um, I guess push towards mandate for this simple um, uh, simple uh, procedure um, that uh, the engineering is built in uh, excuse my uh, nervousness here but uh, uh, so that's basically what I'm, what, I, what I'm here to do I, I appreciate the opportunity to do it Great. Uh, just a quick comment. Sure, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, there, there is some um, very important research being conducted. Actually, just last week, there was conducted at the Shake Table in uh, UC San Diego, where uh, th that design, uh, they designed a wood frame structure, two-story, I think uh, 1,700 square feet, with the connections on onto the foundation, with additional shear uh, reinforcement in the internal walls. And uh, you should check into that because it is it is something that is already available out there, and that I think people are going to be making use of for a long, long time. As you say, it's very inexpensive, and it can add uh, quite a bit of resilience to uh, wood frame structures. Yeah, and that, like we saw, the the real world um, test is the pictures that you saw, and uh, there's there's. Um, Count, not countless, but there's a, a bunch of other instances where that um, application saved the houses and for you know a, a nominal cost. Great, thank you, Jason, for especially for your patience for being here for. A thank while. you. We're almost wrapped up. If you want to stay. Our next uh, public comment is from Sandina Baylo, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. <coughs> Oh, 
start talking while he's plugging in. Yeah. Hi. I'm sending a Balo. You were close. <laughs> Sorry, I was struggling with that one. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon, and especially at a time of day when we all should be having that glass of Napa Valley wine. Um, Cheers. Earlier today, we heard about percentages and large numbers from the city of Napa and what happened on the earthquake and afterwards. I want to share the story of one business. I own Sala Salon. It's a business in downtown Napa on First Street. It's a retail and service business. It's 2,500 square feet on the ground floor of a building built in 2008. So to the point that was made earlier today, it did take a lot of damage, um, but no one would have been killed if they had been in the building. What did happen that has caused us a lot of grief, and it's costing a lot of money, is the sprinkler pipes did indeed break in several places. Um, when we realized what the water was coming from, what was going on, that we had no other alternative, because I knew that it was 911 was a crazy busy place, I had to call 911. I was told, you're on a list. When a period of time had gone by, I walked down to the fire station that's on First Street, and there were many firemen standing around, and I walked up to a group of them and introduced myself and told them what my dilemma was. And they said, well, you just need the key to the riser room. And I said, exactly. And I stood six feet away from a fireman who said, we have a key. I'm with engine one. We're parked here. That was it. One of the guys said, let me help you. And he ran into the command center to see if he could get me higher up on the list. He came back out, very chagrined and blushing. I'm sorry. You're on the list. At that point, I had to step aside so they could take their pastry order that had come in, two large white boxes. And I walked the three blocks back to my building that was flooding. Police cars drove by, stopped, called the fire department to explain the amount of water that was coming out of the business. Nothing helped. A council member met with the fire chief. Please turn off her water. Nothing happened. Um, this was very frustrating to watch my life savings drowned. Um, at 8.45, and you can all do the math, that was more than five hours, okay. the fire department did arrive. Can you turn the lights off in the main area, please? To turn, to access the riser room. Unfortunately, the guys that showed up pretended like they were coming to a barbecue and walked in and said, hey, how's it going with you? And I said, you've got to be kidding me, because this is what it looked like. Um, through my experience and from talking with people from other municipalities, it appeared that there was not an earthquake plan with the Napa Fire Department. Other municipalities do things such as hand those riser keys to people in pickup trucks and drive the commercial districts looking for water. When this building was shut, there was, enough, there was torrents of water, we'll, we'll get to that, torrents of water coming across the sidewalk. It was apparent this building was taking on a huge amount of water. Um, so that was that day. They came, two inspectors came to inspect the damage. And I gave them a tour of the entire building. And at least my, my area, my 250, 2,500 square feet. And much to my shock, they gave me a choice. Would you like a green tag or a yellow tag? And I said, well, why, what's the difference? Why would it matter? And I was, I'm still speechless now. Why was I being given the choice? Um, and they said, well, you know, because FEMA needs certain numbers or, you know, but I said, well, if I'm getting a choice, I'd like a green tag because I'm thinking hassle later on down the road if I've got a yellow tag. Give me the green tag. Um, the contractors that worked on the space were shocked that I got a green tag. They assumed that I had a yellow or even a red by the amount of earthquake and water damage that had occurred. Um, the FEMA the inspectors, <coughs> I was just going to say the woman in the red dress, came by because I'm within that, that, almost within that thousand feet to see what kind of damage I had. And she saw the sprinkler pipes after they were repaired and commented to me, they're still not strapped. And that's the way they were repaired. Um, I don't know what code is. I don't know if there's code that says they should be strapped. But I'm thinking, so if we have another earthquake of that size, this is going to happen again. Um, 
this is what I was faced with. So wanting to have, still have a business, I called LA and rented a hairstyling trailer to have it delivered up here so I could have some form to keep my team intact and to let my clients know that we cared, okay? As you can see, I parked it on the street. I didn't have an alternative. Our building does not have a parking lot. I was told by the city, by a few officials, how dare you have parked it on the street. Um, within two hours, they red tagged it, and they told me that will keep you out. That was on a Friday. Um, it took until Monday, and during that time, I, let's see, had two television interviews and was all over social media letting everyone know what was going on. Um, the, that worked. By Monday, I got a phone call. We'd like to talk to you. We'll help you move the trailer, we'll find a place for put the trailer. So the following Friday, so now we're getting in on two weeks, I was able to open that up for business on a very limited basis. Short story, once the building space became safe to occupy, because I was meeting with contractors still this morning that are still working on the space, I moved the team back in. We were out for four weeks. Um, this has been a disaster for us. I know, thank goodness it hasn't been that for everyone, um, but for, unfortunately for my business and my team, this has been huge and continues to be. I can see that um, this is gonna be a long time in recovery, and they talk about resiliency, and we're there, we're trying. But it's very frustrating when I w walked, saw those fire trucks sitting on the street all day. They were never deployed, and I was a three block walk away. So, I'm just asking maybe some changes can be made. Maybe cities can be required to have earthquake plans and not just emergency plans. Because it was obvious that Napa, a lot of things went smoothly, okay? That there was, an earth, there was an emergency plan in place and some things did happen and they happened well and they happened fast. But earthquake specific, it feels like there was a hole. Um, what happened to mutual aid? What happened, where'd they go? Where was the planning on that? If we're gonna get all these people coming to us, if you don't use them, it's a waste. And then the pipe strapping issue. It seems like that should be addressed also. So this doesn't have to happen to other businesses. So what you need to know about the image that's currently on screen is that this was taken as the salon was flooding. So these are the mutual aid trucks that have been referred to all through today. They did come from all around. They came from a number of counties. But the records will show that they were never actually deployed. So it would appear that there was a uh, breakdown in the command structure uh, at the fire department in Napa uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the quake, which shouldn't have happened. So engines were sitting as businesses were being damaged. They, we have been told that obviously these trucks do not have the sprinkler keys for uh, Napa businesses, but surely a member of the Napa Fire Department should have handed it to a fire officer from another area and asked him or her to walk or drive down the business district area and turn off sprinklers. You've seen the damage at the, at the salon. You also saw the damage earlier at McCullough's. You've seen the damage in the county building, and the list goes on. Uh, of, of uh, over a dozen buildings that were damaged as a result of a lack of reaction from the Napa Fire Department. Okay. I'm, I'm supposed I'll, to ask, but does anybody have any questions? I'll ask. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, I, I gave you a little extra time there because I knew you wanted to get it across. So. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any thank questions you. for our speaker? Okay, thank you. Nope. Thank you for your patience. I know you were concerned that you would get your time. I wanted to make sure you had that. So thank you for coming. And thank you for that consideration. You're very welcome. Our next speaker is Paul Ryan. Hi, my name is Paul Ryan, and I'd like to thank this committee for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm a local Napa resident, and I've been here over 20 years. I have uh, two questions, one directed to uh, Dr. Allen, and then the other one directed to Mr. Parker. My first question to Dr. Allen is, we've seen that they're years and years away from an early warning system that's 
semi-theoretical and is going to cost in excess of $80 million. You know, I've been in the state for over 20 years, and normally when the government gives a figure, it's normally five to ten times that as to what they initially say. So, you know, if it, and secondly, to, you know, what is the time frame on a deployment for an early warning system? Well, I'll let Mark Johnson, who's in charge of the the state OES earthquake early warning project, okay. answer those questions. He can cover them both. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Allen, you can certainly chime in from a, the technical standpoint, but the, the the process that we're using right now is Senate Bill uh, 135 uh, asked us to identify funding sources for the system by April, or I'm sorry, January of 2016. We've put together a, a plan to uh, look at uh, ways to not only look at what the model would look like, what the standards that are required, uh, the uh, management structure that would be required, the outreach requirements that would be required, and what possible funding sources there are available. We've established committees to put this together, and we have a timetable between now and January 2016 to put together findings and recommendations, and subsequently an implementation plan. If the funding is not identified, it would be up to whatever sources uh, that we have to pursue the momentum that's already been gained uh, to make this system come about. If the funding is identified, there's still going to be uh, a time period of however long it takes to put in all of the hardware, all of the management structures. So you're talking uh, not January 2016, but probably uh, years after 2016 before the system is public and up and running. It will take a while to implement the system unless we find some way to move faster by funding um, and the fact that everybody can implement the system uh, on a faster scale. But I don't see it happening uh, in the next two years. It's going to be longer than that. But we have a, a, a private company that seems to have a system now that does actually work and that could be deployed at a way faster rate than USGS or anybody else could actually put together a system and bring together a multitude of different outside vendors that hopefully can gel together to make the system actually functional. And that would be uh, their, their venture, their prerogative. If they wanted to take their business model and do that, uh, they can certainly do that. Well, that's kind of answered the question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, for your patience also. Uh, next speaker, John Wilkinson. Hello. My name is John Wilkinson. Thank you to the committee for allowing this public forum. Uh, I live in Sonoma. I was thrown out of bed along with all of you um, at, on this event. So I can't imagine um, how violent it must have been in Napa, living a few f further miles away in Sonoma. I'm a small business owner in San Rafael. Uh, the reason I came today was I was hoping to learn um, if, if there was earthquake early warning uh, that would actually work now in a, in a major event. And, um, and Really, one of my questions was, it, it sounds as though there are systems available, but uh, I was not certain about uh, the mention of blind spots uh, in the system. Uh, I think that was mentioned, but I, I don't know if that's in, uh, active in both systems. So if that could be clarified, um, that was really my main concern as I wanted to come here today and learn, and thank you so much for the, the opportunity. I'm not sure who can answer your question the best, but let's see if we can figure it out. Also, um, thank you for coming. I just we we talk about earthquake early warning at virtually every meeting, so <laughs> yeah, we'll do this again. Not a hearing, but another meeting tomorrow in San Francisco. Um, so 
this is very much an evolving, ongoing process. Mark, why don't you start if you can cover some of that? Well, I, I think answer. we don't have all of the answers because the system is not uh, comprehensive throughout the state. Obviously, uh, the system is implemented uh, in the population centers in the state, and because we don't have a uh, system that's balanced throughout the state, there are going to be blind spots until that's addressed. So I, I think that's we need to uh, take a look at the system, how we can fill those blind spots. But again, there's no answer. At this at this time. Okay, our next uh, next speaker, Ron Lynn. Jim, while he's coming up, if yeah, I could just ahead. make a, a quick comment. You also are going to have effectively a blind spot if you are located right on top of the epicenter. There's just not time for the system to record that an earthquake has happened and let you know before the shaking gets there. That's something our technology doesn't do yet. So it works if you're at something of a distance from the, the epicenter. Can I make a comment? Sure, yeah. And Mike Rose raised his hand too from the back. So both of you, if you want to make a quick comment, I don't want to get too much into detail, but go right in. And John, is John's behind you? And yeah, he's still over there. So I want to make sure. Actually, one sentence, sorry. So the blind zone thing, I think it's important to recognize that, so yes, the blind zone, we can argue about how big a blind zone is and, and how many people might not get a warning, but the, the size of the blind zone is a choice based on how certain you want the information to be. Okay, so when early warning, the way the early warning system works, and any of the systems that are talked about here, the more stations that detect the earthquake and are providing information, the more accurate the warning is. So you can decide to have a warning based on an absolute minimal amount of information. That will make your blind zone as small as it possibly can be. Maybe it's zero, maybe it's not zero, but that will make it as small as can be, but there's the most uncertainty associated with it. And then as you want your information to be more and more certain, you want more and more information, inevitably the blind zone gets larger. That was just a comment. I no, thank to you, Dr. Allen. That's good. Mike? <laughs> so I believe there's a serious technical difference of opinion here. Um, we don't have a blind zone, and we will, in the, in the course of the next you know, few months, start publishing some data to show that we don't have uncertainties either. You do, that that trade-off is a, a function of Technology, and if you in one technology has a different performance than another, we think we have we have a technology which solves the problem of providing a warning with no blind zone, without a, a hugely dense network, and one that still can give you an accurate estimate of the earthquake. And we, that's why we uh, we think we're being commercially successful, and that's why we think that uh, we have a solution that the state should be considering. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, Ron, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, for the record, Ron Lynn, Chairman of the Nevada Earthquake Safety Council and assorted other things that happen. And I want to thank uh, to and through the chair. I want to thank this commission for the expert presentations, the opportunity to hear them, and for the insightful comments from the commissioners, which kind of educated me in some ways. I, I just want to say a couple things. One is, eventually, we will have an earthquake early warning system. If nothing else, the public will demand it. And I want to express my appreciation for the state of California for vetting out all the unintended consequences so the rest of us don't have to do it. So keep up the great work. I support that. Uh, to Commissioner Helwig, uh, you are welcome to come to Nevada, all of you. But unfortunately, I, we do have lots of faults, both tectonic and otherwise. But I thought I would mention that. And there was a... Uh, I knew that. You knew that. <laughs> not only earthquake faults. That's right. Not only Ooh. earthquake. Uh, there was a question before, uh, I guess, a representative, I don't believe the lady is still in the audience, which uh, addressed codes. <clears throat> and even there's something about the uh, strapping of the sprinklers. <clears throat> I will not talk about or address that, but if they would like to offline to talk about codes, I can do so ad nauseum. There are standards available, and typically most jurisdictions in the state of California do adopt them, but the implementation is, as always, uh, a challenge, not only for the education of those who are enforcing, but certainly those contractors who are doing the work. Nevertheless, that science is also progressing, too. But that I just want to, again, say thank you for the presentations. Thanks, Ron. 
Captain, thanks for uh, thanks for coming, and, and for everybody from Nevada here who joined us again, and it's it's good to see you guys. And our final uh, speaker card, unless I get another one in the next three minutes, uh, is Joe Di Pasquale. I hope I pronounced that one right. Hey guys. Thank you for your time and also for staying late and instead of enjoying the Napa wine. Uh, my name is Joe Di Pasquale. Um, I'm from a company called Regroup, and I was prompted to submit a, a, a speaking card when Mayor Osby Davis of Vallejo was uh, mentioning the need for multiple lang language uh, emergency messaging. So my company, Regroup, has been working with the city of San Francisco this year on a prototype of a system with uh, Jennifer Strauss and Richard Allen of Berkeley, and I need to emphasize that it's a prototype, but the system, when you do have these early earthquake warnings, you're actually enabled to, for the first time ever, put out emergency warnings in multiple languages. In San Francisco, they have four required uh, languages that by city ordinance they need to communicate officially. It's English, Spanish, Chinese, and Tagalog. Um, they, even though our, you know, have a city ordinance that says that they need to do it, have not previously put in emergency messaging into those multiple languages. Um, so uh, the good folks at ShakeAlert, along with the mayor's office and the Department of Emergency Management, who we're working with on this prototype of an early earthquake warning system, have been good enough to work with us to get a, a fully functional setup done where it translates the message from ShakeAlert uh, into all of those four languages so that when the system is ready to go to residents, um, it's done in all the languages that are needed by that city. So I just wanted to put that thought in your minds as you're thinking of the varied populations and, and communi communities that you work with, with the early earthquake warnings, because they can be templated messages, you're actually maybe empowered for the first time in your community's history to send out those in multiple languages. So it's a little bit about regroup and our work with San Francisco. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Okay, that was our last speaker card. Uh, does anybody have anything for the good of the meeting? I think it was a wonderful meeting. It was very informative. Uh, probably of all the commission meetings that I've been to, this was the most informative of all. Uh, all the speakers were very good, and uh, certainly uh, represented officials uh, were here, and it's a great case study to have, so thank you to all. Yes, and thank you, everybody, for uh, making it through it. David? Sorry not to prolong the meeting. I, do, I just want to say, um, uh, when we spoke regarding the uh, uh, pamphlets to be uh, distributed at the time when red, uh, yellow, or green tags are given to homes, I think there is something there. Uh, I think, in, and it came out of the experience in Napa. I know from our uh, building inspectors that came over, and I'd, I'd love to see the, uh, or hear the discussion at some future date uh, from this body about really whether that is something that we should pursue. Just something really simple. I think in Napa, a lot of homes weren't green tagged, so people didn't know if their home was on a list, not yet inspected. Is it safe? Is it not? I, I wonder how that all worked out. So I, I do think there's an opportunity to look at. Um, accompanying the red tag, and while it says some pretty specific things on the tag itself, to uh, drop a, something at the door that, that gives a little more information, maybe a little more help uh, pointing someone in the right direction, uh, letting them know what it means, what, it, what you have to do, what you can't do, uh, and, and including maybe even the green tag. And just as one last final, and looking around the vulnerable communities that we all have, you know, the chimneys, obviously. And Napa did have an earthquake, uh, what, uh, the 5.0 and whatever year that was, many chimneys fell then. Uh, obviously, many more chimneys are falling. Maybe, you know, there'll be no chimneys left to fall. Uh, but every community has similar issues, uh, whatever, uh, however we can move on that. I'd love to see some data on that, too, about where the chimney break occurs, whether it's just at the roof line or, or within the attic area. And maybe there's a way to kind of bring that 20 thousand dollars into something that's more reasonable and then lastly the other picture that I noted and saw a lot of damage in Napa was porches on uh, you know bungalow type homes that are just falling over disconnected as much as the cripple walls it seemed to be the the cripple walls the chimneys and the porches falling off so I, it was uh, I was when I went over to Napa that week I really truly thought that I would just see those three buildings that kept showing on the news over and over again I was actually 
there was damage everywhere, and it was pretty substantial. And um, um, it was uh, certainly uh, a little eye-opening, uh, even having been through a number of earthquakes. Thank you. Thanks, David. Assembly Member Cooley. I'm just going to make the observation, listening to the, you know, the terrible circumstance of the salon there in Napa. The thing that came to mind for me was the Roseville Galleria. You know, there is a fog of war sort of circumstance in the wake of a disaster in the immediate hours. You know, how do you get your arms around what everything is happening? And the Galleria fire, you'll recall, is there was a fire. They thought the sprinklers had contained it. Someone turned the sprinklers off. And then all kinds of bad things ensued from that. So I, you know, it, it is moderate as things go, as earthquakes. We all know we have a much more dramatic earthquake, but in the immediate area affected, there was a lot going on, uh, as evidenced by all the red tag buildings, all of that. Um, and, and I do think in the early stages uh, of responding, there was just a lot of confusion. What's, what's really going on? What's the priority? What do we address? And. Um, as I say, I, I'm recalling the gallery of fire where people thought things were handled and some valves got turned off and then wasn't that a big mistake. So I just think it's very complex to figure out which way do you jump and what's what's right and, and what do we you know, do to intervene right away. I just recognize there's that element of confusion. Mm -hmm. Peggy. Yeah, so, so what I thought as we were listening was that um, California has been very lucky with its last few earthquakes. They always happened on times when True. there was relatively little likelihood of the, the 10,000 people dying in the uh, collapsed buildings or damaged buildings. And what several pe people pointed out was Napa, the region here, was very lucky that it was a small earthquake and that the people from nearby could send help and support. There were lots and lots of PG&E people because the PG&E people didn't need to be somewhere else turning, checking the gas, checking the, the everything and making sure that it was running. And so when we we're looking at reports from this earthquake, summary reports from this earthquake, we need to look at how it would have been different if it had affected a much larger region. I think that that's really important for us not to pat ourselves too strongly on the shoulder and say we did a good job. Though we did. <laughs> yes, agreed, lessons learned. I mean, you know, Saturday night, some of those parapet collapses would have been a mess. Significant loss of life, so. Any other comments for good of the meeting? Okay, we will adjourn. Thank you everyone for being patient. Um, I know it went long, but uh, this was a, a great a great workshop and a hearing, and I'll look forward to seeing everybody, at least from the commission, tomorrow morning. 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock.